morning and welcome to day two, Sunday at the World Championships. I'm Andrew Beckstrom, a designer here at Direwolf Digital, joined by my colleague Patrick Sullivan here for the honor and privilege of crowning a world champion today. And today's focus is going to be on the expedition format. And again, if you're new to the game or coming back, you can head over to eternalcardgames.com. There's a series of articles that we wrote earlier this week that sort of breaks down the uh, formats, what's legal in them, some of the key cards and strategies. So if you want to check that out, get a little refresher course before we dive in, more than welcome to do so. Uh, but today is going to be all about Expedition. Uh, the final rounds of the tournament and, and then the eventual top four and elimination rounds will all be Expedition today. Yeah, so <laughs> let's talk a little bit about what we can expect to see today with the format if we can get the schedule up. Um, as Patrick mentioned, and recap where we've been so far. So 16 competitors over the last year qualified for these World Championships, primarily winning through winning open events. Now today, after six rounds yesterday of draft and throne, they've got a, a decent sense of where they are in the standings. And now in these last three rounds, the Swiss round seven through nine of Expedition, they'll be playing best of three matches. At the end of those three rounds, we will potentially have a clean cut top four. But if there are players who are tied for one of those final four slots, we will have a maximum of one playoff match for each of those tied slots, playing with those Expedition decks. After that, we will move on to our top four, where it will be Expedition best of five matches. At the end of that single elimination bracket, the last person standing will be your world champion. So in addition, today we got $55,000 in the prize pool up for grabs, $15,000 going for first place. So it's going to be a fun day of exciting expedition action as we move towards crowning that new world champion. Or it could be the reigning world champion, Lights Out Ace, coming back. So as we're going to be moving into the start of the games today in a little over five minutes, let's take a look at Lights Out Ace's deck, their expedition list that they've brought this weekend, and what they have in store for us. So they've got a take on Rakano Agro. Patrick, break it down for us. Uh, what's going on here? Well, this is certainly an aggressive deck. Um, anything that's playing Battlefront Dasher, Finest Hour, and Torch probably qualifies as an aggressive deck. But this is playing a, a, a much bigger game, a game, uh, a game that's able to sort of survive attrition and sweepers. You look at Carnivorous Yearling, that's a new offer from the Valley Beyond micro campaign. That's a card that's capable of applying a lot of pressure or being a source of card advantage and insulation against removal, which really speaks to the two sides of the ball this deck is looking to play. You see Styre's Eyes alongside Iron Priestess. That's, you know, two great tastes that taste great together. And then a variety of really powerful four or five cost units to sort of fill out the top end. Yeah, not in the, much in the way of interaction from this deck in the sense of like cards that could just kill sort of anything. Uh, Torch, great against killing smaller units. Verbrook could kill multi-factions. And Furious Magnaventurus can stun enemy units. But primarily, the way that this deck's going to be getting over is by going a little bit bigger in the mid-game and trying to win the game and close it out around turns 5, 6, and 7 when you're doing things like combining a unit like Inferno Phoenix with a Finest Hour or potentially using Helena Sky Guide with something like an Iron Priestess stuffed Battlefront Dasher. All of these things to way to push damage through and get them over the finish line. You can really tell by looking at the power base of this deck we don't see any tools like Justice Sketch, which is a fun uh, amplify power that allows you to get a Relic that can double the stats of all your units. Rather, Lights Out Ace is going for Rune of Law, which is another amplify power, but that one just plays Saddle Up. Plus four, plus four to one of your units when you play it and pay five power. And that just shows to show that while this deck does have some bigger units, it is very much going to be trying to attack, attack, attack. It's an interesting point that you bring up there because we often see the Justice Sketch as a way of being able to win some long games. The units in this deck already speak to that. Cards like Inferno Phoenix give you a lot of lifting uh, in a game that goes long. Scale Swarm Patrol can fill that as well. And so the power base is actually uh, pivoted a little bit towards a little bit more power efficiency, a little bit more immediacy, because those units are already doing some lifting in the late game. I thought the point that you mentioned about the way that this deck interacts is also uh, really well said. It's not like this deck has no ways to interact, but there is not dedicated removal. But cards like Torch, that can kill a unit, that can also deal damage directly. Oni Insider, capable of uh, interacting with an opposing Relic. 
also can give charge to things. Um, Sire's Eyes. Yes, you know, against some uh, void centric strategies, you can make it Adjudicator's Gavel, but it's also an on rate flying unit that can uh, be a pump effect. The game goes on. Furious Ma uh, Madaventress, Babruk. All of these cards are ways of interacting with opposing cards that are not dedicated removal. They are still units that can attack and block. And so this deck is chock full of interaction, but it's through the lens of units that are on rate. They have the right size and skills for the power cost. And even if the opposing player isn't playing with the right types of things you're trying to respond to, like something like Rebrook, for example, even against a deck that has no multi-faction units, Rebrook is still a four strength charge unit for four. That speaks to the deck's core strategy, but it has moments of being key interaction as well. All right, let's check out one of the competitors' lists that Lights Out Ace might be going up against this weekend. So DDD, uh, this is the deck that we showed the other day on our Expedition preview stream. Uh, this is that Combray aggro strategy splashing a Shadow Sigil for four copies of Slay, just three costs fast, kill a unit. And so primarily this deck's going to be looking to get going early with cards like Waystone Igniter, Awakened Student, Crown Watch, Paladin, and then backing them up with some, some of the same units that we saw in Lights Out Ace's deck. Scale Sworn to Patrol, Furious, Magnaventris are both great ways to help those units keep getting through. Um, but I would say the big difference in these two decks is uh, the, they're, we're a little bit interested in just our units continuing to grow and grow and grow. And when you're talking about Awakened Student and Dinosaur Nest and then something like Timeless Bond, you just have a lot of ways to continually pump up these units. Um, one of the, my favorite cards that DDD is getting to play with this weekend is Gavel's Insight. Really <laughs> lines up really well in the format when you're expecting to play against other decks with similarly sized units and then, of course, against other Dinosaur Nests because it can kill enemy relics, right? Yes, and the Slay Splash here is really interesting as well. It's an iconic card to the extent that it shows up in Throne. It's not really about attacking the aggro decks. The Throne aggro decks are a lot of one and, one and two cost units. A lot of their power is baked into charge or summon triggers. Slay is not really that efficient at, at answering those kind of aggressive units in Throne. Uh, to the extent that it's showing up, it's about mid-range and control matchups. But if you go back to Lights Out Ace list, if the aggressive decks of this format are playing with four and five cost units, Slay can be really tempo efficient. And so that's something that's a little bit different here compared to uh, the throw metagame. And also, if you're expecting a lot of decks similar to this, well, you know, it's really good against Furious Mad Adventurous. It's really good against just, you know, big units in general. But if the aggressive decks are even playing with units that Slay is profitable against, now you have a great metagame call. Yeah, Alessi High Arcanist... Uh having some nice synergies here with Magna Ventress. Uh, a little underrated part of the card is, of course, that you get to gain armor when you get to contract Alessi, the High Arcanist. And so uh, a lot of nice things going on here this weekend from DDD's list, and we'll be checking them out as we get into the expedition rounds in just a few minutes. All right, let's check out our last deck before we get going with today's action. This is I'm a Straight. They brought a Xenon deck for us this weekend. So... Uh, a lot, of, a lot of cards that you're quite familiar with, Patrick. So why, what's the appeal for you of getting to bring Zito? The appeal here is you play an interactive game with a lot of baked-in card advantage. If you're able to trade off profitably with cards like Waystone Igniter, Zito, Devour, what have you, you know, Civ, the Rat King, all these cards have moments of being able to be worth more than one card. And you can kind of run your opponent out of resources that way. An interesting metagame call this weekend is Victimless Crime. And that is something that really speaks to how the format has shifted in the wake of Valley Beyond. Prior to the micro campaign, the Huru Hero stuff was kind of the, you know, the default best thing going on to the extent that people were playing control strategies. It was a lot of Stone Scar that were playing a lot of heroes as well. There are not that many heroes that are prevalent from Valley Beyond, and you can go back and, and, and look at Lights Out Aces list to get confirmation of this. The, the new cards are just three and four cost units that are not heroes. And so Victimless Crime has gone from this card just doesn't work against all the units that exist to something that actually could be really profitable and efficient in the same way that Slay is if people are taking advantage of these new powerful units from Valley Beyond. 
I really like Huntmaster Vikram this weekend. Uh, does a really nice job of lining up. It doesn't get killed by a lot of the more popular removal options in the format. Doesn't care if it gets stunned. Doesn't can't get victimless crimed. If you don't attack with it, it can't get sinister rumored. Um, you look at the Combray deck that we saw before, and the fact that that deck is splashing Slay is kind of a big acknowledgement as far as how important a card like Height Master Vikram can be. All right, we're going to get started in just a minute here with our match between Lights Out Ace. Uh, before we go, let's take one look at the prize pool if we can and just remind everyone what we're playing for this weekend because while some of the players, their top four dreams, we've only got three rounds to go until we get to our top four, might be done, but they've still got a bunch of cash prizes available to play for them. And of course, the first prize here that we're going to be looking for this weekend is just being the title of world champion, but it's a $55,000 prize pool up for grabs. Uh, all right, we're gonna we'll we'll check out the prize pool in a minute as we're just about to get ready to get started with the match. But as far as the prize pool goes, it's not just you know the winner takes all. There's there's tranches along the way, and what's really interesting about watching the second day of this coverage is there's no one really at the polar ends. We ended the day after six rounds with no undefeated players, no players at one and five, no players at zero oh and six. We have a handful of five ones, but a lot of people are clustered in that four two to two four range. And so all the matches, even as we get later in the day. All right, sounds like Lights Out Ace is ready to go. So let's get started with the action here. Kicking off the day, Lights Out Ace up against the Overmaster. The Overmaster bringing a, it looks like a Xenon deck to the table this weekend. Meanwhile, Lights Out Ace got a, a nice little start there with that turn one Battlefront Dasher. Uh, Patrick, what are you thinking when we get to Lights Out Ace's turn? Do you like just firing up that contract? Uh, I don't. This hand is so heavy on twos that I think the uh, just deferring that for a turn, playing your Steyr's eyes on turn two. But a lot of this is going to just depend on the, the particulars of the matchup and what Lights Out Ace is expecting to play around, how they think the shape of the game is going to be. All right, so Lights Out Ace kicks it off, contracting their Battlefront Dasher. They'll need to pay off two power next turn, but the deal that they get is phenomenal. They get a 3-2 charge unit on the first turn of the game, immediately applying a bunch of pressure to the Overmaster, who's brought Blister Sting Wasp, and that unit does a fantastic job at blocking and trading with anything uh, that Lights Out Ace could be have this weekend. It's gonna just trade off with the Battlefront Dasher, and so the Overmaster's gotten to turn three with a clean board. Yeah, part of the reason that I had reticence about the, the Dasher here is specifically a function of going second. Mm. Going first, I think that plays a lot more appealing to me. Going second, it's, you know, now the board state looks like this. The Overmaster's at 22, and you have a handful of twos. A little clogged up. All right, so now Lights Out Ace could play out that Scale Sworn Patrol here on turn number three. If it gets killed, they don't get any of the great and power value off of it, but it would set them up very nicely next turn where they could play Styre's Eyes, maybe pitch a, um, uh, an Iron Priestess, get a Justice Sigil, play another Iron Priestess. But they're going to take make play it a little bit safer here. And they're going to ditch actually one of the gem blazer cannons. What do you make of that decision? Uh, trying to set up a play where they can have multiple twos. Part of it is also if you're going to keep the scale sworn elite, you have some interest in just having as many units as possible. Because if stuff is just getting killed, you lose a lot of value off the, the first empowered trigger. All right. So an interesting decision to kick off the turn here for the Overmaster. They've got those dirty rats ready to go. The Rat King, of course, has an ability that lets it sacrifice units to give enemy units minus one, minus one. So you could, like, attack a 1-1 one, one into the Styre's Eyes and then try to sacrifice the other one. But when you look at all the cards in their hand, like Nahid's Faithful, Devour, and the Rat King's ability, you can understand why they don't want to do any chump blocking, maybe. Yeah, there's no really reason to do it. And, and you know, this Nahid's Faithful is very hard for Lights Out Ace's deck to remove cleanly. It's basically just for Brook. And if... You get to have a 4-4 Lifesteal unit. If Lights Out Ace wants to play a racing game with you, sweet. They can't play a defensive game, and you're favored in an aggressive game right now as well. All right, so Scale Sworn Patrol comes down and empowers. When you play a power with Scale Sworn Patrol out, you give Scale Sworn Patrol plus one, plus one. Another one of your units plus one, plus one, and the top unit of your deck plus one, plus one. So this is a very important card for the Overmaster to get off the table as there's going to be a ton of value accrued by this card. They devour the Rat King in response to the Torch. Now they've picked up a Victimless Crime there, which can kill a non-hero unit, so they're going to go ahead and get that patrol right on out of here. 
And if you want to know, you know, why play with victimless crime, even though it doesn't work all the time, it's this. The way that you get ahead in these kind of matchups, typically, the first person who's able to play two cards in one turn. And those were two very impactful cards. All right, Lights Out Ace buffed up a Furious Magnaventurous, and now it's coming down, and it's mad. Stun an enemy unit, gain three armor, and a Huntmaster Vikram off the top for the Overmaster. We're about to see a really potent combo here for the Overmaster. They get to steal the Magnaventurous. They had to exhaust it first, but since it's an Endurance unit, they weren't able to. That means when it comes over to their side, it's buffed up, and it gets to attack, gets rid of all the armor, and now for Lights Out Ace, I'm looking at their hand, and I don't see any cards which can just get that Huntmaster Vikram off the board. And a subtle thing, too, here is with that Javon trigger, now the Vikram's up to a 3-4 outside of Torch range. And we know once something is outside of Torch range, really the only answer here is the group, which Lights Out Ace does not have. Not in hand yet. So they're going to play another Magnaventurous, stun down the Nahid's Faithful once again. But, man, this is going to get very hard. You even saw the Styre's eyes did not attack. Lights Out Ace is... Feeling the pressure now. They love to be attacking, but they're going to have to try to figure out some plan of action against this setup that Overmaster has now. Yeah, this is the, uh, you know, sort of the, the key squeeze that aggressive decks can get into against a deck that's also playing with units, but maybe they have lifesteal, maybe they have just more impact. Is the You can't win the game playing short, and uh, your deck's not equipped to play long. Can't, you can't play offense, you can't play defense. Oh, this is nasty. So the Magnaventures has bounced off each other, but the Overmaster is going to use the Rat King, and they're going to cash in their Magnaventures to kill the other one. Um, I, I assume they're making that play because they don't want to risk maybe a top deck for Brook getting rid of the Huntmaster Vikram. Yeah, I think that's a, a just a really heads-up play by the Overmaster. You're so far ahead that right now it's just an issue of managing downside risk. Yes, the Brook could still kill the Nihis Faithful, that's not great, but that's not going to swing the game around. Something happening to your Pabruk certainly would, and so cashing your chips right there, if your Pabruk dies, you've gotten out from under it, doesn't really matter. All right, so you see a nice little play there from Lights Out Ace, putting the custom rail driver, that weapon, on the second copy of Iron Priest. Uh, when Iron Priest goes to the Void, Lights Out Ace will get to draw weapon equal to the current stats of the Priestess, uh, so it's very nice that the... Uh, the priestess is picking up more and wow javon activates when you hit it when you draw a card with javon that costs four or less you get to play it immediately so we see that Huntmaster vikram come down steal the iron priestess and now the floodgates are open once again for a big attack from the overmaster yeah there's a question here of a space bar versus being a little bit more judicious with your attackers and so that's just kind of a function of doing a little bit of math here uh, allowing the uh, Styre's Eyes to trade with the Javon isn't ideal because that's kind of your late game tool. So it looks like the Overmaster is just deciding to hold that one back as a bit of a All right, so Lights Out Ace is going to trade off their Styre's Eyes with the Rat King, presumably hoping to top deck a way to kill the other Verbr the other Huntmaster Vikram, get back into this game. But as you can see, Lights Out Ace, no answers for the Elf Rogue, just running away with that game on the back of Huntmaster Vikram, the Elf Poacher uh, got the job done that game. Yeah, and to, to go back, I, I think a lot of that game was decided um, on turn number one. Again, uh, Lights Out Ace defending world champion uh, and certainly more familiar with the tactical elements of this matchup than I am, but I feel like there's so much burden to get ahead on the table on the first three or four turns because once this Zenon deck is able to sort of get their feet planted, the attrition, the life steal, the card advantage. It's going to be really hard to make any sort of headway on the ground, as we saw right there. So I think you've got to you the da play a dasher, hit, hit, and then play your stuff after the fact. I think you're just giving the overmaster the breathing space to be able to set up. Okay, well now I have a rat king, and I'm ahead on the on the table. Now I can make a play and hold up devour. Those sort of sequences are where this game is going to get away from the Ricano player. And so we'll see if Lights Out Ace is presented with the same decision, if they do the same thing or or switch it up. All right, here we are in game number two. Lights Out Ace has kept their opener. Meanwhile, the Overmaster is going back for another go round, and they're going to keep a hand with uh, a nice couple of early plays in Zito and Dinosaur Nest, followed up by some great late game heroes. Now for Lights Out Ace, no one drop Battlefront Dash for this game. We're going to be probably kicking things off on turn two with another Styre's Eyes. 
Uh, the Overmaster, it's got a early important decision. You could play Zito and contract it, or you could, but that would preclude you being able to play that turn to Dinosaur Nest. We're going to see a Xenon Banner, so not going for that turn one Zito. Lights Out Ace now picks up a Battlefront Dasher. Once you get past turn one, things get a lot more interesting with Battlefront Dasher as we could see some sort of combo in the mid game where you get to play a unit like a Carnivorous Yearling and Battlefront Dasher, give it plus one, plus one charge and get in a huge hit. Yeah, once the game slows down a little bit, I think the burden is on Lights Out Ace to try to set up big turns that can push back the defensive measures, trying to just sort of play, you know, even to the table, turn to turn. Um, that's going to be a hard way to do it because again, once the shop gets set up, it, it, it's just, this this Zen deck is just so much more powerful. Wow, look at that. So a Zito was played, not contracted, so the Overmaster could get down into Heat's Faithful. The Overmaster not prioritizing as much, getting the most value out of Zito right away, but trying to establish a large board presence. And now we'll see Carnivorous Yearling buff itself up to a 4-3 lifesteal putting itself in position to trade with the Nahid's Faithful. So we see both players right away making immediate sacrifices and long game value to try to get some tempo and traction on the board. And that play was really interesting from the Overmaster. It doesn't match people's intuitions there, but your Zito's not without value. It's still floating around. And additionally, once you play this 4-4 Nahid's Faithful, again, it's outside of range of everything but Baruch. You can't torch it. And if this ends up getting hit with Baruch, that clears the way for Hot Master Vikram somewhere down the line. So taking the hit from the Nahids, Faithful, likely indicating Light Out Ice is trying to set up a big turn here with Helena Sky Guide on the Carnivorous Yearling. And now a Javon is played from the Overmaster. I would imagine we're going to see a Torch here. Well, Torch plus Helena almost certainly is the turn. The question is the contract. It's a lot of damage this turn, but are you willing to basically sacrifice the next two? Now, you can recoup it a little bit with the Battlefront Dash for the following turn, but you are looking at essentially taking turn five off. Is that a thing that you can afford to do, or is the game going well enough here that you can just sort of torch, play the Helena without contract, and keep measure, kind of keep things measured as it is? So interestingly, we're going to see Helena come down, and we're not going to see the torch first. So the Javon did not get hit. This does leave back the Carnivorous Hearling as a blocker. It got plus three, plus four and endurance and now another Nahid's faithful attack is lights out is ready to make this trade between these four strength lifesteal units they are and now the overmaster picked up power number four so they've got hunt rats or vikram queued up for next turn as it's depleted power they're going to throw down a dinosaur nest now for lights out ace is a time to torch Again, I'm sure Lights Out Ace is being very cautious and thoughtful about how they want to line up their cards against the possible Huntmaster Vikram. One of the dangerous things is that if you don't kill the Javon, yes. Huntmaster Vikram comes down, a Javon attack buffs it up to a 3-4, is whenever Javon attacks, it gives plus one, plus one to each of your units that was played this turn. And that block from the previous turn of, of the Yearling on the Nahid's Faithful pretty loud signal here that uh, Lights Out Ace does not currently have a group because that would have just been an, uh, an awesome turn for otherwise. So the signal is there from the Overmaster's side that Hummaster Vikram could be ready to go right now. And as you mentioned, if the Javon attack gets it up to a 3-4 and it's outside of Torch range and there's no Verbrook there, those are the outs. Otherwise, you're just playing through it and the immediacy, the value, it's a lot to get through. All right, this is a scary turn now for Lights Out Ace as uh, the Overmaster picked up a Rat King. They've also got a Scythe Desert Herder. She's got an exciting contract as well, but we're going to be kicking things off with the Rat King. And now we could see a ton of value here as a Javon attack will buff all of those units. And even, even though it's ostensibly a bad attack on the, the table as the Helena can block the Javon, so much stats are given out to everything and the Rat King can finish off the Helena after the fact, that this is sort of a, uh, it's good no matter what. So the Rat King's gonna kick the turn off by sacrificing one of the rats, shrinking down Helena Sky Guide, and now we see Javon buffing all of those cards. 
Battlefront Dasher is going to trade off here, and that buffs up the Dinosaur Killer from Dinosaur Nest up to a 2-2. It could trade right in here and now with that Styre's Eyes. Or the Overmaster. They're going to have to make a decision here on the Killer. They're running out of time on the turn. What's it going to be? And it is going to trade off with the Styre's Eyes. So huge turn there one of the things that the overmaster really got out of that sequence was they established the rat king down and now in a future turn if they can get one power one more power they could play hot master vikram steal the unit and sacrifice it to the rat king right away kind of insulating them from ever losing the unit and a lot of this is about sort of reducing the exposure to how much it matters if your group gets immediately killed that's what i really like from the overmaster's perspective here is just all right now i've got a uh, uh i've got this presence my dinosaur nest is close to firing off and this turn i could just play civ and give killer to the rat king knock out something else and continue to develop now at 15 at a certain point you kind of need to answer everything but there's a lot of ways here to sort of manage the game incrementally get ahead on the table minimize your exposure to a removal spell just all good stuff now the overmaster could attack with that dirty rat too wonder if we'll see that because the 2-2 would go into the 2-3 Helena you sacrifice the other Helena and then yeah it would shrink it down lights out ace knows what's coming doesn't correctly doesn't block that dirty rat now we'll see the overmaster play the power will they go ahead and sacrifice the Helena they do to shrink the other one and so now uh, that lights out ace Helena is just down to a 1-2 they do pick up a carnivorous yearling for the turn so starting to make some progress I want to call out here that the overmasters play tactically and strategically has been brilliant in terms of understanding the matchup and also just just cashing in their chips with Vikram in spots where it's high leverage on the attack and they reduce their risk of something bad happening on the way back. Just really fantastic play here. All right, so this is going to get ugly now as Dinosaur Nest has flipped over into Sheltered Valley. We made another killer, which is now a 3-3 with the Dinosaur Nest. It could trade off with the Yearling. Sive could come down and give something killer to finish off Helena. There's just too many good things going on right now for the Overmaster. And for Lights Out Ace, they're running low on cards in hand. The Hell Toll is, race is swinging back in their favor. And so much of Lights Out Ace's bursty turns are sort of predicated on either having multiple units, which the Overmaster is not permitting, or something involving gem blazer cannon and you see the dismantle held up the hair the whole time this is just all right really so great stuff this could be a big turn here for lights out ace if you play battlefront dasher give the scale sworn patrol charge play the power you can buff the helena buff the scale sworn patrol you're getting in like what is that going to be like a seven point attack dropping the overmaster down to seven so getting, make it some progress back. Oh, a victimless crime off the top for the Overmaster. The hits keep on coming. That could take out the Scale Sworn Patrol. Well, right now we get to the stage where the Overmaster's priority has to shift to Inferno Phoenix. You're getting low, and we might see some really conservative play here in an attempt to mitigate the impact of that card off the top. That makes a lot of sense. Well, we're going to fire off the Victimless Crime right now, not wanting the Scale Sworn Patrol to buff the Helena again, and it's a Vabruk. Oh, that's a big one. And this is going to threaten, make the blocks very hard for the Overmaster. What a comeback here for Lights Out Ace. Swinging with everything, it's going to force the 3-3 Avasaur to chump the Vabruk. That Dirty Rat can't block, and we're going to see four points come across. Yeah, if you don't block the Verbruk, it's just lethal. Overmaster is down to three. Off the top, they pick up a Sinister Rumors. That's that's nice. It's a huge one. I mean, it's it's uh, it might need to be used right now on the Dasher, depending on the particulars. But we can also go into the Void and draw one of the units that we uh, that died earlier, like a Huntmaster Vikram. So a lot of options here for the Overmaster. Yeah, the conservative play here is just go ahead, play play a removal spell, play your sieve, make a you know deadly unit, and uh, a block here. But that is uh, not going to get the job done against an Inferno Phoenix at the top. And additionally, the Overmaster sort of generally needs to speed things up here because they're also in torch range. 
So they mm. might need to go for a higher upside play. Well, they're going to pick up one of those killer dinosaurs from earlier. That'll be able to trade with Verbrook. This is a lovely job of cleaning up the board here from the Overmaster. And now you can play Scythe. You can give Scythe killer or one of the other um, or that 3-3 three, three charging dinosaur killer. It's going to go on to Scythe and Scythe will revenge back into the deck. So now we've got a flying blocker. Oh, wow. Attacking with both. So that play is just correct because you're dead to torch anyway. So why sure. play around it? <laughs> got to get this game over with as soon as possible. Now the Overmaster drawing another copy of Scythe. The, they got a charging dinosaur off of their dinosaur nest. Scythe is probably going to trade off with the Battlefront Dasher here, opening the way for a lethal attack. And the Overmaster is going to finish this match off. Taking down our world champion. Wow. Just just really phenomenal play there from the Overmaster. Really, really great stuff. Yeah, something we talked about the other day on our preview show was the against the Rakano deck, you can be at, you know, a good board position, be, you know, 8, 10 health, and you cannot feel too safe because this deck has a ton of way to push damage and come up with big plays from its hand, thanks to those contract cards especially. You get to have these set up these huge turns. And Lights Out Ace did it. They got him down to three, but then the Overmaster was able to find a way to both stabilize that board, clear out the threats, and then clean out the game before a Torch could come off the top. And, and really, I think that that sort of showed the difference there. Now, you know, Lights Out Ace did lose that game, but, but it was much more competitive, uh, that call with the Dasher. Where the Zenon deck has a little bit of a weakness is they are not very good at interacting on your turn. They're able to play stuff. They can use the Rat King. Waystone Igniter, all of this speaks to developing things on your own turn. But their gloves are down a little bit on your turn. And uh, Lights Out Ace was able to make a lot of progress there, trying to set up bursty turns uh, with things like Charge, with Flying, that could get around the blockers. Made that game a lot more competitive. All right, let's check out our next match here. We are joining these players in progress. I'm Straight and Carnage are in game number three. We see Carnage has got a research station. They're playing one of the new relic weapons from Valley Beyond Lunar Claw, and they gave it plus three strength to trade with the Javon. For I'm a straight, um, yeah, it looks like they're gonna have to find a way to uh, to get moving here because when you look at Carnage's hand, Mystic Ascendant and Stormhall Plating as the leftovers, those are some tough cards to beat. Right now, Carnage is all the way up to 33. A lot of breathing space here. So I'm a straight. Did they? Like, it looks like they amplified a power. And now we see Mystic Ascendant come down. Empower plus two, plus two, and draw a card. It's up to a 7-7. Seven, seven. And they're one power away from getting to play a Storm while plating. A victimless crime off the top is a beautiful draw for I'm a straight. It's going to clear out the Mystic Ascendant, and now they get to make a 2-1 with their training camp. Carnage is not going to be able to play the Mystic Ascendant. Oh no, that's a Combray Tome, they can. They're gonna get to kill both of these units. But um, with that Waystone Igniter in hand, I'm a straight has a way to clear out the, the Stormhall plating. It has a contract ability to kill an even cost relic, which very much works on an A-cost relic. Well, there's also, there's not necessarily a need to do it right now. I mean, you have your, you can you can crank out these two ones and sort of attrition it out that way too. So this is, I mean, normally Waste of Igniter versus a Stormhall planning is like, yeah, of course, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Not right now. Here, I'm sure you might actually play a little bit of a long game. They've got some, tool, they've got three cards in hand versus one. You might want to just set up for a long game. All right, we will see. So we're going to see Sinister Rumors pick up a Javon. And now we will see the contract wipe out the the Stormhall plating. I, I think the issue there is like, you're still multiple turns away from getting it off the table. And when you're up against a deck with Furious Magnaventurous and Mystic Ascendant, I don't feel great about trying to play a super long game. Oh yeah, well, I mean, you're squeezed in both directions. I agree with all that, that could be the correct play, but also with your opponent at 30, like you're kind of playing a long game no matter what. All right, a Deadly Scorpion is played from Scythe. Uh, there, her contract is you can either play a 1-1 Deadly Scorpion or give a unit killer. Now we're going to see the Waystone Igniter be sacrificed. Picking up a Scorpion Nest, uh, Scorpion Wasp, and that's been a popular card this weekend. 
I imagine a lot to do with how well this that card lines up against a Furious Magnaventurous where it can't be stunned when it comes down with Ambush, and it just wipes out any Furious Magnaventurous regardless of size. And yeah, if both of these Magnaventurous attacks, this is going to be great for I'm Straight. Just trade off with these deadly units, and now we're going to have a clear board again. And a Javon and a Rat King actually some tools to play a deep game. Now, Carnage can blow all this up. They have individually much stronger cards in their deck. So we are going to see Scale Swarm Patrol played, and then the Research Station will double its stats. Now, I'm straight has a line here to get it off the board immediately, Patrick. Yeah, Rat King plus uh, using that killer attack is enough to get it off. I was actually thinking I wasn't a big fan of playing the Patrol here just because um, it, it, it gives up some equity if, you, if your uh, draw step is missing Ascendant, but um, if you had a, a, a station in play, then it's not close. Mm. All right, so nothing off the top here from Carnage. Nothing to use with that research station. I'm a straight picks up a dismantle, and now they're going to get to work with Javon the Steelcrest. Picking up a Seat of Mystery. We can play another power and uh, play out the training camp from Javon. We're now going to get to buff up that unit. Carnage is going to need some help here. All right, so Lunar Claw is a little bit of a reprieve for us here in that we could potentially kill the Javon. But the Dismantle threatens to pop the Lunar Claw and keep that Javon around. I'm a straight is going to take it. Kill an enemy attachment with cost four or less. A popular choice this week and among players. A lot to do with Dinosaur Nest, but it kills Lunar Claw too. Really love seeing here I'm straight just sort of splitting the difference here between card advantage and uh, presence here. I, I like, I really like drawing a card to turn with Javon and making it 2-1. Because if you miss again, you draw another power, um, you know, it, it, it's pretty inefficient. So this way they're able to play a long game while also applying as much pressure as possible. All right, a huge pickup here now from Carnage, drawing Argent Port Noble. This two cost, three, two lifesteal can contract to silence an enemy unit. Then we could start getting to work with it on Research Station. The only issue for if you use the contract is you can't do both. So they're just going to buff it up here, hoping to slow it down. But this doesn't very line up very well against the enemy board because most of these units plus a racking activation will trade with the uh, with the noble. Yeah, it, I mean it's it's better than nothing, but this is not a, a long term solution. Yeah, and with uh oh, there we go, Killer Destiny off of Sinister Rumors is going to threaten to do some work here against the Argent Port Noble. Make a 1-1 Deadly Scorpion. We can use the Rat King to shrink down the Argent Port Noble. And then Killer Attack to finish it off. And this isn't lethal. It's got to be very, very close. We're going to see another Rat King come down. Final Attack and boost up everything played this turn. Not quite lethal, dropping Carnage down the tube with just the Dinosaur Nest off the top. That is going to do it. I'm a straight wins this match. And yeah, I mean, that was a very impressive job by that Xenon deck. Uh, I mean, you're talking about a Mystic Ascendant and Stormhall Plating, both of which kind of got to do their thing for a turn. Mystic Ascendant came down and drew a card. Stormhall Plating came down and got to kill two units before it absorbed the contract from the Waystone Igniter. And yet still, by the end there, that Xena deck had completely taken over. Yeah, I mean, that, that, Zen, that Zen deck has a lot of sideways ways to kind of keep up in just the who's drawing more cards, who's accruing more resources. And the units that the Combray deck was generating just had no place. Like, th that, that was a game that they were very easily uh, able to manage. And without Harsh Rules and Senra Speaks, if you're really just looking at Stormhall Platen, I mean, just rats can manage that. You have your Waste Igniter. You have a lot of ways of maneuvering around that card. So. Really impressive display there by the Zen deck, and I'm sure just not panicking. I mean, that was a spot where you come into the game, it's game three. We look at the tools in each player's hands, and it's like, okay, this is you're really getting away from the Zenin player. And just, hurl, we can play a long game. We can we can go toe-to-toe -to -toe in a long game, too. As you mentioned, the combo deck did leverage a lot of their late-game tools, and this wasn't enough to grind through. All right, let's see if we've got another match in progress for us. We are taking a look at Dark Revenger and the Boxer here. This match tied up a one game apiece. Uh, Dark Revenger got a, a bigger take on Rakano here this weekend. You see Pisto ever churning in hand. That one, at the if you can end your turn with no cards in hand, draws three cards, and whenever the enemy player plays a spell, it deals three damage to them. So 
pretty nice end game piece there and you could just sort of see right now it looks like dark revenger is just solidly getting a little bit bigger than the boxer so the boxer is going to need to put together some kind of combination of cards to deal with all of this beef on the other side in a unit centric matchup it is typically better to be a little bit slower and a little bit bigger than the other way around and dark revenger is definitely the slightly slower slightly bigger deck here all right, so we see the Magnaventurus gain some armor. The other one attacking, benefiting from that armor, dropping the Boxer down to 16 as they jump with a Battlefront Dasher. Yeah, the, the Boxer is going to put the uh, weapon on the Iron Priestess. That's a nice place for it to be. Threatening to remove all the armor with this attack, but the Boxer is not confident even that they're going to make an attack here, it looks like. Yeah, I mean, maybe, uh, I guess there's a thought here of, am I supposed to block and try to set up some some combo flourish with the weapon and the dasher, but with all of Dark Revenger's units having endurance, there's there's really hard to conceive of a path that allows that to happen. All right, so there's nine damage on board. Inferno Phoenix and Hand is plus six. That's 15 damage, Patrick. Yeah, I no. think just chilling with the combination is going to be, you know, if the boxer attacks, uh, that's game, and if they don't attack, uh, that's also game. So, all no, right, no reason to rush it. Yeah, or in condemnation, uh, a really nice tool with Furious Magnaventures. Three cost, kill an enemy unit, gain armor equal to the attacking unit's strength. If we see that here, that's gonna be five. Oh, here's a real trick you could Valor. do. Valor. Yeah, you block with the ma you block with something. You buff the Iron Priestess up to a 6, and then you gain one more point of armor. Now, the Iron Priestess weapon, when killed, would be now a 6-6, six, six, so you got to weigh that. I was going to say, why why, why settle for 6? Why not 8? Oh, my God. Right. Yes, every unit you block. <laughs> <laughs> but it looks like uh, Dark Revenger is taking the more traditional path and just playing the condemnation. Fair enough. So now, for the Boxer, they're going to throw on a weapon onto the Styre's Eyes. It's all the way up to a 7 but those Magnaventuruses are going to be enormous when they attack next. They're going to be attacking as 810s. And, yeah, you can buff up the Styre's Eyes even bigger. The only problem is, as it stands, you're going to have to chump both of those Magnaventurus with the Boxer. All their power depleted, I believe, and Inferno Phoenix here will be lethal. Even if we block the two largest units, that is going to be nine damage coming across. Dark Revenger is going to take down the Boxer here. So a uh, couple of different decks uh, taking it down in this round. I mean, I guess we saw Xenon sort of do good work on the first two matches. Uh, we'll have to see exactly how close those lists are. But then we do see a bigger take on Rakano. So it does seem like players this weekend were sort of prepared for the idea that they were going to have to deal with these Rakano decks. And we've seen a number of players uh, be very well positioned, either being able to outgrind the control strategies like that Combray deck or go over the top of the Rakano aggro deck. Yeah, I mean, these are decks that are playing in the middle and trying to interact against decks that are faster and trying to play enough of the distribution of the card advantage, attrition, pressure game against control that you can hang against both strategies. And we saw very strong performances that round from a bigger build of Rakano and Zenon. All right. Was that the last match of the round? All right. So that's going to do it for our first round of action, round seven of the event. We have just two more rounds of Swiss left for our 16 competitors before we break it down to that top four. We will take a few minute break to get the next round ready to go. And then we will be heading into the stretch run here. These matches are pivotal. We got tens of thousands of dollars on the line. A lot of pressure for these players, and we'll be right along to bring you all of the action. Stay tuned. We'll be back in a few minutes. Welcome. This morning, we have another interview with one of our 2021 World's competitors. And thanks for the great throw there, myself, in the future. Um, uh, <laughs> this morning, I'm joined by Carnage, a.k.a. Morgan. And we Morgan won the most recent Open we ran, the Expedition Open. And this morning, we're going to be talking to them about that tournament, uh, their experiences in Eternal, how they got so darn good at the game, and what we can expect to see from them in the future. 
Uh, but let's get things kicked off by, first of all, introducing Morgan and giving them a chance to uh, to tell the people at home anything uh, that you'd like them to know about yourself, uh, like who you are, where you're from, what you do. Hey, guys, I'm Carnage. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm uh, from Newfoundland, Labrador, Canada. And uh, I, I obviously I play a lot of Eternal. Um, I played Eternal and it was the first card game that, you know, actually felt like it was, it was similar to Magic, but there's things I like about Eternal more than I like about Magic. As far as your introduction to Eternal, do you remember the first card you saw or maybe a card you saw early on that jumped out to you um, that really caught your attention? Uh, Channel the Tempest, I'm going to go with. Uh, I don't know. I've, uh, in Magic, I've always played like heavy control decks with a with some kind of crazy wing con. What's better than having a, a wing con that draws your cards? <laughs> No doubt, no doubt. In terms of your journey from when you started playing to Eternal to now you've won a, won a big tournament, you've mentioned you've done well in previous tournaments and you're going to be going to Worlds. What were, do you, are there any moments that stand out to you as like, oh, I get it now. Something clicked in terms of a moment where it's like, I'm going to be just so much of a better player because I figured out this thing about the game. So learning, like learning the meta is the number, is the key. The key part to success, in my opinion, when it comes to competitive, I mean, you gotta you gotta test you gotta test all those matchups, and you know, yeah, you, you also gotta have good teammates to test with. Is a, is a, that that put my eternal game over the top of, mm. of where it came? I wasn't on a team team for a long time, and uh, I just wanted I started my own. So I started the uh, team in Vocal Lethal, me and my uh, friend Johnny Do uh, Doyle. He used to uh, stream Eternal, but uh, he quit for reasons. Uh, something came up. But, uh, yeah, me and him started team in Vocal Lethal uh, together, and it was the best decision I ever made because I, uh, I threw together a, a bunch of really crazy players. <laughs> awesome. And if for the people at home who, were, who hear this and – and are interested in trying to get better, what kind of advice would you give them in terms of what it takes to start a team or how they can go about trying to join a team or finding players to connect with? Because it sounds like you had some, maybe some people in mind when you joined a team, but that didn't, isn't the kind of thing that just happened overnight. Yeah. I mean, uh, discord is, is the best thing you could ever do in the sense of the eternal community. I mean, join some discords, get talking, you know, there's lots of, uh, there's lots of discords where you can just, drop into the general channel and just talk eternal and i mean before i was on a team I, I was in some of those discord channels and just reading what people have to say about the game discussions about each format deck lists it's like it just i don't know it just gives you more general knowledge about everything to do with eternal it helped like a lot <laughs> i play a lot of different games and uh i'm, I'm in a lot of different gaming communities but uh, eternal uh, that's what that's what I, that's what draws me to Eternal. It's why I, I still play. I mean, it's an amazing game. I love card games, but my main reason for still playing Eternal is the community and the people I met over the, the course of my, I guess you call it a career. <laughs> uh, since I started Eternal, yeah, the community is amazing. But nobody, you know, nobody treats anybody with disrespect. Everybody's just so helpful. So now that you're qualified for the world championships, uh, what's your plan for sort of the next couple of months? Are you going to take it easy? Still playing the tournaments and uh, what's your, what's your mindset like as we, as we head down the stretch here of the 2021 season? Uh, we're, we're going to play, I'm going to play in all the, all the tournaments. Uh, I'm, I'm never going to miss a, a tournament if I don't have to. Um, let's, uh, we're going to get another uh, team invoke lethal member into the world's that's the plan. That's the target. Oh, that's a great goal. Sounds like you'll be a great play testing partner to have uh, in the meantime. Uh, as far as the world championships yourself, sort of how much pressure do you think you'll be putting on yourself? Is it is it one of these things where you got to worlds, you're going to try your best and you'll be happy? Or is it like, nah, I'm, I'm going to really put pressure on myself <laughs> to try to take this one down and be the world champion? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it'd be amazing. To, to be the world champion but uh i'm just proud of myself for actually making it to worlds uh yeah I, i've been playing eternal ever since day one and uh, i've always wanted to make worlds just to make it is, is cool like 
it's awesome. Uh, but yeah, there's uh, it's uh, I'm not gonna be too hard on myself because the best players in the game are gonna be next to me playing. So that makes sense. Uh, and as far as the world championships yourself itself, uh, is there a player maybe in the world's field or potentially there? that you at least would want to go up against because you know you're going to be in for a really tough match if you want to win <laughs> if you're playing them so this is my shout out to the boxer <laughs> i'm coming for you bud <laughs> very nice me and him are uh, me and him go way back when it comes to eternal he's actually uh when i first started eternal he's helped me out a lot with deck lists and and tips and and he's just in my opinion he's just the best player in the game he's uh He's creative and he, he, he polished stacks amazing. So with that, we're going to throw it back to myself and Patrick Sullivan for the conclusion of the draft open. And we will be finding out, sounds like pretty shortly, who's going to be joining Carnage in the 2021 World Championships. Daddy, tell him to send mommy's water bottle. <laughs> you, you came at a good time, bud. That was we're... pretty great timing. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome back to the World Championships. Andrew Beckstrom, Patrick Sullivan here. We got we had an awesome round to start off the day. Uh, lots of great games, lots of high-level play here. And uh, we're getting ready for our second to last round of the Swiss. We are in the expedition stage of the tournament. Let's take a look at the standings and where these players are at with just two more rounds of action to go. So DDD at 6-1. and one. They're in a phenomenal shape to qualify for that top four. But then after that, we have got a lot of players still in contention. Your world champion lights out ace now at 5-2. and two, The Overmaster at 5-2. and two, And then the Boxer, Iron Man, Ronin X, Dark Revenger, Collector, and I'm a Straight at 4-3. and three. Our guess is that the players at four losses are probably now on the, on the, the bad side of the records. But uh, for those top four competitors, uh, we're getting very, very close to locking them in with just two rounds to go. Let's talk about one player in their deck, Patrick, Collector. They started off yesterday 0-3 in Construct, in Limited, in Draft, rattled off the 3-0 in Throne, won their first match of Expedition to start the day, and this is what they've got, and this is the deck that they're hoping they will ride to a World Championship. Right, and this is the, a deck that we saw from a couple competitors last round in sort of a Xenian mid-range deck. There's a bit of a sacrifice thing, theme going on here with cards like Devour, uh, and he's faithful, but capable, as we saw, of playing a better game on the table against the faster Rakano decks while having the staying power to hang against control strategies like Combray. Yeah, and uh, Victimless Crime, three copies this weekend. That was a card that didn't get to see very much play in the early stages of this expedition format with so many hero-centric strategies running around, Sindane's Bracers, Gold-Plated Revolver, um, the Yeti Ambassador, and it's uh, it was it didn't seem as attractive to be playing with a removal spell that couldn't kill heroes. But now this weekend with Furious Magnaventris, uh, just such an important card to get off the table that we are seeing a lot of success from with this card. Yeah, it's really funny. It, it sort of mirrors my own experience here, where uh, when Cold Hunt came out, I, I built a deck to play on live, first order of business naturally, four copies of Victimless Crime. 
It's a low power format, two cost fast removal is great. And then after like 10 games of not killing anything once, I was like, all right, these got to go. <laughs> but now it's time for a resurgence, right? I, again, the the a lot of the best cards from uh, Valley Beyond, the units are not heroes. Now, Hamasic Vikram, of course, a notable exception to that. But the dinosaurs are just really powerful on-rate non-hero units. And so Victimless Crime has gotten an opportunity to shine here where, as recently as a month ago, it was basically not seen in the expedition format. Yep, uh, one of the other big tools this weekend are all of these flying deadly units, Blister Sting Wasp and Scorpion Wasp, uh, doing a great job of ensuring no matter how big the threats get from uh, from something like Scale Sworn Patrol or Timeless Bond, that they're well under control. Uh, what w And for Collector this round, their opponent, what was that, Tom? They're, they're going to be up against Dark Revenger, so... They've got a Recano deck. They've got uh, this was the bigger build that we saw last round. So we're gonna get to see um, two players that were successful last round. They are one and zero in Expedition, and this is similar to Lights Out Aces build, but we're going all the way up to Pisto, Stormhall Plating, and Hojin. So getting things kicked off here in round number eight, Collector versus Dark Revenger. Uh, an interesting draw here for a Dark Revenger. No Justice sigils in hand, but one of the great things, Scale Swarm Patrol can be inscribed. Yeah, and, and sort of the, the uh, I assume we're going to see one uh, inscribed perhaps on the second turn. Again, you can defer the de decision one turn, but it's, even here it's not totally free to defer. We get a little jammed up. Yeah, and the uh, decision to not inscribe the Squirrel Swarm Patrol has kind of paid off in that uh, they pick up now a Seat of Glory, and so maybe we might be able to get both of these Scale Swarm Patrols down and empowering. For Collector, turn number three, we are going to see the Rat King 3-2 making some dirty rats. Will that be met with a bullseye? It will. Yeah, the, the Rat King is, is pretty rough against the patrol. Uh, and also, uh, the Dark Revenger is kind of at least next, you know, whatever. Two or three turns are kind of spoken for. Even having one power left over is not guaranteed. So Dark Revenger's got an interesting decision here. Um, they'd love to potentially save that Oni Insider for a Dinosaur Nest. But if next turn they want to be able to play Scale Swarm Patrol, empower and buff one of the units in play well they're going to need to get a unit down this turn right my my intuition here is to just play the first patrol um and it sets you up for a variety of profitable following turns even if the patrol doesn't die but there is an argument for holding here and trying to make sure you get your money out of the whole thing all right so a very patient game here from dark avenger this is a very you know, a there's some similar overlap in cards with Lights at Us, but this is a very different style of game as Collector amplifies their Shadow Sketch. Hell yeah. Makes <laughs> Hell yeah. My, that's my that's my fan creative card Tell us right about there. Shadow Sketch. Uh, it's free. You can just play with it pretty easily. And one game out of ten, you just arbitrarily win as a result of having it. I would play more copies than people typically do. Time to tune up a fan. Tune up a fan. <laughs> there we Look go. At that. Three free points, plus implied more points down the line. <laughs> What's that to like? Uh, it's, yeah, gotten a lot of nice value there from uh, from Shadow Sketch, which makes a three-cost relic that you can, once per turn, pay three to give your units plus one strength this turn. So it works very nicely in a go-wide deck. Now we're making the time relic off of time sketch. And that training camp will be able to spit out two one soldiers once per turn if collector pays four. That's the avatar, by the way, I'm trying to get the custom avatar of. Like, my own avatar. <laughs> shadow sketch. You're, just, you're the shadow sketch yeah. guy? All right, so will we see another Oni Insider come down? It could remove the training camp that was played, but we're going to see no plays from Dark Revenger. Just very, very patient game. And now a very suspicious attack here by Collector, attacking a 1-1 into a 4-2. It'll make a lot more sense in a moment as the Rat King... Number two arrives, ready to come down, sacrifice a rat, and pick off that Oni Insider. In fairness, we saw last turn that Devourer was the trick, so there's not a, a guarantee that the Rat King was the follow-up, but now it's been clarified. Now a Blister Sting Wasp. Dark Revenger picks up a Hojin Beloved Son. That would come down as a 4-4. At the end of your turn, Hojin can double the stats of a unit that has less strength than Hojin. And now Oni Insider comes down, blows up the training camp, but as just a 3-3, does threaten to be lost to the Rat King in a moment. A lot of signal here from this line. Uh, inscribe to power, uh, 
did not get any any armor, so it has to be. Well, I guess it could be patrol as well, but sort of suggesting that there's a uh, more expensive play potentially coming. So Huntmaster Vikram appearing, and it does kill. It steals the Oni Insider. Now we will see a Defiance pick off the Rat King. Dark Revenger getting ready to get down Pisto, ever churning here in a moment. But is Dark Revenger going to have enough time? Oh, look at this play. We're going to Finest Hour or something, trying to set up for Pisto to be empty-handed. When it is, at the end of your turn, you get to draw three cards. Is this going to give Dark Revenger what they need to get back into this game? Or is it going to be three power into a top deck Hunt Master Vikram? Give me that Pisto. I'm swinging in. If this ain't lethal, it's very close. It is exactly lethal. Collector takes down game number one, continuing their undefeated run in Constructed. Do you know where we uh, picked up th uh, from the Collector side? I I'm saying we, I mean the Collector here. Do you know where we picked up three free points of damage that game to get lethal that turn rather than the following turn the when, Sto when Stormhall Plating could have maybe played <laughs> uh, a recuperative game? Was it the Shadow Sketch? It was the Shadow Sketch. Well, okay. All right. Well, that's not totally fair, right? Because we have to, we have to go back and like, well, what did you pay for the Shadow Sketch? Like, what was the opportunity to cost? Oh, it was completely free. Just start playing with this card. Come on. Come on. Get it over. What's Just the it. most number of Shadow Sketches you've had in play in a game? Seven. Seven? Seven. Goodness. Because you do it on nine, and then you do it on 12. And then from there, then you wait. Because eventually you'll find Twisted Farmer or whatever the thing is. Uh, Yeah. You can also use Shadow Skits to help set up End of an Era. That comes up sometimes. Uh, yeah, of course. Absolutely. Uh, you know, you, you have to play a second faction for that, so that's sort of off the table for me. But, yes, that's another line that's available to you. Combo gamer. All right. Uh, here we are in game number two. Collector is up a game. Uh, one of the things that's nice about Dark Avengers build, they are playing with Bullseye this weekend, which gives them a nice little answer to Dinosaur Nest. And we see one, two, three copies of the Nest. So we're going to have a... A little bit of a, a game of repetition here is we're going to get to see Dark Revenger kill a nest, another nest come down, then Dark Revenger kill it. <laughs> Meanwhile, Collector, yeah, here's that's nest number two. Wow, so lucky. You've drawn so many nests. But now Bullseye. Bullseye that. I just, you know, get out of here. Dark Revenger could inscribe a Scale Swarm Patrol, but instead they're just going to miss the power for this turn. How are we going to see Collector go to the nest once again? We are. And now a Sinister Rumors is going to wipe out that Oni Insider. Oh, no, it's not. Kills an exhausted enemy unit with three strength or less, and Finest Hour says, no, sir. Yeah, I'm, I, I do like using the Finest Hour there, uh, largely because it's a, hard that's, a card that's very hard to profitably cash in in this matchup. So any spot where you can you know, trade it for something, get a hit in, I mean, it's not ideal because, you know, the 1-1s one are being, be coming off the dinosaur nest here. But again, it's it's really hard for Finest Hour to do anything productive. All right, so we're going to see Scale Sworn Patrol plus a Vercano Banner will buff up the patrol. My guess is we'll see it buff up the Own Insider. The, I mean, it's a nice clean attack here, you know. Well, I think the familiarity with the deck list is going to give Dark Revenger some pause here. They're well aware of... The scorpion wasps um, in collector's list, but no, we're gonna we're gonna go for it, and so wasp is going to probably take down Helena. The Oni Insider does get through. Now going back collector's way with a victimless crime in hand and a blister sting wasp and a Javon. They got some cleanup tools here. Yeah, a problem that you're seeing in the previous game and in this game is there's a lot of cards in Dark Revengers lists that just don't really exchange profitably here. It's pretty hard to beat this in deck with just removal. Cards like Aura Combination, Defiance, even Torch are not the easiest thing to convert into a full card. The Finest Hour had to get used in a, a spot where it wasn't great, but like, what else are you going to do with it? And now Dark Revenger's hand is kind of getting flooded with reactive cards that don't line up very well here. All right, so Dinosaur Nest flips over into Sheltered Valley. The 3 3 killer is coming at the 4 2 Oni Insider, and we're going to see an Orin Condemnation take out the 3 3 killer dinosaur, picking up Dark Revenger's 3 armor. No attacks by those dinosaurs. Now, an Inferno Phoenix off the top. This is, uh, this is an interesting spot, but uh, well, that Rune of Flame came into play depleted. Have we just not played a sigil this game? That's kind of no, hard to believe. It does not appear that we have. Yeah, I guess so. 
But next turn, the Inferno Phoenix will come down, I imagine. And now a Waste Zone Igniter is going to buff itself up. Maybe. No, we're going to make a 1 1 Spiteling. Inferno Phoenix number two. It's pretty cool because you get to attack with this one, trade off with the Blister Sting Wasp, clearing way for the larger Inferno Phoenix. Collector's going to need some help. That Inferno Phoenix is in Tomb gives the top three units of your deck either flying, charge, or double damage. So we'll be seeing some juicy units coming off the top soon. Or a Defiance for now. But Inferno Phoenix is going to get this job over really quick. Four times two is eight. Takes away 11 down to three. Now a Scorpion Wasp for Collector is going to keep them alive. So we get an attack on the way back. Time Sigil will be played. Off the top is a Recano Banner. Now Dark Revenger is still very much in this after these units trade off here because the units on top of the deck, there's a great possibility that we're going to be hitting units with both Flying and Charge soon. So Collector is going to have to try to win very quickly here. We're going to see them get across for five points here. Maybe a Defiance will slow this down. It will. But all you can really do if you're a collector, right, is just play your units in a space a bunch. Yeah, I mean, you could, you know, you could sort of make it sack the spiteling here in an effort to get up. But, like, there's so much ambiguity about what are the sequences that can kill you here that just keeping the unit, just keep attacking, I think, is the thing to do. And there's 10 coming across right now with a training camp that's going to be 12 next turn. Collector is closely, quickly closing in here. Dark Revenger is going to need it right now, and it's a Justice Sigil. Dark Revenger is going to die if there is an all-out attack on the next turn. I can't imagine Collector not making it, given how threatening the units are on top of Dark Revenger's deck. And the, there was a huge Voltroned up unit somewhere. It might have literally been the very next card for Dark Revenger. They couldn't get to it in time. Collector takes them down. And keeping that, heating go that heater going, too. Yeah, absolutely. So that is now five in a row for mm. Collector. They're up to five and three, putting themselves in strong position with a win next round um, for our top four or at least the tiebreaker playoff. Um, you know, there's a lot of players in the mix right now, so it's going to be very close these next two rounds. We'll get down to another match as soon as it's queued up here. But, uh, I mean, for Collector, uh, the draft was not favorable, but, man, Constructed, it's been going great. Yeah, I mean, 0-3... Uh, 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 you know, it takes so long, so much effort to get here. And starting off your draft 03 is easily, it's easy to kind of shut down on that spot because you've been building up for this moment for the better part of the year. But to shake it off, just rip off five in a row and probably, I, I mean, it's the math is going to be fuzzy. We don't know for sure, but probably at least get a shot if you win next round of getting an elimination shot in the top four. What a comeback. Yeah, one thing to keep in mind is that our top four playoff will, will only have one match for a tied top four slot. And so it's possible that who's in that is going to come down to tiebreakers. You're not helping your tiebreakers by starting off 0-3. No, it's, it, again, it's still going to be an uphill battle, even if the collector is able to win the next round and all the tiebreakers hold. But I, I, I'm sure starting off 0-3, you would take that spot versus like what would, would typically happen. Absolutely. All right, let's get down to our next match here. Uh, we're going to be checking out Ronin X versus DDD. And it looks like these players, uh, we've got... Similar factions, though DDD's deck is very uh, aggressive build of Combray. They've got Timeless Bond here to buff up this Terius over the Unseen Marksman. DDD is down a game in this match. They are coming across here right now with Terius and those Awakened Students. And uh, DDD DDD is really, I, I think, sort of the uh, uh, a lot of how this tournament is going to conclude here is a uh, has to do with them. They are running away with things a little bit. And if they're able to knock some people out along the way, could change the cut. Yeah. All right. So Terius is going to trade with that Waystone Igniter. His Valor units poking in. Now we've got Nalesi. Huntmaster Vikram ready to swing things back in Ronin X's favor. Come on to this team. Alessi, a 4-4 four, four, and a 2-3. Going to do a nice job here against these 1-1s one, and 2-2s two, with Valor. But... Gavel's in sight. So if there is a block from Ronin X, this is going to not go well. So no blocks. Ronin X sniffs out the combat trick into a scale sworn patrol. Starting to grind some serious advantages here. 
And I like the no block. That turn, even if it's extremely conservative around one pump spell, you have so much better uh, ability to block next turn if you just block with the Alessi, because if it happens to die in combat, so what? It wasn't yours to begin with. So, and going from 16 to 12 isn't that threatening. So, uh, even if there's a chance there to DDDDD is bluffing, which is certainly possible, I like a conservative no block on that previous turn. All right, a Waystone Igniter is picked up for DDD. Now, if, if there's any confusion, there is a dinosaur nest that has not been flipping or pumping out dinosaurs. My imagination here is that it was silenced earlier from an Argent Port Noble, so no text on that relic right now. All right, so Ronin X picking up another power. They're going to get to Scales Horn Patrol and do a little more buffing again. Now, Ronin X is in an interesting spot. You know, they can get this game over with pretty fast. I mean, they're dropping DDD down to nine, but you don't want to be too hasty and have this combat trick and the Gavel's Insight push DDD over the finish line. Alessi's going to get buffed up here. Oh, no. <laughs> no, unless when you play a spell, unless he gets plus one plus one, and you for each of the spells factions, um, seek power not helping you out. Yeah, a, you know, a power is a power, a power, but you would like to see a little, a little, a slightly more synergistic thing occur there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So scales horn patrol buffs up Alessi, the patrol, and the top of the deck. This is a lethal attack coming across here. From Alessi in the Scales Horn Patrol, I will have to see some kind of block. I I'm imagining just a chump maybe on the Scales Horn Patrol. Maybe you want to be careful. Oh, okay. We haven't finalized the attacks yet. You don't have to block this. But we are going to chump. DDD wants to keep their health total in a healthier range. And probably just once DDD, if Ronin X wants to avoid at all costs the possibility of having to put Vikram in front of the Waystone Igniter. Like, that's just the way your House of Cards can collapse. So just a, a slightly conservative no attack there from the patrol the previous turn. But I think it's it's fine to be a little cautious there. All right, so this is a lethal attack if this is coming across from Scalesworn Patrol and Alessi. But uh, once again, it's going to be just Alessi. Will DDD make that same chump block? They will. Let's the tactical advantage there is it means that the individual units aren't lethal. And now we see Furious Magnaventress going to be able to help out here. It's potentially stunning uh, the Scale Swarm Patrol. And this opens up a potential attack with the Waystone Igniter, but Ronin X, but DDD does not take it. And now it'll be very interesting to see if Ronin X wants to attack with Alessi. No, I think at this point you want to hold back because, you know, the, uh, oh, okay. Interesting. All right. So unless he's going to be buffed up, we are going to see a chump Let's from the Valor. Now it's um a power off the top. Now the Magna Ventures can attack with three armor, so it's going to be attacking as a 6-8. I don't think we're going to see a block from Ronin X, so it drops them down to six. This game is getting very close. A Furious Magna Ventures off the top for Ronin X. That will lock down the Waystone Igniter and potentially open things up here for an all-out attack. This is not necessarily going to be lethal, but it is going to force a very, very block by the Magna Ventures on the Scalesworm Patrol. Taking 11. Yeah, assuming that DDDDD does not have interaction here, they, they cannot allow the patrol to hit. And if you get a chump block out of it, you knock them down to one, and then you can kind of play clean up from there. Ronin X has been super cautious about putting that Vikram into combat, so they've got to be pretty confident here that there's nothing that can go wrong. Well, it's going to be a great turn for Ronin X. The Magna Ventress is going to be chumping. DDD is going to fall down to one. What is on the top of the deck? It is a Scale Sworn Patrol. That is not going to be enough juice to get this one. And DDD is going to fall to Ronin X. Picks up the match. So that was, uh, that was a close one, but uh, Huntmaster Vikram gets it down. And I would say that that card has been um, the real winner from what we've seen in the expedition rounds today. And 
it's sort of been a little bit of a tale between uh, players who have it and then players who have some tools, but it doesn't seem like enough to deal with that card. Right, and it, 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 I think a lot of it also has to do with just the ubiquity of Dinosaur Nests. If people are spending a lot of their... You know, typically when you're building a deck, there's like, here's the core thing that I'm up to. And then these are other cards that people play typically that I want to be able to respond to. And if you look at these these lists, a lot of people have those sort of flex slots tied up at things like Wasted Igniter, other things to silence uh, Dinosaur Necks, Bullseye, Oni Insider. There's a lot of attention on that card. If you're looking at the lists here and trying to find things that people are playing to answer Vikram, it's basically nothing. And in fact, people have Victimless Crime in a lot of their Shadow Decks as well. And so in terms of taking advantage of where people are at or finding maybe the second most powerful card, but the one with no spotlight on it, Vikram has really stood head and shoulders above all the other ba Valley Beyond cards in this tournament so far. All right, let's get down to our next match. We're going to be checking out I'm a Straight versus Phoenix. So, Phoenix, top of your screen. They've got just a straight Argent Port deck this weekend. A classic, just sort of grind them out fashion with Crown Watch Press Gangs, Zetos, and then I'm a Straight. This is one of our Xenon players, but... uh. It's uh, looking a little uh, ugly here in the power department as they are going to Sinister Rumors. All of the harsh rolls out of Phoenix's deck. So Sinister Rumors, that third mode, you can discard all the copies of a spell from the enemy player's deck. And now the Nahid's Faithful comes down, sacrifices the Waystone Igniter, and Phoenix could uh, play a Press Gang. They could hold up Orin Condemnation. A couple of ways to play this turn. At the, our preview show that we did on Friday, I called out Phoenix's deck as what I believe to be the best metagame call that anyone made in the Expedition format. Uh, I think this is a, a deck that with some vulnerabilities to the primal hero stuff, but with that basically not represented this weekend, uh, I, I think this, this would be my choice for best deck. All right, so Phoenix now looking at a Zito, another Crown Watch Press Gang. They've certainly got to be a little bit wary about Javon. Um, we've seen some really big turns with that card so far this weekend. Just from that attack mode of uh, attack to buff all the units you've played this turn. That six drop in hand is a four, six lion lifesteal. Inscribed Valor. It's got a lot of words, does a lot of things. Would get stolen here by Huntmaster Vikram would open up some attacks. And I think, you know, Phoenix at the end of the day is probably willing to live with a little bit of that because I think there's a hope here of being able to line up the Sinister Rumors against the Javon. The deck doesn't really answer that card too cleanly otherwise, especially now with the harsh rules all in the void. And so uh, some of this might be trying to induce that attack to maybe clean that card out and then start leveraging all their attrition elements. One of the really nice things about Vikram is that in a spot like this, you play Vikram, you, if you were to steal something like the 4-6 Flyer, it exhausts it. So even on your next turn, or on the enemy's next turn, if they kill, find a way to get Vikram off the board, that unit's still exhausted. It didn't get to ready at the start of the enemy turn, and so it kind of removes it for two blocks. Now, I'm a straight is just going to take the sort of the safer, more conservative line here of just let me victimless crime and get that... That Valkyrie off the board for good. Attacking with Nahid's Faithful. Now picking up a Magna Ventress on Phoenix's side. And Magna Ventress has a way, not of, of this turn necessarily, it's not required, but uh, can get the uh, Javon exhausted and then allow the Rumors to play cleanup here. All right, Imperious, or Furious Magna Ventress. Stuns Nahid Faithful, picks up three armor. Zito Cabal Housecat is going to make I'm a Straight discard a card. What will go to the wayside? It's going to be Javon. So now I'm a Straight. If they take the Magna Ventress, they can attack with it and Javon right away. The Housecat would probably jump in. Soak up some damage. It's a, it's a tough spot for him from I'm straight though here because uh, Phoenix has really been putting their jaw out for, for Vikram now over the course of two turns, 
And I'm, I, I believe the reason that these turns are kind of taking a long time, that they're complicated, is uh, I'm straight is, I think, under the assumption here that they have an answer to Vikram. They are trying to specifically trying to induce it. And how do they go about managing that? All right. Well, they're not going to bait it out the answer. We're going to see the attack by Javon and the Magnaventress wipes out that three armor. And a Lunar Claw is picked up for Phoenix. They didn't have the card in hand that could kill Vikram before. They do now. If they want, they could just play that Lunar Claw. It's a 1-4 Relic Weapon, but it can also be used to with its summon to give it plus 3 Strength this turn. 4-4 four, four Relic Weapon will get the job done. Will kill Vikram. The Magnaventress comes back, and now it gets to attack. With one armor on that side of the board, it will be buffed up to a 4-6. We're going to see Crown Watch Press Gang sit back. Um, that's a sort of I'm a straight be paying um, good credence to the possibility of another Huntmaster Vikram in hand and not wanting to sort of just lose the game on the spot. Yeah. Now Zito's going to come down. Not going to be contracted. This allows I'm a straight to hold up both Scorpion Wasp and Devour. It's a painful one not to contract, though. I mean, I understand the reasoning, but uh, in a game that's really like this attrition oriented, giving up the <laughs> card there is 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 not free. All right, here's Magnaventress. Attacking as a 4-6, it's going to run into a Scorpion Wasp, and now the Lunar Claw could take out the Zito, but potentially we'll just sit back for now. Crown Watch Press Gang finds the Destiny Zito floating around the top of the deck. It's going to contract goodbye, Scorpion Wasp number two. And Phoenix has really, really, really gummed up the ground now with two Press Ganks and a Zito. I'm a straight is uh, going to be looking for a way to break through this mess. They're going to start things off by devouring their Zito, drawing two cards, picking up a Scythe. Now, uh, your favorite card is going to get into the fray. Shadow Sketch has been here. played. <laughs> no, no, it's not. It's not that good here. So, for Phoenix, if they want to start attacking, they could If the with the Press Gangs. If, uh, if, a, if a Faithful blocks, they could use the Lunar Claw to finish it off. It would gain, I'm straight, a bunch of health, but it would get this board smaller. Yeah, you could just split the difference here and just attack with one. Probably not going to block. Then you can play your Justice Sketch. You have a good blocker back. You have a combination in your hand to handle something sudden happening. And then you can pivot towards just just growing these press gangs. Now you, you need to be cautious about it because of Vikram and, and other considerations. But uh, this is a route to, even with even with health holes at 27.9, to actually pivot and get this thing over with pretty quick. All right, so here's Scythe, Desert Herder. Going to give Killer to itself in attacking the Zito. Now our condemnation is going to kill this revenge unit. Picking up three armor for Phoenix and sending Scythe back into the deck with Destiny. And now for Phoenix. I guess there, we could see an attack here by the Faithful, but I don't know why that would help out Ima Street. Why? I think this is just going to get met with a double block. It's very good for Phoenix. All right, the press gang goes back into the deck. The faithful goes away. And now this justice sketch we played last turn for Phoenix can start going to work on this press gang and buffing it up. Yeah, well, there's the again, there's just the concern of of Vikram here. I think Phoenix ideally would like to wait until um, either they can kind of set up lethal in one huge swing, maybe by playing the second one, or have some coverage. So we're going to see an Argentport blueprint be cracked here. Um, this is allows Phoenix, it's a relic that allows Phoenix to draw two units from their void. They both get Aegis and Endurance. The and Zito is, had, yeah. it, had Destiny, so it goes right into play. But uh, that Valkyrie is going to be uh, just a huge issue. And that, that, that line there, I think, is, is really sharp, really safe. You don't want to put your eggs in one basket against the deck with Vikram and Devour and removal. So this pushes ahead. It's still doing stuff. Um, but you're not allowing I'm straight to just top deck one card and get all the way back in. All right. So the Rat King comes down, does not sacrifice any rats. Uh, we're going to see both units attack here. And Phoenix is uh, feeling great about their spot right now. 
I uh, imagine we're gonna see a Spire Loyalist show up. An Argent Port Noble is going to silence the Rat King. The Lunar Claw is gonna get to work on these Dirty Rats. Now a Devour for I'm a Straight. Could uh, gas him back up. Let's sack the Dirty Rat. Draw two cards, gain two health. All right, there's a Zito. They are going to contract. And now Sive is back. This is this is not a bad turn. There's some stuff going on here, but yeah, um, Phoenix's spot is becoming pretty unassailable. Yeah, it's it's pretty annoying. Though, let's keep in mind that if we can pop the Aegis off that Spire Loyalist, Huntmaster Vikram will be able to steal it, and the fact that it got Endurance from the Arjunbor Blueprints will start working in Ima Strait's favor. So we're gonna see Racking trade with the Argentport Noble. Now your Scythe has Killer. What is? What do you do with it? I mean, the only thing you can really do is the Press Gang, right? Like maybe that's still good enough, but that does potentially let Phoenix spike on the way back. I, I just don't. I'm struggling to think of what else you would do do with it at this point. Sure. And it's not even, you can't even say, well, I'll get to block for some, uh, for sure, somewhere down the line. Because there's the possibility of, uh, of the Justice Sketch pumping it up past your ability to block. All right, here's Crown Watch Press Gang. Found a Zito. Mm. This is going to be just disgusting. An eavesdrop here. Four Phoenix is going, if played, will wipe out that Hauntmaster Vikram and the Seed of Mystery from hand. We are very quickly closing in for Phoenix now because that Huntmaster Vikram and the threat of that being able to maybe take the Spire Loyalist and force maybe an R in Condemnation on it was one of Ima Strait's best paths to get back into this game. And now even Sinister Rumors to get back uh, a Vikram is off the table as well. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> and, yeah, don't forget, uh, Phoenix still has a research station. Yeah. So they get to double the stats of the... Yikes. All right, there comes Spire Loyalist in. 812 Flying Lifesteal. Waystone Igniter. Doesn't really help. It can't even kill the research station because that's a five-cost relic. Waystone Igniter can only kill even-costed relics. It has no mode to break a unit Aegis either, so you can't even try to set up... It plus Vikram to do something. We can make a Spiteling and... Um, Hell yeah. <laughs> there we go. I mean, this game, I think, is literally over if Phoenix wants to go for it. I mean, there's no cards in hand. So if you kill any unit, double the stats of the Spire Loyalist, attack with everything that will be exactly 17. Well, if the units had gotten blocked, but I'm a straight knew what they were up against. And it was too much as Phoenix takes it down. And I mean, you, boy, if the Xena decks are sort of playing on one level, you could certainly see um, with tools like Harsh Rule, though that didn't get played that game, but Press Gang, the Research Station, um, what exactly the Xena decks are going to be going up against. And it looks like a lot to grind through for them. Yeah, I don't think any, any deck uh, among sort of the two faction, uh, sort of attrition style decks, no one grinds better than Argent Board. There's no better package than Press Gang plus Zito, and there's a lot of other pieces that are synergistic with it. Like I said before, um, I, I thought the deck had a lot of legs prior to Valley Beyond, um, just a lot of vulnerability to Plunk uh, and Zoltan Ambassador to a, to a lesser degree. Those cards are really seriously on the decline, certainly relative to they, where they were two months ago. And I think it's giving an opportunity for this Argent Board deck to really shine. Fair enough. All right. So Phoenix takes that match down. Uh, I believe that was the last match for round number eight. So we have one round left for these players to make their mark and get into the top four. We will be back in a few minutes to review the standings and set up the pivotal last round of Swiss before we get to our top four. Stay tuned for one of the most exciting rounds we'll see all weekend. Welcome, we have another Throne Champion with us today. We are joined by Collector, 
the winner of the draft open and our newest competitor in the 2021 eternal world championship so we're gonna get to know him a little bit today throughout the course of the show we'll be bringing you some segments from the interview so first off uh thank you for joining us collector and congratulations on winning the draft open thank you it's good to be here uh where are you joining us from today uh southeast michigan oh fantastic and if you wanted to tell the eternal community a little bit about yourself, what, what do you want people to know about you? Uh, go by collector and game or you know, Brad, that's sometimes my stream. Um, I've been playing card games since like seventh edition for magic and um, you know, a lot of different ones since then and uh, just having a lot of fun playing eternal. So. Yeah, and you've been, you've been successful on the eternal tournament scene for quite a while now, I remember going back to our first year of ECQs, I remember uh, you winning you winning one in ECQ, and then I believe the literal next one, you were back at our top four. So yeah, a, a, long, a long run of success for you. Uh, but let's let's go back to your beginnings with Eternal. Do you remember the first Eternal card you ever saw? Uh, I don't remember the first card. I know like I signed up back in closed beta, then like I got in towards the end of closed beta. And I didn't play too much because um, Collection wiping is not something I'm fat off. I was like, I don't want to grind that again. Uh, but, you know, uh, I played a lot starting at open beta. Which faction do you identify with the most in Eternal and why? Um, I probably just go with fire. I like the, uh, you know, direct damage you can do from it. Um, you've seen that fire in a lot of my tournament decks, like whether it's Chonkers or Yetis or the draft event just now. What's the bad card in the game that, uh, that you just can't quit playing and trying to add into decks? Uh, me and my teammate Avion that we uh, often meme about Horu Pledge and trying to get that to work. Um, so like that 6-3 uh, guy that becomes a vulnerable when you pledged and like Bayonet and things will we'll try a do deck of it every so often and it doesn't often work. <laughs> what card in the game sort of always has your number? You know, everyone sometimes, a lot of people have this card where it's like they build their decks a lot of the same way and it's just like this card always gets them. Um... That's a little tough just because, like, you know, play a decent variety of decks. Back when it was an expedition, uh, Cast in a Shadow, they always had multiple copies of it and they always get two for ones. And it's not for fun, <laughs> for me at least. What would be your battle skill of choice in real life? I should probably just go with Endurance, never, uh, you know, get tired or wear out or whatever. So, uh, if you could have any card in the game, uh, get an alternate art, what would it be? And what would you, do you have any ideas for what you'd like to see for that? Uh, I mean, I've been pushing for a torch for a while. I'm surprised you guys haven't yet. Uh, and not really sure what I'd put on the art. Probably something fiery. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's your favorite format? What's your favorite deck of all time? Uh, favorite format right now is draft. Um, you know, Throne Lake is kind of, it's really wide open, which is fine, but just like, it's really hard to prep for a tournament when anyone can bring literally anything. Um, and, you know, draft just, you know, a lo lot of fun. Um, the tie plays in it, you know, uh, everyone's kind of on the level playing field there too, so that's always fun. My favorite uh, deck I ever played was the uh, the Shimmer Pack deck I brought to my uh, first, you know, ECQ that I'd won. Um, just it was really fun. Like, uh, I played a lot of Shimmer Pack way back in open beta when, you know, it first came out before it got nerfed to eight. And um, I just, you know, I was happy to be able to play it again. And Did you build that Shimmered Pack deck that you won that tournament with? Um, I think I took a base off of Eternal Warcry, like changed a couple of cards, watched Yoda Bite stream, and he was trying out uh, Ava, you know, that uh, primal 3-4 unit. I was like, oh, that actually works really well in this. So I put four in and, you know, uh, played that. If I remember that ECQ, right? Like everyone was on FJS at the time. And yep. because everyone's on FJS, they all cut all of their harsh rules because it was really bad against other FJS decks. So it was like perfect time to go really wide on them. See, I got there the other way. I was always really into Ava and it never occurred to me like, hey, what if I just put a, a shimmer pack in my market or if I'd put a bunch of shimmer packs in my deck and I could just evolve all the hatchlings into shimmer packs, that'd be really awesome. Yes, and Corey, we know it's never occurred to you that once you've got a couple of one-two players, you need to do anything more to potentially win the game. <laughs> you originally qualified for world championships, as you mentioned, a couple of years ago, playing that Shimmer Pack deck. That was in Constructed. So obviously yeah. you're a, a, a well-rounded player. Uh, when it comes to Eternal specifically, 
when you are playing with your teammates or you're just playing against other people, what sort of, what areas of the game, what, what sort of things do you think you do as far as like actually in the game that other people could, uh, could stand to, to get a little better at if they want to be joining you at the world championships later this year? Uh, so from what I've seen of different, like, you know, just streams and like, you know, watching other viewers and spectating and whatever else, like mulligan decisions, honestly, like mm. um, mulligan, uh, Eternals mulligan system is, you know, pretty neat compared to like magic or some other card games. Um, you know, you're guaranteed two to four power in your second hand. Um, you know, I see some people just not take that second hand enough. I see other people um, just like they'll go to six a lot and I go to six, maybe like one in every hundred games. Like it's just not worth it most of the time, um, especially because you are still limited to two to four in that uh, six card hand, right? Yes. Uh, so, you know, it, you know, uh, a lot of games are one or loss at the mulligan screen and, you know, you need to learn when to mulligan, like, you know, have, make your deck have a plan. If you're playing like a, you know, mid rangey grindy deck and your hand is all four and five drops and you know you're versing Yetis, you might want to ship that, you know, because it's not going to win. You're looking at your first hand. What are the common things that you're thinking about when you're deciding, you know, maybe your hand is okay. It's got, like you mentioned, some power and, you know, a couple of units. What are the, the sort of the tipping points typically for you when you're not, you're going to redraw? And what are the tough sort of calls? So uh, for the first hand, like, you know, there's the obvious if it has like six or seven power or one power, you know, that's probably going away. Um, but like for the more difficult ones, like uh, you'll often have hands that like are one piece short of being really good. Like you'll be one, le one power short or like, you know, like one three drop or something in your hand can really come together. Um, if you're on the draw, like you're more likely to want to keep those hands. Cause like if I have a two power hand with a bunch of threes and fours, they can draft. Um, you know, I'm, I'm probably likely to find that by, you know, the end of the third turn, if not the fourth, especially if I'm playing a bunch of two drop plunder units. Um, uh, you know, so I'll, I'll tend to keep those hands because I do have a plan and I just need one power to pull it off. Um, other hands were like, you know, it just, there's nothing really coherent does like, you know, you just have like a five drop, a combat trick, um, you know, like maybe a relic weapon or something like just, it doesn't do anything. So I have ship hands that don't do anything for a long time or you know it's a little matchup dependent right because your person control deck maybe you can keep those hands that do nothing but that might just walk into their plan so um it really just depends but. yeah i think that's a pretty good breakdown of it we we saw some of this actually in the draft open that you won where there were some hands that i got some supreme anxiety watching people keep like there was a one a one power hand where there was no pledge card and the person had to seek power and it was all three drops and it was just like, oh man, I understand why the person's keeping this because this hand's really powerful. You know, you have that plan like you're talking about of like, yeah, this hand can really come together, but you sort of have these like guidelines almost in place where you're like, okay, do I have the two drop plunder units? Are there other ways where I can find power? Like how many seek power, stuff like that are in my yeah. deck. It's not just this, hey, I look at my hand. Okay, it's that simple and done. It's like, no, there's a lot of context that's going into all these decisions. You talked about, hey, what happens if you're playing against Yetis and I have this four and five drop? It's like, well, let's not talk about the game against Yetis at turn four, turn five. When we get to turn four, turn five. Hopefully I've done something earlier in the game to get yeah. myself to turn four, turn five. But if you're talking about playing against a control deck and it's like, yeah, I've got Diana, Diana, Moonstone, Vanguard. I've got four power. I'm pretty close to playing the Diana. Yeah, maybe it's not the worst hand in the world. Like maybe that's something we can start talking about is this is maybe a path forward. I think that's a, a really good way of breaking it down, actually. Yeah, like I think my first game against Killer King, I kept a one power hand, but I had Okessa's audience and auto tread in it. So, I mean, even if I never drew more power there, like hopefully two power with auto tread could wipe through his deck of a lot of X ones. Yep. Uh, unfortunately, he had the execute, but you know.
All right, welcome back. It is time for the final round of Swiss here at the Eternal World Championships. This is the round that will be used to finalize our top four or any playoff matches that we'll need for our top four. So as a reminder, we started off this event with 16 players. Over these first nine rounds, we've been getting them. They've been playing in Throne, Expedition, and Draft. Let's take a look at the leaderboard and see where it stands, because at the end of this round, the players with the four best records will be advancing to our top four. Now, as you can see, DDD at the top of the standings at 6-2. and two. They are in great shape. There's a good chance that they will be in regardless, but there are still no guarantees for any players. After that, we have six players at a record of 5-3. and three. And then in eighth, we have Dark Revenger at 4-4 four and four with a couple of players behind that at 4-4. Four and four. Now, what we're going to see this round is it's going to be a little bit chaotic because depending upon how things work out, it could be just a clean cut. We could just have six and three players all make it. Or there is a possibility if things break the right way, we could have five and four players alive for the top four. So every match we see is, is literally guaranteed to have the highest stakes possible with a potential shot at the world championship on the line. And we're going to start and check out our world champion, Lights Out Ace, as they are on our, their quest to repeat as world champion. They're going to be up against Dark Revenger. And we're going to be checking them out right now as things are off and running here. We've got Dark Revenger on their bigger build of Rakano up against a very fast, aggressive version from Lights Out Ace. And I mean, this is the matchup I think that Dark Revenger was trying to metagame for um, coming into this tournament. Uh, a lot of really great interactions with this kind of matchup, a lot of late game power, and none of the sort of uh, underpowered, cheap uh, attacking units that we see in some of the more aggressive builds. All right, so Dark Revenger on the play this game. Nothing uh, really getting going early. They're gonna inscribe the Stormhall plating, their second one, and they're up to a four armor already. Meanwhile, Lights Out Ace got an early decision to make here. They're likely going to use Sire's Eyes and I would guess uh, get a Justice Sigil after discarding a card. But the real question is, how do they see the matchup? Where do they see this game going? And where do they want to uh, to lose some points? If Gem Blazer Cannon is a great indicator that they're very afraid of the interaction from Dark Revenger and don't want to try to put too many eggs in one basket. Yeah, I was thinking maybe there's a chance here that with those four drops in hand, you would want to try to uh, use the Gem Blazer Cannon alongside uh, a four drop to have some coverage there. But when you're playing against combination as well, it's just very likely, very unlikely that you can do very much here. And so Lights Out Ace is just getting off of that dilemma. Yeah, I think with Gem Blazer Cannon in particular, uh, that weapon, you play it, and then on it, you attack with it. It heats up, and on the next turn, it gets an additional plus three strength and overwhelm. It, you're always going to be signaling when that turn is coming. And so against a card like Orin Condemnation, very dangerous, especially because Despite being a justice-heavy build, this deck doesn't actually have much in the way of Aegis action. Now we'll see Verbrook come down as a 4-3 charge Valor. The Magna Ventress can't block it. It does pick away at some of the armor, but Dark Revenger has just been picking up armor in spades this game. We'll see another Furious Magna Ventress come down up to 6 armor. Look at Dark Revenger go. 9-11 Furious Magna Ventress coming on in. Now Lights Out Ace got to plot out how they want to go here. They have to be thinking about Defiance with that one Justice uh, power still remaining for Dark Revenger. Well, they're not going to... I would be surprised if they can shape the game to play around Defiance here because the Magna Ventress is having Endurance is already going to make things pretty problematic on the ground. That might just not be a luxury that Lights Out Ace has at this point, especially with one copy of Defiance already being played. But they do have to be very mindful about how they're sequencing here. The game is already starting to get away from them. And an additional slip up, playing around the wrong trick at the wrong time, uh, that might be just too much to overcome. All right, a very important turn here for our world champion. They are going to go with Verbrook. And they're going to try to get an attack in here to get rid of most of the remaining armor for Dark Revenger. That's going to drop Dark Revenger down to two armor. But I believe with one more Furious Magna Ventress, bumping Dark Revenger up to seven armor, or sorry, up to five armor, will be exactly enough for lethal. Oh, I think 
Dark Revenger had a lethal line there, Patrick. Now they're still in phenomenal shape, but... Yep, uh, a stun there on the, on the uh, Scale Swarm would have been exactly lethal against a player with no power-up. Unlikely to matter very much here. The, the position is just overwhelming with Inferno Phoenix still left to play the following turn. But yeah, uh, not the slip-up you want at this point. Well, there's a possibility here for a really big turn for Lights Out Ace. I think at this point, you just can't play around Defiance. And if you go for something like Styre's Eyes, ditch the Iron Priestess, Crown Watch Tactic on the Verbrook, and do some buffing, you can get in an enormous lifesteal attack that could swing the tempo of this game. Well, Lights Out Ace is going to think through all of the options here. But we're going to see Styre's Eyes. Goodbye, Iron Priestess. Oh, no, goodbye, Rune of Law. And that's going to Crown Watch Tactic onto the Verbrook. 7-6 is going to wipe out all of the armor. And now you could do something like play the Iron Priestess as a unit. Gives you another solid blocker against these Magna Ventress. And this, uh, this game is not over. All right, here we go. All of the Magna Ventri. Would we see a double block by the Styre's Eyes and the Iron Priestess? We will. Which one do you want to kill, Dark Revenger? I'm assuming you want to get rid of the Styre's Eyes, both to avoid the uh, the weapon from triggering and also to uh, uh, clear out the skies here for the Inferno Phoenix. Yeah. Now, if a Hojin comes down, it's going to be able to double one of these Magna Ventress up to a 6-8. This is going to be a lot to contend with now. now you can attack with these Verbrooks. I guess. I mean, yeah, I, it's, yeah. I was about to say. Well, yes well, and no. Um, like you would, you'd be able to attack and then find a tower to stop him from not being eaten. I guess. Magnaventurus is going to stun down the Hojin, gain three armor. It looks like Lights Out Ace is putting the brakes on here. Oh, man, what kind of possibilities does that open up if we get Helena into this mix? You could um, <laughs> you, you could uh, use Helena to get the Hojin back online and make it big enough to double the, the Magna Ventress again. Yeah, but I'm, I, if I'm in a Dark Adventure spot, if it's not lethal, I'm basically looking to diversify my uh, assets a little bit here. I think we... We'll probably see a pump on the Helena because it's just very likely that that can't be answered. You are right. So a 6 8 Helena for Dark Revenger. Now Scale Sworn Patrol, Fire Sigil, buffing up for Brook. And we are going to see Brook run into the Magna Ventress, and that's going to do it for game number one. Dark Revenger takes it down. And yeah, I mean, just Dark Revenger's big build of Rakano been looking very solid these past couple rounds. It's really hard when you're playing a deck that's trying to basically just make hay with attackers, playing against a deck that has a lot of units of similar or larger size plus combination and defiance. It's a really hard mixture of cards. To play around, a lot of your most efficient exchanges involve things like Torch and Finest Hour to, you know, two cards in one turn, push ahead. And there's so many ways for, for Dark Adventure Revenger to just fend that off trivially. All right. So for Lights Out Ace, they're going to be starting game number two off on the play. It's a great place to be with a deck like this. Um, they don't want to get ahead of themselves, but that tough game will be game number three, even if, if they can pull this one off. So first off, they got to do the dirty work here. Let's get game number two in the books. We get to get started. And a very nice looking early curve here with Styre's Eye, Scale Sworn Patrol, and Helena Sky Guide. We definitely see a lot fewer turn three Helena Sky Guides with contract in this format. On turn four, playing a Scale Sworn Patrol or a Furious Magna Ventress is such a nice play. Gives you great tempo in the game that we see players taking that uh, taking the option more often of just play a straight three four flyer. I was curious there what Dark Adventure was going to do with that first hand. It was mm. definitely not good, but going second with Defiance, I didn't know if there were you know maybe that's just a hand you're supposed to keep. Kind of all the time they definitely mulligan to something substantially worse all right here we go lights out ace they got that styre's eyes iron priestess combo will they take it this game they are so when it discarded lingering influence picking up a custom rail driver and now with another iron priestess on top i'm not feeling that one patrick what do you think 
Mm, uh, probably below the bar at this point. Like at, the, at, at this point, your turns three, four, five are kind of spoken for, and all you want to do is try to draw to your bigger plays. You've got some pressure here, and uh, if you can sort of curve out and then follow up with your fours and fives, that could be a winning recipe. All right, with no units out, we'll play a Helena. No contract this game into Dark Revenger's turn where they could play an Oni Insider, maybe pick up a Warhelm, or they could just sit back on that Orin Condemnation. Well, they can't play the Condemnation this turn because they do not have mm. the second pip. I was thinking they might want to Insider this turn and um, uh, just pick up the pick up for free, and then next turn you can Inscribe Hojin. That's your second pip. But looks like Dark Revenge is going in a different direction. Okay, so very nicely done by Lights Out Ace, recognizing the lack of double justice, knowing it was Puji just a defiance. Now with that second justice influence and no plays for Dark Revenger, it'll be very interesting to see exactly how safe Lights Out Ace wants to play it. Do they want to just develop? We're going to get Farouk down. Moon of Law is going to buff up the Helena again. Now will we see an Orin Condemnation? We will. Where is it going? It is on the Helena. Pick up five armor. And Lights Out Ace gets to wipe that out and knock him down to uh, to 18, but uh, an interesting decision there from Lights Out Ace. Again, just trying to spread. There's a lot of interaction that could happen there, and because that target can't be hit with the Defiance, you know, it, it's... I, I don't think there's a lot to be gained in the other direction. So now we might see a defensive Inferno Phoenix. 3-1 double damage with a nice Entomb. It's a, it's a solid blocker, but it could be met with this Torch here. Yeah, I mean, this is a this could be a huge turn. Torch, rule of law, potentially the weapon. Big, bursty turn. Yeah, I, are we going to see Rune of Law amplified? We are. Plus four, plus four into the Scale Swarm Patrol, plus that Empower. This is going to be a 16-point attack. Dark Revenger is now down to two with an Oni Insider and a Hojin in hand and a Finest Hour not seeing necessarily but anytime defiance is in the mix you got to be a little bit careful fortunately for lights out ace with two units bigger than hojin it feels pretty safe to attack in here yep and i i think i'm not sure if it necessarily would have made a difference but that giving up on that insider play on turn three the snowballing advantages that lights out ace was able to leverage now the insider would have maybe been able to hold off the patrol for a turn or two it wouldn't have shifted the game that dramatically, but they died with the Insider in hand, and they got hit by the patrol a few times. So um, I, I think that there was definitely some punishment there for the decision to hold the Insider back. Yeah, and one thing that did happen in that game was early on the Styr's Eyes pitched the Priestess, picked up that weapon. So there was that knowledge um, that for Dark Revenger that there was an attachment potentially coming this game. And sometimes in a moment like that, you can get maybe a little tunnel vision on like, well, I, I, want, I know I'm not going to be getting the Warhelm. At some point, I want to get the value of killing that weapon. And then you, they kind of got buried that game before they could turn it around. Yeah, sometimes when you're playing a deck like that, the, the priority is just spend your power. You don't always have the luxury of spending it on the most efficient thing or the ideal circumstances when you're playing against <laughs> a deck this aggressive. But what, what you can lean on is your cards are more powerful. And if you give yourself some time, you can make up for maybe some inefficient exchanges earlier on. All right, next up here, Lights Out Ace, getting things rocking and rolling on turn one with a Battlefront Dasher and the Defiance for the Blowouts. Lights Out Ace's first two turns of the game are going to be wiped out or really no gain. And now Dark Revenger getting things moving. They got a Styr's Eyes, a Scale Swarm Patrol, and an Inferno Phoenix. A very smooth looking curve in the works here for Dark Revenger. But they play a banner on turn number two, wanting to make sure they have undepleted power on future turns. Well, I also think their their hand was just filled with too much good stuff. There wasn't an easy discard there. If you discard one of the banners, then you don't have double fire for the Inferno Phoenix, and all your other cards are useful too. So again, you can defer the decision for a card that's not very uh, effective. Also, the game could go a certain way where it turns out that, uh, you know, Saddle Up is actually the mode that you want, depending on how things go. So not the most intuitive play there from Dark uh, Revenger, but I like the patience there of not just doing it for the sake of doing it, but rather saying, I can use this to, to hedge against drawing a bad card somewhere down the line. The game could go in a different direction. And, and frankly, right now, my hand's good, and I'm not in, in a rush to do anything about it. 
All right, so now we're going to see Carnivorous Healing be buffed up by the Scale Sworn Patrol. Torch is going to get certainly kind of pseudo-negated by that Finest Hour. Now the Carnivorous Healing comes across. Will we see a block here? We are not. The Carnivorous Healing is swinging the health total race back for, for Lights Out Ace. Steyer's Eyes is going to ditch one of the Inferno Phoenixes to pick up a Justice Sigil. They get the Scout. You know, there's power on top of the deck, which is kind of intriguing with Scale Sworn Patrol. It's possible, one, with Dark Revenger playing with expensive cards, and two, a lot of their cheap cards are actually worse right now than a power, given that they have uh, Scale Sworn Elite. Uh, it might actually be worth keeping. It's close. It's, yeah. a, it's that's not that's not an easy call there. Yeah, it is very dangerous to never draw the unit that we've been buffing up with these uh these scale sworn procs though. So they do put it to the bottom. Helena is now buffed up again by the scale sworn patrol, and we just see these units growing larger and larger. Next up for lights out ace is a battlefront asher, buffeted by that scale sworn patrol. Could be a big turn in the future. These players are going to be just hammering each other right now. It's a very tricky moment for both of them as cards like Finest Hour, Torch, are in condemnation. They got to be on their mind for every single play. And you can tell, you know, Dark Revenger is basically putting a premium on apply pressure. Do not allow yourself to get uh, knocked back by some bursty turn on the way back. These hits for eight, you know, we can, we can tolerate that. That's not the end of the world. But you got to make sure that you're not liable to getting just uh, killed out of nowhere on the way back. Yeah, I mean, Dark Revenger is down to 12. The lifesteal on the Carnivorous Yearling has been enormous. And I do I do wonder about that decision a few turns ago to not trade the Helena on Dark Revenger's side with it. That Yearling has been doing an enormous amount of work. I, I, so all that well said, well taken. The other side of it is... The Helena is simultaneously a lot of pressure and a lot of insurance about getting uh, hit with something massive on the crackback. A lot of these bursty synergistic turns that you see from the aggressive builds of Rukano involve Helena sending something up into the air. And if you have an endurance flyer, you have offense and defense at the same time. It might be worth giving up a lot of equity to maintain that, but it's not obvious because there's some real costs. And as you mentioned, 24 to 12, Dark Revenge are taking a lot of hits and Lights Out Ace has given themselves a lot of cushion with all the health that they've picked up to be able to play a longer game and maybe top deck into some of their impactful cards to close this one out. Yeah, these Battlefront Dashers, they're, it's, it's going to be tough to get a ton of value out of them. Right now, Lights Out Ace has to be weighing, uh, discarding one of them to uh, that Styre's Eyes, either to Empower, Proc Scale Sworn Patrol again, Crown Watch Tactics, buff up one of these units, and then where do those buffs go? This is a very combat tricky spot right now for the reigning world champion. And the defensive Inferno Phoenix here is huge because one, it's an incredible coverage against some sort of uh, flurry here. You have effectively an ace strength attacker back to block. Additionally, it implies that Dark Revenger could pivot and go on the offense and potentially kill you very quickly. So there's a squeeze here where you do need to attack if you're in lights out ace's spot. That's really all your cards permit you to do but you need to attack in such a way where you're actually shrinking the length of the game. Because if you just allow the Phoenix to block profitably, don't do anything about the Helena, you're losing on the table, and it's heavily implied that you're going to be losing the long game as well. All right. So we see Battlefront Dasher come down. It buffed up the Carnivorous Yearling, but no attacks. The Helena attacks back on the other side. And now Justice Sketch for Dark Revenger making that research station this is going to be very threatening to Light Set Ace because once that research station procs once on that Helena and gets it up to just enormous like 12, 14 stats, that is the kind of card that Light Set Ace might never be able to get through again. Yeah, and I, I think it's easy to sort of fixate on the Inferno Phoenix plus uh, station combo here. I don't really think that's what's going on here. What can happen is the Helena is still a lot of pressure. It implies lethal very quickly. But having the Inferno Phoenix back on defense just says the ball's in your court. There's a burden on you to do something. And if it's not dramatic, if you just let me have one really profitable block, again, the short term is looking very bad for you. And long term, it's implied that I'm just going to be drawing just huge cards that you're not going to be able to deal with. So 
some scary moments here for the world champion. Lights out ace. They're gonna play Styre's Eyes after playing a power and they are moving in now. We might see a crown watch tactic here. We do onto the Helena. Both the Carnivorous Yearling and the Helena are coming in. This is a humongous 14 point lifesteal attack, but we are gonna see these units trade off with the non-Helena units. Dark Revenger has their plan. They are going to attempt to ride this Helena, the 6-7, double up its stats, and now a Pisto on the other side. How does that change things? 7-7. Seven, seven. So it looks like we're not going to see the double yet from Dark Revenger. Instead, maybe getting down Pisto. Once your opponent goes up to 33 in this spot, yeah. there's not a ton to be gained by just going like, okay, well, double up, now you're at... 19 or whatever a lot of this is just the long term favors you dramatically just make sure that nothing punks you out take your time you can finish off the game whenever you want to with that station over the course of two turns the only way you can really lose from here is getting needlessly aggressive not having a key blocker back and so dark adventure you know maybe it looks you know quote unquote conservative but i think this is really wise well this game's going very fast Dark Revenger just stunned the last flying unit for Lights Out Ace. They top deck an Iron Priestess. Next turn, that Helena in hand for Dark Revenger threatens to send that 7-7 seven, seven, double damaging Sentinel into the skies with plus three, plus four. And Iron Priestess is making a cheeky attack here. Dark Revenger's got to consider is something weird going on. They just take an attack where they bounce off. Another Iron Priestess. The skies are clear for Dark Revenger. Plus three, plus four. Onto the Pisto, and this is a huge attack. 6, 12, 14, 34 points come across. Lights out Ace has been defeated, and that might put an end to their campaign. We'll see what the standings look like after this round, but a fantastic win from Dark Revenger as we're going to quickly try to jump into another match as soon as it's ready. And really rewarded for the metagame call here. Uh, you know, we, we watched him uh, really just chew up and spit out these Rakano aggro decks are in the expedition round. You get your, uh, what we assume to be a win and in for the top four. You play against your ideal matchup. The, you know, game number two, I don't know if the own sire makes a difference at the end of the day. Winning on the draw is going to be hard, even with a, a good matchup. But the games where uh, Dark Revenger was on the play looked very solidly favorable. And um, I believe in a moment we'll be having them advance to the top four. All right, we'll see. We'll see where, where everything stands. All right, let's check out our next match. We have Collector still on their undefeated run, trying to claw their way into the top four up against Iron Man. Zito's going to make Iron Man discard one of the many power they still have left in hand. A beautiful top deck of a Furious Magnaventurist locking down the Waste Soda Igniter. Styre's Eyes is bringing Collector down to 23. But we got plenty of game left here. There's a Dinosaur Nest in the works, spinning out Avasaur Hatchling. Collector makes the training camp. Now we have Ronaya, Wings of the Cabal, making her first appearance this weekend. This 5 3 flying ambush. Contract. Kill enemy units. Copies from the deck. Zito goes back into the deck, and now Ronaya is waiting in the wings, ready to ambush. There is an attack in the air. Collector's got to be careful here. There is a... Uh, those Archimport blueprints are ready to, uh, to pop. Draw some units from the void. They do have a dismantle that could take care of it. Let's see if we see that here. And some pretty serious signal there from last turn. The Shadow Sketch not getting uh, uh, used at all in a spot where it looks pretty good. Mm. The Angelo Might is the draw for Iron Man. And the only question is, are we doing this before or after attacking? And we're going to do it after, is we're going to buff up the Magnaventurist thanks to the armor. But this shadow spell draws cards equal to the greatest strength among your units. Scorpion Wasp takes that out, but now Renaya is still there to draw five cards. Justice Sketch. The, another D'Angelo Might. A Jada Peacekeeper. A Justice Sigil. And another Renaya Wings of the Cabal. Collector's going to get to flip over this Dinosaur Nest, but... I don't know if the nest is going to be enough. A killer is a great way to start. You can take out the Renaya. There is just so much to do, contend with on the in the enemy hand now. Yep. 
Killer Dinosaur takes out Renaya. You see the training camp make a 2-1. The Heat's faithful sacrifice to make us a 4-4. A lifesteal cultist. So if you're Iron Man, uh, let's think this through carefully here. Oh, they're ready to go. Let's go. Jada's down. Well, that was it. That one right there was a huge draw uh, in terms of being able to play a second unit. Although it looks like they're deciding to go the other direction. Yeah, here. they're going to play Renaya this turn. So Zito comes back with Destiny. It's going to discard the Scale Sworn Patrol from hand. So we see how Iron Man is envisioning the next few turns. And now this is going to be Renaya coming down to help probably trade with something. We will see. So when Jada blocks, it loses all it loses four strength, but you get to play a Justice Sigil deck from your deck depleted. So we are gonna need to see a chump here from the uh the Steyr's eyes. And is Renaya even going to block? No, she's not. Okay. So three points come across. Collector's probably gonna utilize that training camp. We still got a game. Oh, this is very close. This is real close. The second D'Angelo might is going to be very necessary here, it looks like, for Iron Man. Collector showing lethal. Um, I guess potentially we could go Argentport Blueprints and crack it, but that'll be for a future turn. Argentport Noble. A Magna Ventress. All right. Those are the options. I imagine we'll see Magna Ventress either deal with the Faithful or knock out the Avasaur. Yeah, we will. Seems like we're probably sitting back here for another moment. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, there's an argument for maybe taking out something bigger, but I think all other things being equal, just shore up the air right now. Uh, if you keep drawing cards, you're probably going to find answers for the uh, units on the ground, but the easiest way to get punked out from the spot is uh, the air is uncontested for a turn or two. All right, so Iron Man right now at a virtual eight, five health and three armor. Picking up a Helena Sky Guide that could partner very nicely with that Argentport Noble in hand in a future turn. Uh, right now, Iron Man is very, very much concerned with getting themselves in the safest possible position with a Justice Sketch and Argentport Blueprints in hand. They're, they have to be feeling pretty good about their chances of winning a game that lasts more than a couple of turns here. Well, another thing to keep in mind here, another incentive that Iron Man might have is to try to get in some chip shots with Rune of Illusion in hand. Keep that in mind oh, here. True. You know, my shadow, my shadow mid chops showing up again. Remember, you can amplify multiple times. Iron Man is getting to a spot where they can already amplify that thing twice, and it's not inconceivable they can get to three. So if you're able to kind of get in points here and there, as you're seeing right now, uh, that could potentially set up a turn where you simply amplify that on your two biggest units, and you can get the last few points across. Great point. A Rat King is picked up from Collector. But that double amplified Rune of Illusion, you are absolutely right. It really threatens to end this game next turn. With Collector at 9, maybe if they can get in a, somehow find a way to get an attack in with the Nahid's Faithful, that could be the difference in keeping them alive one more turn. And we're going to see that be the play here. Start off attacking with a 4-4 lifesteal. I mean, I think that I just, I'm just putting Jada in front here. How bad can it go? Jada is going to block, play another Justice Sigil from the deck. Collector gets to gain four, and now they could use one of these rats plus the Rat King to finish off Jada. So. That's lethal. See. Yeah. Rune of Illusion. Twice, on. and then Helena, whatever. Yeah, Nine Adventurous and the 5 3. All right, so. Oh, yeah. Our, uh, our shadow expert here, Patrick Sullivan, <laughs> sees the line. Let's make those two units unblockable. Will Helena, the Argentport Noble, or one of the unblockable units? Yeah, just to buff it up enough. And now nothing can be blocked from Collector. And Collector, their Cinderella run may have just come to an end right there. 0-3, 5-0 in Constructed, but dropping that last one, it might be just one short for them this weekend. But... uh. Fantastic run nonetheless. It's a very impressive to come back from that kind of a start. And for Iron Man, we'll have to see where things shake out in the standings. Where are we at with matches, Tom? All right, we're going to be heading down to Boxer and I am straight in game three in just a moment here. All right, so the Boxer on Rakano up against Xenon. Scorpion Wasp coming down. Going to trade with that recruit. 
Carnivorous Yearling gets down, and now we've got more helm picked up from Pony and Cider. We are shy on power right now for I Am Straight, but with Huntmaster Vikram and Scythe in hand, big plays could be on the horizon. So Zito is going to start the turn, and we're not going to see anything in the way of a contract here holding up that victimless crime instead can kill either unit carnivorous yearling coming on in victimless crime is going to take it out now the boxer will play another carnivorous yearling are we going to draw another one we are so we see the flexibility of that car coming into play right now Sinister Rumor is going to draw a unit from the Void, drawing that Nahid's Faithful. Ooh. It's going to make a 6-6 six, six lifesteal, but with two torches in hand, the Boxer can get that out of the way. And potentially play a 3-drop like the Yearling or the Gemblazer Cannon. This is a huge turn here for the Boxer. What's it going to be? It is not going to be... Gem Blazer Cannon. I think we're going to see Yearling and then play another Yearling. Yeah, I love this line here because once you're playing your two copies of Torch, you have a lot of exposure to Vikram on the way back. And so you don't want to just put your weapons out there before it's lethal. Force Vikram to take something modest, play a bunch of weapons to get over the top of it, and instead of just making one large unit, spread it out. So the Boxer here really heads up play in terms of uh, playing around Vikram ahead of time. Yeah, for I'm a straight, I mean, maybe a play here of, like, play Scythe and play the, uh, get a killer dinosaur. I mean, there's, there's there's not a lot of great options here because one thing that I'm a straight knows about is they know that Oni Insider picked up a Warhelm and they know it hasn't been played yet, and they know there's a Carnivory Serialing in hand, so they know we could be seeing that Carnivory. Oh, and with Finest Hour, I think that is going to be what the Boxer needs to get this over. Pump up that Yearling, put a War Helm on it, attack with everything. I don't think I'm a Straight survives either way with this play. No, there's it's oh, ten. Yeah. It's ten at the floor. I think we may have. Yeah, yeah. okay. So well, th there's a, there's hour, no there's no. It's all coming across. The boxer takes down I'm a Straight, wins this very important match. We'll see how they sh things shake out for our standings. Great matches. Great matches. That was the last match, so we'll see if our standings have been updated yet. We'll check them out as soon as we can. And uh yeah, that was a that was an exciting round for our final one, and we'll see who's gonna be face we'll be seeing in the top four in just a moment. We as we know going into this round, we had no players locked for a top eight slot. DDD was in the best position at six and two. Even with a loss, we'd imagine their breakers will hold up, and we're gonna check it out. As a note, these are preliminary. But it looks like we have a very clean cut top four here for you folks. So no playoff rounds today, assuming all of the rounds are in. We'll be confirming that in just a moment. DDD, Iron Man, the Boxer, and the Overmaster. Again, these appear to be your top four at the World Championship. So we will be seeing these players in best of five action with their expedition decks in the top four. I mean, we've seen a lot of fantastic play from these players this weekend. We got to see a bunch of these players win. They're winning in this round. And uh, it looks like DDD hung on and is still in first seed despite losing, dropping those last few. And again, congratulations to all of our competitors. This is preliminary standings, we, so not official yet. But assuming this holds, we have our top four, a clean cut, which is nice. And um, everyone acquitted themselves really well. Um, there was, like I said, everyone was kind of in a jumble for most of the tournament. No one ever pulled away. No one was, you know, worse than two and four coming into day number two. And I really think it speaks to the quality of the competition here, uh, how tightly matched these players uh, were and are. By the end of it, it looks like we have four players who were able to finish at six and three. That's the best record of this tournament. And assuming that this holds, we will have our top four in a little bit. How far did the five and fours go down? Can we just scroll down and check that? Oh, it went all the way down to 10th. Wow. And then yeah. a lot of players at that at four on five. So, I mean, really what you see this weekend is this field, I mean, from from a first all the way down to 14th, the players were separated by just two matches over a nine-game slate, and it really just goes to show how close the competition was all weekend. Every game really mattered, and for these players, uh, a fantastic showing all around. 
but four it looks like will remain we're going to take a break here lock in our final standings uh it'll be just a little bit of a longer break here as we prepare the the tournament for the final four ddd iron man the boxer and the overmaster um very excited to see who comes out when we come back we will review the deck list get into it and we'll be showing you each of those matches so we've got three best of th five matches left in this event uh to crown a world champion and we know we're gonna have a new one uh lights out ace just one game short ultimately gonna looks like they're gonna be finishing fifth in this world championships nonetheless a great uh defense of their title but it looks like we're gonna have a new world champion yep no um uh great matches on camera lights out ace i thought played phenomenally it's a tough field five and four is nothing to hang your head at but we will be crowning a new world champion here later this afternoon all right so stay tuned uh we'll have some uh potential fun announcements uh, a little later on in the show during our final four uh, so we'll be back after this break. Stay tuned. We've got just three matches left in the World Championships. And we'll find out who will be the next World Champion in just a few matches. Stay tuned. Hello, Eternal fans. I am Patrick Sullivan, joined with Alex, a.k.a. I'm Straight a winner of a Tuesday night uh, Eternal Community Tournament back in June, and one of our world's participants in our upcoming World Championship. Alex, how are you doing? Hello, Patrick. Hello, everybody. I'm doing good. So normally we do these interviews kind of right after the fact. Um, we cover one of our opens, a player wins, or a player notches their second top four. We do the interview, and it's ready to go. This one, we're gonna have to travel back in time a little bit because uh, if uh, I'm correct in June was when you cemented your slot? Yeah, it's it's been a little while, yes. Um, I think it was back in June. Okay, cool. So we'll, we'll try to pull out that memory as best we can, but if it's a little foggy, it's okay because I know it's it's been a bit. So before we dive into all that, uh, how long have you been playing Eternal 4 and how did you get your, your start in the game? Yeah, um, I've been playing since the open beta, so I don't I don't have one of those uh, fancy swords. Uh, I, I have just the the simple diamond sword. Um, and uh, initially, I saw it for the first time on uh, LSV's stream. I was there to see some cube drafting, which is something I enjoy doing. And uh, and I got I got to see kind of uh, the game. I got to start playing it. Um, I really enjoyed it. It had a lot of really cool elements that I really like in card games, and and I decided to keep playing it. So you go all the way back to open beta. So we're talking like 2016 or thereabouts? Yes. So when you saw the game, did you have any aspirations for trying to pursue competitive play or did it just seem kind of like a fun thing to do? Yeah, not at all. It was uh, it was a fun thing to do. And if I can sort of dab into my past a little bit, um, I used to play Magic very competitively um, and I played it for a very long time since it was a pretty young. And uh, I got pretty burned out from uh, from the competitive cycle of it. Um, it, almost like I wasn't drawing a lot of uh, satisfaction from it. And I really wanted to focus more on, on the fun aspects of it uh, this time around. And it wasn't until, I mean, the beginning of the season where I was kind of approached by our team's recruiter and asked if I wanted to join and play more competitively than I, that, that I started saying like, yeah, I should, I, I should get into a little bit more competitive um, uh, elements of, of the game. So when did you start sort of pivoting towards that competitive play? It was right before the beginning of this uh, uh, competitive season. Okay. Um, and was there something in particular that drew you to um, the Tuesday Night Eternal tournaments? Were you also grinding the opens as well? Um, what, you know, what drew you to one tournament versus the other, if you had a preference? Yeah, I, I didn't. Initially, I wasn't playing the opens um, as much. I I had played some of them, but what I liked about um, Tuesday Night Eternal was was a little bit more of the community element of, to it. It was much more conversational. Um, like you you didn't just get randomly paired against some person. You had your pairings. You got to kind of introduce yourselves, have a have a chat with them, and and kind of get into the into the game and. Um, it made it easier to collaborate with folks. Uh, and I enjoyed that a lot. So you're, you know, we, we get a bunch of different stories. 
when we talk to players and one of the first things I like to ask is how long have you been playing for? Because that gets a sense of the range. And we've, we've had all from your kind of story there from essentially the beginning, all the way to, or, to someone who just started playing four months ago and qualified for the world championships. So when you started playing the game, what were the, you know, individual cards, mechanics, just whatever that, that really spoke to you or, or were sort of things you enjoyed playing or exploring? Yeah, I would say because I had so much history in other card games, I think I started approaching Eternal like they were the, those card games. And I think it didn't, it, not until I, I sort of analyzed the differences and the, the nuances of the particular game that, that I was able to um, get more out of it. Um, it. The fact that the cards remember sort of the stats that they gain or the abilities that they gain, even though they're going in and out of different parts of the field. So in, in, in play or in, in the void or in your deck, it added a lot more interesting elements to the game and, and design that I had not thought of before. Um, it sort of opened up a lot more, a lot, a lot more uh, design ideas. Were there any, uh, uh, so you're just talking to, to some of sort of the engine level stuff, like keywords are pers persistent through zones and, and things of that nature. Were there any sort of like tactical elements of the game that were different or you had to unlearn certain habits or was it just sort of uh, more on the, the engine level stuff? Yeah. Um... The way that the um, the openings that um, that you have to respond to things uh, made it very different uh, than other games I was used to. So, it, like it, and I don't want to keep referencing Magic, uh, but there was a tendency to hold all your resources, hold all your available cards until the last possible moment that you could play it. But that really uh, started biting me on the behind uh, at Eternal, and I and I had to really change change those ways that I had built over a long period of time because the openings to respond to things or the interacting were very different. Um, uh, yeah, that's a really cool thing to point out, I think, because, you know, uh, I mean, I was working on the game back at the time that you're talking about and sort of a, a vision for things was we don't want the reactive player to always just be getting the better end of it, to sit there with all your resources and wait until your opponent plays into whatever your response is that there is some risk uh, to holding and there's an argument for, you know, I should play my torch right now on their back, you know, referencing yes. fast torch. I should play my torch now because if they have a certain unit weapon, then it doesn't respond that way. And still get the experience of like, yeah, it is good to hold sometimes and wait, but not just make that the default decision, but actually something that you have to think about the cards you have and the cards that they could have and sometimes play your stuff you know, preemptively rather than reactively. So that's, it's cool that you pointed that out because that was like a, a major engine level goal um, back when we were in beta. And it, it's good that it was able to sort of manifest for a player like you who had experience playing other games. Yeah, and even, even evaluation of cards like equipment, the fact that you cannot respond to it being played on the unit makes equipments or the, um, yeah, unit uh, attachments um, much, much, uh, better in this game versus other games because you don't you you don't have the ability to get a two for one um, kind of card advantage from from responding to it. Yeah, I mean it manifests sometimes. I mean you know sometimes your your unit with a weapon on it gets annihilated and right. they have the two. But again, it's just yeah. like don't make that the only experience. Have mm -hmm. this like wide range of possibilities. So that's very cool. So pivoting back to the the uh, Tuesday Night Eternal tournament and sort of that scene. Um, Sounds like playing competitively, but being drawn into sort of the, if not community, then more of an interpersonal sort of experience is important to you. Um, am I reading that correctly? Yes, definitely. So how do you sort of tap into that experience in Eternal, which is, you know, for a lot of card games, what you're talking about happens because you're playing in person. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, that's a different challenge or a different experience playing digitally. So how do you get that kind of, that simulation or experience that sounds like it's really important to you? The, the team aspect um, helped a whole lot. Um, so I think, I think a lot of, uh, a lot of what I did blossomed after I joined um, our team. 
I'll just plug in our team here, WSG. And uh, I think you mentioned JNL, who had just had just started and qualified, and he 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 stops by regularly, and he kind of got some not assistance from us, but it was a part of that collaboration and sort of exchange of ideas. Um, but definitely the team really helps both because they're awesome human beings and we can jump on to a discord um, voice chat and and exchange you know pleasantries and the fact that we were all kind of stuck indoors with the pandemic it really helped to have kind of these these friends out there that you could you could collaborate with you can chit chat with um, it made a big difference um, so as far as like that sort of, you know, you're talking about the team sort of testing and interacting, how much of it is like we're preparing for a certain event where our heads are down on the specific format versus this sort of like ambient effort to accrue knowledge and skill and be ahead of the metagame and, you know, sort of, I, I guess the difference between generalized preparation versus really focused and specific preparation. Yeah, and I'm sure different teams do it different ways. Um, and I'm sure different people do it different ways, but it kind of goes back to the idea of like having fun first, uh, playing competitively second. Um, we're not doing statistical analyses. We're not, uh, we're, we're not gonna sit and grind, like test particular matchups over a long period of time uh, and do like 50 games, a hundred games. Uh, it, it's not that it's too much work, but it starts removing the fun element from it. Um, and I think it's more about exchanging novel uh, ideas, like analyzing general strategies that exist, finding what their, um, their core is, and maybe how to approach attacking those strategies in a different manner. Um, it, at least what I get in, from our team is it's more about the ideas, exchanging ideas and analyzing those rather than grinding, um, grinding on particular yeah yeah that makes a lot of sense too because i think you like you do hit a diminishing returns on the hundredth game or the whatever like at a certain point what are the odds that you're going to change your power base or change a market target is pretty mm -hmm. unlikely relative to the time spent and sort of talking about stuff in more of a broad strokes conceptual space like then someone can pick up the ball build a deck and play 10 games and I say there's something here or there's not yeah. but I think that sort of repetitive testing is and I, I think you said it well too like it speaks to burnout as well like at a certain point the game can be kind of numb and repetitive if it's just the same 75 or 80 cards banging against each other so I, I, I like that you found a process that sounds like it's good for getting the information and and the the results while not being this like numbing uh you know uh, low yield grind. That's really good. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm really happy with, with where we're at and I'm really happy with, uh, the folks that I met on our team and it's, I just enjoy hanging out with them. So how big is the team right now? Oof. I'm not prepared. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to say that we're about 12 people maybe. Okay, cool. And do you know offhand how many of y'all are qualified for worlds? I think it's just myself. Okay. Uh, there's a few folks that hang out um, in our Discord often. Um, Theo, the Overmaster, being one of them, uh, he's also qualified. But I think it's just myself for now. Are you feeling any sort of like special pressure to represent? I mean, you've spoken about your team being a huge, you know, both competitive and personal asset. Is there this feeling of you're not playing just for yourself, but for the whole squad? Uh, not, not yet. Hopefully. Not, I'll say no because then it's going to be, I feel like it's going to feel too much pressure. Um, <laughs> but they, uh, they certainly would not let me forget it uh, for a while. But they, they would just uh, casually um, fit in uh, world's 2021 qualified competitor. I'm straight in every single interaction that we had for a period of time. That kind of died down a little bit, thankfully. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I don't want to. I want to have fun with it. That's what I kind of keep keep saying. I don't want to. It, we are sometimes our own worst enemy uh, in these games. Um, it's like the people holding us back are, our, are ourselves. Uh, so I don't want to. I want to try not to fall into that. 
that's I, I think a really good idea. And as a you know former competitive player myself, it's like it took me a long time to be able to step back and ask, what am I trying to get out of this day or this week? Am I just sort of a a, a hamster on a treadmill, or am I actually exercising agency here? Is this the thing that I want to do? Yeah. Um, and I think I could have been much happier with it had I gotten to that sort of introspection at an earlier age but uh you know when you're just like this is the whole thing this is what i'm trying to get good at it can be easy to to lose sight of like what you're actually trying to get out of it so good to have some perspective about it it's not an easy thing it, it isn't and you're absolutely right in what you're saying i i i feel like i know exactly i know exactly what you mean yeah yeah so uh going back to the the tournament that led to your qualification were you specifically looking at this as like, this is a really good route to try to get to the world championships or was that sort of secondary to, it's a cool competitive scene. I enjoy these people. I enjoy the games. If I happen to do well, great, but that's not the primary focus here. I mean, I would say I'm still a competitive person. So if I'm joining a tournament, I still want to win. Um, and I'm still going to try my best to, to get there. I don't think that I analyzed it from a perspective that said, this is the highest chance I have to qualify for Worlds uh, as much as it was, I want to join the tournament. I want to play competitively for this game. Um, and I want to, of course, I joined it. I'm gonna, I'm, I want to win it. Um, uh, but I, yeah, I'm kind of trailing off here, but I, I don't think there was, it wasn't a cognizant, like, this is the, the easiest avenue for me to get there. It was more, I want to play this competitive tournament. I want to win this tournament. And I won the, the first part, which got me qualified for the Invitational series of the t and &E. Then I won the Invitational, which then qualified me for Worlds. Do you feel like, maybe I'm reading this wrong, but the sense of the affirmation from sort of the, your peers, the people that you respect, is that's sort of more of a sign of legitimacy to you or the thing to care about rather than what you get through the like dire wolf specific organized play channels. Like it's more of a competitive community rather than we over here have declared that you're the best in some form or fashion. Yeah, I, I, I think so. Um, it's yeah. Let me think about that for a second. It's a tricky question. <laughs> it is a tricky question. Because I can answer your question sort of in this interview, but it doesn't necessarily mean that in reality that that's how you, you, you kind of, you draw the, I think the reason for me to say, let's say, keep playing opens, even though I've been qualified for, for, for Worlds is, is in a way to sort of legitimize, legitimize that I am a good player also. Like it's not so much that, hey, I, I got qualified for Worlds and therefore I don't need to do any more work um, because then you get a sense that, oh, everybody feels like I just got lucky or something along those lines. And uh, so it, there is definitely an element where you want to be known in the community as sort of like competitive, not necessarily by, by, by meeting the, the challenges uh, placed on you by the company that makes the game, but rather it's more about the people who are playing it. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally feel that. I mean, it, it, you know, you can look at organized play for other games and there are the people that are highlighted by the company or the organized play system that uh, promotes them. And then there are the players that the other skilled players go, that's one of the best players. Often there's overlap between the two of those things, but not necessarily. And when I was playing, I always felt like, well, whether or not I happen to get a spotlight on me is has a lot to do with factors that are outside of my control. But if the players that respect that I respect respect me as well, then that really counts. That's more affirmation than I could ever get from um, some executive or some organized play lead saying, let's do a feature on this person or whatever. Yeah, that's definitely true.
Hello, and thank you for joining us for our ongoing series of interviews with our open winners. I'm Patrick Sullivan, and I have the pleasure of being joined by our most recent open champion, JNL. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty well. It's bright and early this morning. I really appreciate your uh, your flexibility in working out the time here. I know that there's uh, quite a bit of gap here from where I'm interviewing you in Colorado, and you are located out of Hawaii, is that correct? Yeah, I'm in Maui, Hawaii, so the time zone's always pretty bad for me, no matter who I'm talking to. <laughs> so something that I, I think is really cool about Eternal is, you know, interviewing these these players and, and watching the events and uh, talking to people online. It's just how global of a game it is. Um, and, you know, that's a function of being online, obviously. Um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, um, you know, sort of your your gaming experience in Hawaii and how you got started with Eternal? Um, so I actually started off playing card games in 2014, and that was Hearthstone. And I played that up until now. Um, but my laptop broke like two months ago, and I was like, oh man, I only have a Switch to play video games now, because I don't like playing on a small screen. So I didn't want to play on my phone. And I looked up on Switch, oh, what are card games on there? Oh, Eternal's on here. I'll play that. And I ended up taking a liking to the game. Uh, my other background in gaming, I've been playing League of Legends since 2011. And I'm a coach there. I have a contract with the university to coach the League of Legends team. And I started playing Magic, Gath Magic the Gathering in late 2017. Yeah, and I dabble in a few other genres on Steam and stuff, but nothing to pertinent to eternal i guess so do you go back to um you know open beta times in 2016 or did you hop on to eternal a little bit later on oh i hopped on to eternal like two months ago oh <laughs> wow yeah uh, can you tell me kind of what was the first thing about eternal or first card or whatever the experience was that really grabbed you and, and made you think like, Oh, this is a game that I could see, you know, playing a lot of and trying to get good at. Oh, Oni Samurai. Um, I saw the war crime mechanic for the first time in the card Oni Samurai. And I thought to myself, wow, uh, this game makes use of the digital aspect of the card game better than Hearthstone rather than using the digital aspect to put in a bunch of, RNG effects, they use it to affect cards in ways that you wouldn't be able to in paper. So was that uh, a key part of the first deck that you built, or did you start somewhere else? I haven't built too many original decks. Um, the only original deck that I feel like I've really built is a Grenadine Blitz deck based off of Is It Blitz and Popper uh, from a while back. And it uses gem blazer cannon and a bunch of berserk mechanics on Grenadin to like smork people down with big attacks. Yeah. Do you, are you an aggressive? Do you like kind of gravitate towards aggressive strategies in other games? Like, how do you? Um, I guess like, what's your preferred League of Legends style? Like, what's your uh, what what role do you like? Do you do you gravitate towards aggressive more things with a more aggressive bend there as well? Oh man, it's so weird because in card games, I like. I really like hitting face in Magic the Gathering. I played a lot of blue and red. Uh, mono red, whenever it's around in standard, I try to play that. But in League of Legends, I try to take a nice, more methodical approach, since it's not just me playing the game, I guess. I have the same experience where in, in constructed formats, I gravitate towards really aggressive strategies, but in draft, I like to play a little bit more defense. So I know the uh, the different formats or different platforms can kind of lead you in different directions, which I think is really cool. Yeah, uh, I guess what I really like is consistency. So I just tried to play the most consistent deck. In Hearthstone, the decks are a lot smaller. So consistent decks are usually the ones that draw through really quickly. Yeah. Uh, so what you sort of, if I'm, you know, if I can extrapolate a little bit here, sort of, you, you know, you're relatively new to Eternal. Um, you sort of hopped into competitive play pretty quickly. You've obviously done very well for yourself. Um, 
But if you know, even if you're familiar with other games, it's really hard to start from ground zero. So, like, what were the resources that you uh, tapped into to sort of get yourself caught up to speed on what the good decks were or what the strategies were like? Did you have friends? Did you use online resources? Like, how did you get ramped up so quickly? Um, I guess the community is really great. Uh, I went to a 261 stream, and he helped me out a lot. And eventually from there, I met some people who were actually on an Eternal team, uh, we stream games. And I went into that server and there were a bunch of people in there from a bunch of different other teams that I ended up talking to and getting resources from. So would you would you describe that as sort of a, a testing outfit or more of just like kind of an information resource? More of an information resource. Uh, most of my preparation I did solo. Wow. You were just you were just playing games on the ladder or whatever, basically. Wow. Well, I'm, I'm sort of. I mean, I, you know, uh, there's some names that I'm a little bit more familiar with than others, uh, but your story is really, really powerful. I mean, to kind of come out of, you know, I obviously familiar with a lot of other games and uh, fluency there, but to to start off something in a couple of months to go to an open champion is uh, that that is quite something. Speak to me about how you kind of got introduced to the Tuesday Night Eternal, the summer invitation scene. Um, you know, we obviously are running our opens, but we know that uh, other people, members of the community are organizing tournaments uh, and getting people a pathway to Worlds that way. Uh, how did you sort of get introduced to that tournament series? So I got informed about it through the WSG server. Um, and I went to the WSG server from a 261 stream. and the eternal community is pretty great. I don't think I've met anyone that's been like mean or a super hard troll or whatever. And I got a lot of my resources from there, uh, including information about Tuesday Night Eternal. And on the day of the tournament, I actually recorded everything that I said slash did during the run. And Right before my first game, I was like, okay, the goal is to not go zero and two. Cause I was like seed 16 going against seed one apple chips. And I was like, okay, I, I know this guy's a good player. Um, in my run to qualify for this tournament, he was my only loss and still my only best of three loss till this day, I believe. So yeah, I was pretty surprised going through it. Was there a particular moment in that tournament that stood out to you as like the inflection point, a, a spot where you dug yourself out of a tough situation or beat a matchup that was particularly bad where, you know, it started to to dawn on you, you know, like the possibility of, of winning this thing was a real thing? Um, Je uh, my matchup versus Jez2718 was probably my hardest matchup because they were on Stone Scar, Heavy Shadow, with a lot of removal. And that was the deck in the tournament I ran into with the most removal, I believe. And I was playing Skycrag Aggro in the throne bracket. So once I got through that matchup, I was like, oh, OK, I, I think I have this. Also, I think I had a very, very potent meta read. I don't think Skycrag Aggro was extremely busted. Maybe it was before the nerfs and such, but I had a super potent meta read that everyone would be playing decks that didn't do things until turn three or four, besides remove other things. And I was able to smork people down. All right, welcome to the booth. It is top four time here at the World Championships. Andrew Beckstrom and Patrick Sullivan. And we have a very exciting top four in store for you all. We are going to be transitioning to now best of five matches as we are down to our final four competitors. Uh, let's take a look at the bracket when we have that ready, and then we'll 
set up for you the deck list and we'll have a, a real fun show ahead of us but we've got first up ddd versus the overmaster ddd is our number one seeded player they started off they were six and one they dropped their last two they still made it into the top four but that does mean that they had a bit of a rough go of it compared to the other formats in expedition um and so we're going to be starting off with them versus the overmaster let's start off by taking a look at ddd and their deck list that they're going to be bringing to the action and expedition so we've looked at this one a couple of times um it, they've got this Combray agra build uh we've broken it down what they got to do is they got to get it done now against the overmaster who um is a, obviously a very formidable foe yeah i mean no stranger to high level success we've talked a lot about this deck it's um essentially i, I guess a a Combray deck that tilts towards the aggressive side it's not uh the most linear beatdown deck but it is trying to get off to an early aggressive start cards like gavel insight Backs up a little bit, and the deck is primarily splashing Slay, which was a great metagame call this weekend with even the most aggressive decks in the format playing a lot of four- and five-cost units. I think the most concerning thing for me just about how DDD is going to be matching up in this top four is uh, there's not a ton in the way of evasion and ways to get through, like, big boards here. They've got just the Helena Sky Guides and then potentially any uh, Avasaurs they get off of Dinosaur Nest as way of Flyers. Just a little bit of overwhelm in the mix, thanks to that Gavel's Insight. But for the most part, they're going to need to rely on going bigger. Now, this is a great deck at doing it. Timeless Bond, uh, Scale Swarm Patrol. That's going to be a lot of the things that they're working at. So uh, let's take a quick look at the bracket uh, now that we've got that ready to go for us. For, we're going to be starting off, as we mentioned, with DDD versus the Overmaster. We'll be checking out the Overmaster's deck in a moment here. We're going to be focused on that semifinal first and then down at the bottom of the bracket. Iron Man's uh, brought a more mid-range aggressive take on Argent Port than what we saw before. So we're not looking at a harsh rule press gang deck. This is a deck that's beaten down with impending dooms, Renaya's, Styre's eyes, all that good stuff. Big premium on flying units, which makes a lot of sense. The dinosaur nest can be very strong against people who are trying to attack on the ground. Uh, there isn't a whole lot of flying specific answers in the format right now, and so trying to take advantage of that that sort of gap in the metagame makes a lot of sense. They're going to be going up against the Boxer. The Boxer, I believe, is on the same 75 as Lights Out Ace, so that more aggressive take on Rakano. So couldn't get Lights Out Ace quite to the top four, but the Boxer is now carrying the torch for those Rakano aggro players. So uh, four different deck lists for us in the top four. Let's check out what the Overmaster has brought this weekend. Uh, this is Xenon. This is one of the more popular decks that we saw this weekend in the Expedition format, and this is a very clean list. Uh, we've looked at this list like this a couple of times now. Lots of great defensive options. Blister Sting Wasp, Scorpion Wasp, the Rat King, Huntmaster Vikram Sive. This deck really, really messes up opposing aggressive strategies. And uh, yeah, I would describe what DDD's brought to the table as fairly aggressive. So how are you going to get past all of this gunk, all of this deadly and token nonsense if you're DDD? It's rough. I mean, you know, you have a lot of Aegis units on the uh, in, in that Combray kind of aggro deck, and typically that's good against defensive decks, but so much of what's going on here is blocking and specifically blocking with Deadly that it's going to be a challenge. Now, th that said, all those Aegis units really help take the sting out of Huntmaster Vikram. It's not going to be phenomenal in this matchup compared to a lot of the unit sensor strategies, but getting through cards like the Heat's Faithful, Zito, the Rat King, it, it's going to be an up uphill battle for sure. Sinister Rumors is my prediction for the sort of the most important card here. So often the fact it's the second time round with some of these units, you know, whether it's Zito getting a Destiny, they have to discard another card, something like Sive already having Killer, now it could start making more deadly units. So there's a lot to like about Sinister Rumors in this matchup. In addition, just being a solid catch-up tool, your opponent attacks you with a 3-3 Awakened student, just pop it off with the Sinister Rumors. Uh, of course, we got four Dinosaur Nests to round out this deck list, and so the fight over that will be with Waystone Igniter um, being an important card on both sides of the matchup to be able to interact with Dinosaur Nest. So, uh, you know, the Overmaster has done quite well this weekend, of course, by being in the top four. Xenon has been the deck that has impressed us the most, um, with the one exception of the one time we saw it against that big, big Combray, or that big Argent Port control strategy with Harsh Rules, Crown Watch, Press Gangs. It got kind of ground out, but... The other decks in right now are all leaning on the aggressive side. Even the Argent Port list, you know, a card like Impending Doom maybe doesn't line up the best against vic victimless, list, uh, victimless crime and the like. All right, 
Uh, let's take a peek over at the deck list for our second semifinals. Uh, Iron Man, uh, again, this is the more aggressive take on Arjun Port. Jada Peacekeeper, a uh, card that has been a staple in the format for a while now. Not as popular this weekend, but is showing up here. Um, that 4-5 does stealth unit does a great job at both stopping the Rakano starts that they'll need to against the Boxer, while also applying pressure as the game goes on. The big top end piece for this deck is D'Angelo Might. And, uh, you know, in any kind of a stalled game where they can manage to put the clamps down on the Rakano deck, that is the card that is going to push this the game out of reach. And I think this list, more than any other of our Expedition competitors, is really making the best use of the sketches and the illusions here. Uh, there can be a question. You see this list, it's, you know, it's playing, you know, trying to play something of a deeper game. You know, there's expensive cards. There's D'Angelo's, my, there's Argentport Blueprints. And there can be this question of, well, what are you supposed to do with all of this power? And we saw it on camera where the sketches and illusions were able to provide a lot of value in games that went on for a really long time at a fairly low opportunity cost. So if the game drags a little bit, keep an eye on those cards. They've already come up, and uh, there's a chance that if the game goes on for a very long time, we're going to see Iron Man extract a lot of value from those from those powers. All right. Rounding out our top four deck lists this weekend in Expedition, the Boxer bringing Rakano Aggro. We've seen this in the hands of Lights Out Ace already a couple of times this weekend. Um, in this Against this Arjun Port matchup, it's going to be – uh, very important to get off to quick starts is the Argent Port deck with Renaya, Argent Port Blueprints, Impending Doom. Just has a lot of ways to sort of um, take this, take the game over with. But uh, the big tempo plays for this deck, it's going to make the D'Angelo Mites a very scary option for um, for Iron Man because you know you 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 have to spend six power to draw all those cards, and it's a ton of cards. But if they've been sandbagging things like Finest Hour, Helena Sky Guide. Man, that could blow you out of the water. Yeah, the the D'Angelo's Mites here are much more of a nail in the coffin sort of thing than something that can bridge into the late game. There's still a burden on Iron Man to sort of defend themselves, block, make profitable trades, and then hopefully play cleanup duty with that. That card really pulls a lot of weight in other mid-range and control matchups. But here, it's not the card that you want to draw. It can be good once you've already gotten yourself into a winning position, but it's not likely to get you there on its own. All right, so that's the four deck lists. Our semifinals are ready to go as soon as um, DDD and the Overmaster have joined the match. We'll be heading down and watching it. it reminder, it is going to be a best of five match. So uh, don't get too excited if one of these players wins the first two games. The other player will still have a shot to come back as uh, we round out this top four here at the World Championships. Really excited. Variety of decks in both formats. Level of play has been really high, and I'm excited to, to finish this thing off. Yep. So for DDD, they're going to need to get back on the winning side of things. They were the hottest player in the tournament early. They have dropped their last two, but just by virtue of being 6-1 and one and alone in the standings, they've been just first seeded now for quite a number of rounds in a row. So uh, they're not looking up to give up the top slot. For the Overmaster, it's just been very tight, high-level play all the way through. So it's going to pretends to be a very exciting match, and uh, we'll be along with you for every step of the way. As a reminder, these players are playing for a $55,000 prize pool this weekend. They've already won quite a nice uh, share of money by making it to the top four. But uh, first first place is going to be getting $15,000. And, yeah, just a reminder, it is $55,000. So fantastic. And right now you see they've each won $6,000. Just this round alone, just each of these matches is worth an additional $4,000. And then in that last round playing for $15,000 and, of course, the title of Eternal World Champion. Uh, so I'm sure these players are very excited to get started. We're excited to get started. So we'll be heading down now as we begin the semifinals here at the World Championships. Dinosaur Nest is the play for the Overmaster. No answer in hand at the ready for DDD as they're going to get their turn kicked off with a Dinosaur Nest too. So a very, very important start with Killer Dinosaur number one coming out for the Overmaster into a Javon. That's going to be a fantastic card uh, able to buff the dinosaurs as they get played. We'll see a charged dinosaur emerge. And now will it be a Terius Martial Master or an Awakened Student for DDD? You're sort of priced into block in here uh, with that, that Javon uh, because one of the ways to get an edge in a dinosaur nest mirror match is just getting a little bit bigger. So there's a question here of 
uh, what's my least valuable game piece which is versus what's the most reliable way I have to block. A Waystone Igniter here is a huge draw for the Overmaster. They could potentially use that to wipe out the opposing Dinosaur Nest. And with Javon, they'd be able to pump up all of these units. There's a lot to like about how the Overmaster has started this game. Yeah, I mean, this is already shaping up to be kind of a uh, an overwhelming early advantage on the table for the Overmaster, backed up by more card advantage. They can move to Javon, they have Devour, they have Scythe. So really, uh, this is about as good of an opening as you can ask for. All right, so there's Scythe. So we're not going to waste on Igniter this turn. We are going to just get that uh, Terius out of the way, which means we now have a clean attack with the Javon, buffing up the charging dinosaur, the Sarasaur hatchling that emerged off the dinosaur nest. Does mean DDD is going to get another turn of action with this dinosaur nest. They get a charge dinosaur off again, once again. Now, is it going to be some Awakened students? No, we're going to Furious Magnaventurus. Let's stun down. Ooh, the Charged Dinosaur got stunned, not the Javon. I think the thinking here is, well, there's no attack to be made. And suppressing the killer is, you know, stronger, I guess, on the balance than uh, uh, trying to shut down a Javon attack for one turn. That probably isn't happening anyway. Doesn't appear it's that way. Look at this little attack by the Overmaster. Attacking in with that 4-4 Sarasaur. If the Magnaventris blocks, Sinister Rumors would be able to finish it off by killing an exhausted enemy unit with three strength or less. DDD's got to think carefully about this. They are going to lose all of the armor to the Magnaventris if they don't block here. Very tricky. And this attack is, you know, on the surface, free. So there is the possibility of nothing being back there, and that's something that the uh, that DDDDD has to consider as well. All right, so Waystone Igniter comes down after the no block. Kill an even cost relic. Goodbye, Dinosaur Nest. Now playing a Time Sigil. DDD has found a Helena Sky Guide, but um, maybe this turn we start trying to grow these Awakened students. Well, uh, you know, it's a tough spot to be in because, you know, DDDDD is not really in a position to press a lot of damage through at this point. And they have to sort of solidify their defenses enough that, just, this, that this Javon can attack. Because once the Javon starts attacking and uh, free rolling other units, there, there's no coming back from that sort of advantage. So it's a combination of sort of settling in a little bit, um, but also trying to shorten the game if you can, because the long game's not looking great. Man, this is, uh, this is a tough start for the Awakened students. Uh, all the power has now been played from DDD. But getting the Helena Sky Guy down, uh, definitely important for them. It means that they now have sort of a second blocker, which threatens to eat the Javon on attack. So even if they were to lose the Magnaventris, they don't have to worry about that. And in general, um, trying to develop an Air Force makes a lot of sense here in establishing that 3-4 flyer. So again, another nice attack with that charging. Sarasaur. No great blocks here for DDD. They really would love to keep around both the Magnaventris and the Helena. So looks like we are going to be taking two here. Or, or, sorry, four here. Yeah, even a double block with a 1-1 one, one and a, a Magnaventris so, still sort of leaves all the same interactions back. So I think the signal right now from the Overmaster is so strong that it's Sinister Rumors that there's really... I think DDDDD is basically saying, I can't allow that card to cash in profitably. Even if I had to take some lumps, even if it's a little bit awkward, uh, if if they lose one of their endurance units here to something untimely, it's going to be really hard to come back from that. All right, a pair of Awakened students come down. No power at the ready for DDD quite yet. And with a Blister Sting Wasp on the other side, no attacks. The Waystone Igniter is going to get devoured. Javon and a Huntmaster Vikram are picked up along with a victimless crime for the turn. So we will see what is going to happen with this Huntmaster Vikram. If it steals the Helena Sky Guide or the Magnaventris, they'd be able to attack right away. There we go. Helena Sky Guide is down. Sarasaur is coming in. Maybe. So DDD does have slays in their deck that they could use to try to kill the Helena. We'll see if they can top deck one. For now, 
Careful decision on this turn. Looks like Sarasaur and Helena are coming in. Seven point attack to DDD at five at fifteen. Yeah, pretty much any trade here is is, is good. Trading one for one when you have a Javon, uh, more cards in hand, removal at the ready. There's some ostensibly decent blocks that DDD has, but I think uh, the Overmaster is really fine with any permutation of it. All right, so the killer attack takes out one of the awakened students. And now Slay has been picked up from DDD. They can use um, Alessi to play that off of contract. So Alessi has a contract to gain three armor and as well as play a spell from your hand that costs three or less for free. So can use that to get back into the action here. Get that Helena back on our side. Well, this is the best possible draw, and it's still not the end of the world for the Overmaster. They're so far ahead on cards right now. Attacking through the Blistering Wasp is really complicated, and the Overmaster is just occurring a lot of different advantages right now. All right, so Helena's back on the on the t on the good guy's side as far as DDD is concerned. Now Helena could attack in, but it would be trading off with the Blister Sting Wasp. And as you can see, just every flyer is just so valuable for DDD because the ground against Dinosaur Nest and all these tokens can get so messy. The armor from Alessi's opened up a very nice looking attack from the Furious Magnaventure, so that's going to prompt DDD to give up the Helena Sky Guide. And the Overmaster is willing to just trade the Wasp for the Helena, um, trying to do a good job of managing the air, recognizing how important Flyers will be for DDD's plan to win this game. Well, also, the Victimless Crime matches up the right way against the Magnaventress and not ah. against the Helena. Change of heart here for the Overmaster. They absorb a huge attack, pick up another Huntmaster Victim, and only take three. There goes Huntmaster Vikram. We're going to see Helena rejoin the Overmaster side. There it goes, attacking in once again. And you just see the, the huge swings that Huntmaster Vikram provides, especially against Helena, where imagine if when you contract that card and then it gets stolen. And now not only do you not have your 3-4 flying endurance for next turn, you might not have the power to be able to make a good play. Yeah, it's, it's really good at catching up kind of against whatever, but especially good against units with endurance. All right, here we go. Javon is going to activate. It's going to hit a Zito. It'll be played. No contract, I'm sure, with no cards remaining in hand for DDD. And now with an attack from Javon, or from Helena once again, dropping DD down to nine. We're going to need to see something good off the top for DDD. As going back into the void, getting another Huntmaster Vikram. This is a very threatening moment now. And with just the power off the top, that can get the Awakened student up to 4-4, four, four, but... Yeah, that's not going to do it. So DDD drops game number one. They'll need to regroup against the Overmaster. Um, but this is a, this has kind of been a recurring story, is these sort of straightforward attacking decks. Once you, they once those Blister Sting Wasps and Scorpion Wasps lock up the ground, Huntmaster Vikram really takes over. And uh, as we've seen, the Overmaster does a very nice job of managing the air where the, there's really only the threats are coming. And the slays are overtaxed. Too many things to slay. And like we talked about at the beginning, you know, you, you come to the table with a bunch of Aegis units and you feel like, well, there's a lot of control matchups where this is, you know, just beating a bunch of Aegis units. It's not something they're really well equipped to do. Aegis doesn't do anything against Deadly. And so these, these cards just really don't line up particularly well. And then who has the late game advantages? It's all on the other side. So hard to get some traction early, hard to get some traction late. Going first will certainly help, but uh, this game one did not appear to be a very good matchup. Nope. Uh, we'll hope that DD will be on the play in game number two here as soon as both players have joined the match. We'll begin, which sounds like it's right now. All right, so DDD, pretty terrible looking opener. Let's throw that one back into a hand. Now, this is a tricky one, Patrick. It looks like DDD is going to keep, but you can't love the fact that you don't have a unit to play on turn one or turn two to uh, to lead into that timeless bond, the scale swarm control, and et cetera. I don't think that's a six card hand, but it's definitely not ideal. Meanwhile, on the other side, uh, the Overmaster does have a copy of Dinosaur Nest, so they are getting ready to load up once again. 
A Gavel's insight on the side of DDD does promise to uh, help out the efforts once we can. But you have to establish a unit first. That's one of the, the funny things about it. You can, you can give a unit a plus one, plus one, plus two, plus two, and overwhelm and amplify two to kill an enemy relic. But you got to have a unit in play. So now we'll see a killer dinosaur emerge. If you ever master wants to get really cheeky, you can kill our attack and sinister rumors back to dinosaur. We're gonna hold off on that. Dinosaur nest number two is down. So now the question is for DDD: uh, Do you want to try to use the gavel's insight right now and kill one of the dinosaur nests? If you timeless bond, you might be able to set it up where you can amplify and kill both next turn. But we're going to just get this taken care of right away. Gavel's Insight, plus two, plus two in Overwhelm. Kill an enemy relic. Now, Dinosaur Nest number two is here, as well as a Victimless Crime. Crime is just such the perfect card here. Yeah, killing a Scale Sworn Patrol is huge. Now, the good news for DDD is with a pair of Magna Ventress in hand, we, we sort of have the idea of how we're going to sort of rebuild a, an army from here. Killer Dinosaur, Blister Sting Wasp, very annoying, Scorpion Wasp, very annoying, and these deadly units, DDD is just, just does not have enough silence, enough invulnerable to damage that it, to get through these threats easily. Now, Furious Magnaventress number two could sting the Blister Sting Wasp, but with a Scorpion Wasp in hand, I think the Overmaster is going to be pretty aware of this is a possibility. But at a certain point, how much can you play around with possibilities like that? Yeah, I mean, it's all, you know, the, you are not favored in the long game, certainly. So, um, you know, you can try to play around the stuff to the best of your ability, but you are a little bit priced in at a certain point of just saying, well, if it's there, it's there. I can't wait all day. Speaking of it's there, it's there. Uh, hello, top deck, Hunmaster Vikram. Just absolutely been terrorizing Helena's. Furious Magnaventress is all weekend. <laughs> The Overmaster off to a quick 2-0 start here in this best of five match. DDD is not out of it, but they're going to need to rattle off three wins in a row now to keep their tournament alive. That might look like a quick concession, but they know each other's deck list. There's no getting out of that spot. There's no sweeper. There's no major catch up. And, and another thing where, you know, DDD's deck is a little light for this kind of matchup is just the lack of battle skills. To the extent that they're there, it's endurance, which has actually been kind of bad in a lot of spots uh, due to Hummaster Vikram. There's very little in the way of flying, very little in the way of overwhelm. And so the value accrued from, forget 3-3 three, three dinosaurs, but 1-1 one, one dinosaurs is already kind of a problematic starting point in the matchup. And then uh, it's not just Hunter Master of Vikram. There's a whole bunch of secondary cards here that are really problematic as well. And, you know, again, you got four slays against 16 things you have to slay. It's hard to apply enough pressure. There's just, you know, it's hard to get a foothold in the game. And we're seeing that right now. All right, DDD here on the play with a critical turn one decision. They've got a waste on Igniter. They're going to hold it, trying to nab potentially a dinosaur nest. And on the, similarly, on the other side, the Overmaster could uh, go out there with a turn one Zito, but then that would preclude a turn two dinosaur nest. So we'll see the impact that that card is having them on the matchup and how these players are sequencing. And here we go. Turn number two, is it going to be dinosaur nest? I mean, it is. Opponent keeping and not doing anything for the first two turns is, you know, what else could justify keeping that hand? It's probably a point of interaction. But also the nest, you know, it's not getting any better. So, And honestly, this doesn't even really qualify as a two-for-one as such because the Overmaster has so many ways of punishing units with one health, as we're seeing right now, that, you know, you don't like to have your relic get blown up. But if the leftover card is not really worth very much, who really cares? Okay. So now for DDD, will we see an attack and a Timeless Bond? We're not. So trying to save those spells until after Alessi comes down, and that makes sense. Next turn, we could see a sequence like play Alessi, play the Timeless Bond, and start pumping up the squad. And now a Shadow Sketch for the Overmaster. Uh, we're not going to see them amplify. They mm. want to have their power available for that Devour. There's more in the deck. I can let it go for it. Yeah, critically for the Overmaster, they are missing the third time influence right now for Scythe. So Awakened Student um, adds some complications. Well, apparently not for DDD. Um, <laughs> <laughs> certainly a fine choice to askew playing that one, getting that one down first, getting the Empower, but they're going to go straight for the Alessi. 
This is going to potentially open up an attack here as we can use Timeless Bond. Pumps up the Alessi very large, and it helps us uh, get down to the, uh, the Waystone Igniter into a size where Zito can't trade with it, but a Devourer will get rid of it. Back to the deck. We see it emerge right away. There's that Xenon banner. That opens up the door for Scythe. Also a Blister Sting Wasp, as we can see these problematic blocking units for this Combray deck. Yeah, I mean, even a 1-1 a one -one deadly unit is just, how much of this can you grind through on the ground? Right. There's Huntmaster Vikram stealing the Alessi. We could see a Sinister Rumors on the Waystone Igniter. We are not. So can this be a big catch-up turn for DDD? They get to slay. Now, unfortunately, the Alessi was stolen and exhausted, so it's not ready to attack. We're going to hold on to the Waystone Igniter. Uh, the Zito comes back. Say goodbye to the Awakened student. And now the question for the Overmaster is, do you want to try to get down something like the Blister Sting Wasp? or maybe Scythe to play a 1-1 Deadly Scorpion. And I think the reason that you didn't see the Sinister Rumors on uh, the, the Waste of Nine or the previous turn is just, you know, a unit that's small, there's going to be, you have so many ways to gum up the works. And uh, that's just one more way to get back on Master Pickram. Eventually, there's no way DDD can, ke can keep up with all the Deadly Units, everything that they try have to try to interact with, and also keep their slays up for Hummaster Pickram. All right, here we go for the Overmaster. They do have Sinister Rumors and a power available to them. So if they'd like to, the option is there to redraw Huntmaster Rick from, from the Void, play out that Shadow Sigil, steal back the Alessi, and now DDD is up against their own Alessi once again, top decking a Combray Tome. The hour is getting very late here for DDD. A victimless crime is picked up. Just... Everything is rocking and rolling for the Overmaster right now, even attacking with Vikram. Dropping DDD down to 20. At any time, the Overmaster has the combo in hand to play Blister Sting Wasp and Scythe to make a deadly killer unit. They're going to apply some more pressure, getting down a 1 1 deadly and a 1 3 flying deadly. All right, Magna Ventress, that can stun and at least keep DDD alive for a little bit longer, so that way they can maybe try to find a way to dig back out of this problem. Victimless Crime could nab the Magna Ventress on the following turn, but maybe you just got to stun back your own Alessi here. Yeah, a lot of what, uh, you know, a, a good sort of check mark for this kind of matchup, a good thing to check in on is what happens if DDD draws slight? Is the game still within arm's reach? Right now, it, it is. The door is closing, but a Slay could potentially work them back in. The Overmaster doesn't have another copy of Master Vikram and no way to return. But it's got to be now. All right, Terius Martial Master. And uh, do we have to play out the Igniter? We can make a Spiteling, which can chump the Alessi. You know. Okay, we're going to make a 4-3, so... That's going to make this tough because this is a big, big attack coming in. Ten are coming across six. Now the Overmaster, all they did was draw another seat. Just a sigil for DDD. Feels like if they can find a sleigh, maybe they have a, a road back in. But they're going to need to do at least a chump block this turn on that Alessi. The deadly units are also coming in. Well, let's rethink that one, maybe. The, the deadly units attacking then forces a chump block on the Alessi. It can no longer... Well, I guess that's the case anyway. It's the case anyway, but it makes taking the three from the Scythe and not trading right. with it a lot more problematic as you'd now be dropping down to one. So this feels like this is almost compelling the block on both units here. Yeah, and, and the upshot is, you know, even if all those trades happen, now you have an opponent down to four. You have... Uh, a seven strength unit and then four separated the other ways. So it's uh, very, very hard to get out from that spot. And a timeless bond off the top. That is going to do it for DDD here. They could play it and get a sigil. They're going to show off how much power they accumulated this game, but their Combray and Power Aggro deck couldn't get it done for them in the top four. The Overmaster is a straight sweep into the finals here at the World Championships. They are now just one match away from being the World Champion. Uh, congratulations to DDD. Um, 
coming out of this field as our top seed in the Swiss rounds. Uh, obviously a fantastic run and now six thousand dollars uh, richer for their efforts this weekend congratulations but unfortunately you can't outsize deadly that's nope. just a, that's just a rule and there are a ton of deadly units over there all right so for the overmaster we will be seeing them in the finals but who is going to be their opponent we're going to find out in just a few minutes here as we are going to get started with our second semifinal between iron man and the boxer uh, so if we have time we'll take a look at their deck list before um, that match has begun. We, yeah. All right, so we are kicking the match off. As soon as those players have joined, we will be heading down to them. Uh, as a reminder, Iron Man is going to be on a take on Argent Port. I would describe this as just very mid-range. Um, they've got both attacking units. They've got some removal. It's not playing Sweepers, not playing Zito, not playing Crown Watch Press Gang. Um, and they're going to be going up against the Boxer, who is playing our their take on Ricano Agro topped out with Inferno Phoenix. Yeah, there's a lot less in the way of, you know, opportunity cost here being uh, paid to play a longer game. It's coming from things like sketches, uh, runes, blueprints, that sort of thing. There's some sideways ways that this deck has to, to grind, along with D'Angelo's might, Rihanna at the top end. But this is a much more aggressive take, as you mentioned. No press gang, no Zito. Uh, just trying to play a pretty... Efficient game, you know, you have the Sire's Eyes, Iron Priestess combination. You have Twisted Farmer alongside Shadow Sketch as a way to sort of backdoor in some late games. And then just a really, you know, strong curve of units uh, and enough, you know, cards like Badge of Ventress to stun things and Impending Doom, which is just bigger, to sort of address uh, Dinosaur Nest in sort of a different way. All right, so that's Iron Man's deck. Uh, this is the Argent Port deck uh, here. Uh, Twisted Farmer showing up with Sato Sketch, your favorite combo. We'll see if that one comes up. Um, um, and let's check out the Boxer's deck one more time. Um, you know, seeing this deck a lot this weekend. I think the biggest thing here is that there's less in the way of fast removal, no defiances or iron condemnations. There are those slays, but those gem blazer cannons feel a little bit more alive, the finest hours, all of these pump effects. and. Uh, this is going to be a real battle between these players because they have similarly sized units, but with cards like Scale Sworn Patrol, Iron Priestess, uh, Helena, Styre's Eyes, there's ways to get your units just a little bit bigger. So finding those right spots tactically, we're getting an extra little bonus to the stats right away on the battlefield will be a big one to just determining who's the aggressor, who's on the defense, and who comes out on top here. Yeah, size matters a ton here. Not a ton of removal, certainly on this side of things. And uh, often it's who has the biggest unit, who has the biggest flyer, who has the biggest endurance unit. Those are some of the important check marks here. Yeah. Um, you know, this deck has looked pretty good when we've seen it up against other aggressive strategies. Um, and I would say this Argent Fort deck has been the closest thing to that we'll see this weekend. So uh, certainly like their chances here. Uh, we'll, we'll save the thoughts on the matchup against uh, the Overmaster for whoever gets to the finals. But uh should be a fun matchup here. Um, this deck list was worked on, I believe, by both uh, the Boxer and the Lights at Ace. Either way, they came to the exact same 75 this weekend. Uh, as far as the matchup predictions, do you have any thoughts on what you expect to come out on top here? I think I like the Boxer side of this. Uh, I think they're just a little bit more efficient. Um, their pieces are a bit smoother. Um, I think Inferno Phoenix in a matchup like this where it's trading on curve and then also, the opponent's not closing up the game very quickly, so you have time to get to your stuff. Um, a lot of this matchup is about who can ever play two cards in one turn the first. It's not the whole game, but a lot of it comes down to I answered your play, and now I've made another play, and you're behind. And just a deck with Torch versus a deck with Slay, assuming that there's enough tough stuff for the Torch to interact with, I prefer to be on the side with Torch. All right, I... I I think I like uh, the Iron Man side of this matchup just because uh, I like the big flyers. I like Impending Doom. I like Renaya. I like, especially with Renaya, what that card can co do and come down, killing a unit, removing all the copies from the deck, and then maybe trading with something else or applying pressure. And combined with Slay, it does a really nice job of sort of disguising which way you're playing the game. You know, maybe you, somebody doesn't make an attack because they're fearing something like the Slay or... They maybe just play out a unit because they think you have a slay. They want to get some more pressure down. You play Renaya, and then with Helena, Styre's Eyes, you could just, bam, punch through a ton of damage and maybe swing the game totally in your favor. Yeah, I think it's it's going to be close. I think, 
you know, pound for pound, the Rakano deck is a little bit more efficient at getting size onto the table, but certainly there are some cards in the Archimpor deck, especially if the game slows down a little bit, that are going to be way more powerful than the cards on the Rakano side. Yeah. Uh, the Archimpor deck has a little bit more in the way of, like, late game power sinks, things of that nature, um, with... Uh, sort of the ability to use their runes, their sketches. Um, there is a, there is some rune action on the Mercano side, but as we mentioned, it's just those three rune of laws. And when you're on the defense, when the game's a little stalled out, when you're not close to killing them, uh, being able to pay five to get a plus four, plus four bonus maybe isn't the thing that's going to swing the game in your favor. It might be the thing that closes out the game if you're trying to win a race, which is definitely a lot more possible here when you have um, both big giant flyers and units on both sides. Right. And it's interesting to see what kind of role Impending Doom plays in this kind of matchup because it is big and it's good for being a big flyer, but also it's, you are sort of priced in to playing an aggressive game once you play that card because the damage starts adding up. And we've seen in the Rakano mirror matches a lot of, all right, someone's off to a fast start, someone's a little bit ahead, and now we sort of turtle up a little bit. And I have the biggest thing, or I have a unit with endurance, and I'm sort of chipping away with that uh, to get to a point where now I can make one big attack. And Pending Doom is the biggest thing. It's going to be the biggest thing a lot of the time. But also, the now I sit back and sort of wait a little bit. It's a lot shakier to do with that unit than with a lot of the other options that you see in some of these Rakano decks. So keep an eye out for that one. I, I think that's a card with a very specific sort of uh, tactical implications in the matchup. All right, the Boxer and Iron Man are off and running here. It looks like the Boxer kicked things off. With an Oni Insider, um, believe that one actually didn't kill anything or draw the Warhelm, uh, recognizing the Boxer wants to have all of their power available for turn number three. Meanwhile, in Iron Man's side of things, they got it started with a Styre's Eyes. It's going to trade with the Oni Insider here. And now the first big question of the match for the Boxer, when we play this Carnivorous Yearling, are we going to get another one or are we going to make a 4-3 Lifesteal? And the answer is 4-3 Lifesteal. Yeah, hand's so jammed up right now that, you know, when you're a little long on power, you can talk about trying to to uh, try to size up. But here, got to just get your stats. Big turn here from the Boxer. Let's get that stunned Carnivorous Yearling back and ready and throw it into the air. Removing all of the armor from the Magnaventress. And now for Iron Man, is it going to be a Scale Sworn Patrol, an Impending Doom? If we buff up the Scale the, uh, the Magnaventurist, well, it could still be double blocked down, I suppose. So, will we see an attack here? It would be able to trade with either of these units. No, we're not. Now, the Boxer's got to take a turn off here, paying down that debt. Alina Sky Guide off the top. And so, if you're Iron Man, you can attack with the Magnaventurist. Any double block, you can break up with a Slay. And I. Imagine the Boxer will be willing to just throw away four health to not get blown out that badly. Yeah, you got to keep the flying unit. I mean, the argument for the double block here is that, you know, you are sort of trading profitably in terms of size, but the downside risk is so bad. And something that the Boxer has done at this point is accumulate a nice little advantage in the health toll. So they can afford to be a little bit, you know, conservative, take a hit here, not do anything super risky. Uh, because they've built up a little bit of a cushion. All right, the Boxer did not draw power number four, but they did hit an Inscribe unit in Scale Sworn Patrol, so that will could help them get going here as they're pretty jammed up in their hand right now. Uh, and Penning Doom does a fantastic job at sort of uh, keeping the Helena Sky Guy to play, and any plays like putting a Gem Blazer Cannon on it, quite risky, of course, as that last turn attack did imply a slay. It did imply a slay, but the other side of this is just... What are you doing to beat Slay anyway? You are already behind substantially in terms of size. Uh, you're looking at double blocks or block plus pump spell to manage things. And so you might get priced into doing something risky here. All right, so an Iron Priestess plus a Torch. We got the Scale Swarm Patrol out of the way. Now let's see here with a Helena Sky Guide picked up for Iron Man. We could see a contract turn with that card plus the Magnaventurus sending in with both of the flyers for a big attack and i really like that play from the boxer there for a couple reasons one is it was very uh sort of efficient tempo wise but two it set them up for a double block on the magna ventress where they do not care if it got blown up by a slay but the four three and the two two in front if it dies well they weren't worth very much anyway in the face of the magna ventress and you get a uh, weapon for your trouble so a really sharp tactical play there to try to Jockey for a double block, maybe it doesn't come up, 
but you're at least doing it at a low opportunity cost. All right, here we go. Gem Blazer Cannon on the Iron Priestess, recognizing that Iron Man, even if they deal with it, they get paid back with a weapon in hand. And uh, on that last turn, we saw Helena Sky Guide not contract, trying Iron Man hoping that they could draw power number six so they could make two plays this turn. How will Iron Man go about managing this Iron Priestess? This is will rough. they hold up Slay here? They are, but passes back to the Boxer. They've got Verbruck in hand. They could have had that to their attacks this turn, though I guess that would run into the Magna Ventress. All right, it's just going to be the Iron Priestess. And since it's attacked, it's now up to an 8-5 Overwhelm. Slay in the middle of the attack stops the weapon from being played like on the Sky Guide, but now it is an 8-5 weapon. You throw that onto the Carnivorous Yearling either this turn or next turn, that thing's got Overwhelm, Patrick. Well, now there's the question of where you need to put it, because if you put it on the Yearling, you are at risk of... Helena on the uh, Magna Ventress, and you can't block everything. Though you are at 14, you know, you can you can afford to take that hit. Carnivorous Yearling number two. It looks like we're going to make a second 4-3 here. Iron Man finally draws power number six. So they will be able to play multiple things this turn. We're going to see Jada and then potentially a Helena Sky Guide on the Magna Ventress. So now this will be a lethal attack. This is 16 coming across. Helena Sky Guy can only chump. It'll probably absorb the seven from the Magna Ventress. Now nine comes across, dropping down to five. But now with these lifesteal carnivorous yearlings, the boxer is set up for a huge attack here. It's going to make a 12-8 carnivorous yearling. And the only question then will become how much does Iron Man want to, to, to block to survive against this? Although, keep in mind, you know, there's still 12 coming back in the air, so it's not like this hit just sort of solves everything. Oh, yeah. By no means. All right, so the Carnivorous Yearling is going to, just the one that's buffed up by this weapon is going to attack. For Iron Man, how much do we throw in front? Do we th attack? We're going to block with everything in case there was some kind of uh, pump spell. The Carnivorous Yearling will trade off with... The Magna Ventress and the bigger Helena Sky Guide. And now it goes away. It does get the Boxer back up to 17. We get to contract Warhelm. All right, so a Magna Ventress could stun that Carnivorous Yearling. And we might see an attack for up to 12. But how worthwhile is it to attack with Jada at this stage? Uh, I mean, I assume that with two endurance units back, it's very low risk that you need the Jada as a blocker. But it looks like even that low chance is is, is too much here. It for won't Iron kill Man. the Insider if it blocks. It's just very. It seems potentially very little upside. Uh, Iron Man's got a lot of power sinks here you, you know you have sketches and ghost forms it's not nothing to get the power it's not nothing i, I think it's fine to err on the side of caution but like you know there's some money you're on the 11. table you're at 11 with an opponent who has a war helm in hand so. oh no i don't mind erring on the side of caution i'm just All saying right. that going from power seven to power eight is like there's stuff stuff in this deck stuff has been called all right, for the Boxer here, it might be time for a defensive Inferno Phoenix. Uh, that Torch can go face, but I guess there's a question for the Boxer if they might want to try to do something like attack with the Inferno Phoenix and great bait out the block. Um, that would kill you, though, if the bait didn't work. I think the Inferno Phoenix is pretty strong here as a defensive play. Yeah, um, it does look that way. You're not going to be able to... The problem with that is just the Magna Ventress because right now with two armor on Iron Man's side, it is going to attack as a 5-7. Twisted Farmer now for Iron Man. Poodle Alley. Did someone call? Uh, this is, is... That's your boy right there. There it is. All right. So Inferno Phoenix sitting back. And you said there's nothing to do with the power. Come on. <laughs> That's a man trait. Well, make up your mind. Which one is it? What do you mean? <laughs> All right. Uh, Oni Insider 
potentially blocking Jada, or it's going to chump the Magnaventurous. And the Inferno Phoenix, we could see a trade with either the Helena Skyguard or the Impending Doom. If you want to maximize your units in play, you block like this, as you get to kill the Impending Doom. But now you're dropping down to one against a Twisted Farmer. Well, this really is setting it up for the boxer who needs to do it something next turn. You play out Jada. Okay, I mean, maybe Carnivorous Yearling can gain us some health back if we throw the War Helm on it. Well, that I mean, at some point you got to start like actually trying to win the game. Like yes, you could you could right. maybe find a way to defend yourself this turn from a twisted farmer kill, but from here I think you got to play like Iron Man has nothing cuz beating what's already out there is going to be hard enough. It is. It is. Um if we were to play Inferno Phoenix I think and just pass, I do think that Iron Man would die here. It does seem like that's the most likely way this is going to go down. So, Twisted Farmer, 2-3 Ambush, Amplify, you get to play some 1-1 one, one Mandrakes that die at the end of your next turn. And an all-out attack here means the Yearling gains you up to 5. Um, most of the bigger units get blocked, but one of them will sneak through. And that will be just about enough. It's. I think we're gonna have ultimately seven coming through. Yeah, there's no way to. Yeah. There's four big. There, there are four things that are too big. So very close to stabilizing the boxer. They got a little jammed up with power on the middle turns of the game, and then Iron Man was able to use that to good effect. They were able to sort of play their car and tracks on their Helena Sky Guides and kind of keep the game moving in their favor. That Carnivorous Yearling was really big. I really liked the play of combining uh, Iron Priestess with Gem Blazer Cannon. Um, it's a very nice way to make your investment safer because it's very hard. Uh, for I don't think the Rakano deck has any silenced cards at all. So once you've established it in play, you know that kind of sooner or later it's going to die or it's just going to be a terroring force and then give you an 8-5 Relic Weapon. Yeah, or I, just unit weapon. I, I think, you know, what that matchup, what that game kind of showed was once we start talking about five cost plays, the Arch Import deck's on the better side of that. There's a lot of burden on the Rakano deck to get off to a much faster start than we saw. Hand was clogged up with a lot of fours and fives. But Brook was never lined up the right way, just never had a turn yeah. to use it. There was never anything to kill. Uh, and so, like I said, got to get off to a faster start there. Got to be mulliganing, looking for something to do on turn two or turn three. Because once we start throwing punch to punch on turn five, turn six, uh, the Archer Port deck has uh, better sized units and ways to sort of break up those sort of combo flurries of, of charge and pumping all in one turn. Um, and so the Rakano deck just needs to be a little bit faster. Yeah, yeah. A, a few, there's just a little bit of multi faction action. There's the Renayas on the side of the Archer Port deck, but. It's kind of going to be hard. It's going to take a, like a minute for that to all work because the Renai is usually going to come down either in a combat where it might trade off or it'll come down end of turn where it might kill something and then get an attack in. And by the time you've done all that, the Verbruch is might not even have the opportunity. You might be dead before it can even catch you up and kill that one. Right. That's a great example of, yeah, uh, there is a multi-faction unit and you have Verbruch. But the actual texture of the games is such that it's it's unlikely that you just get to line one for one up there like as cleanly as you're imagining. Yeah. Well, things never do when you're up against very talented players. So uh, the Boxer and Iron Man, this is a best of five set. Iron Man is up a game. Um, the Boxer is uh, no, known for uh, taking a little bit of time in between matches. We give the players a few minutes in between if they need to uh, relieve themselves in any way. And then once they both hit uh, join game, uh, that game will get kicked off and we'll be heading down to it so uh a, it's a good first game uh, really did a good job of showing off what both decks are capable of and i think um as you as we've seen a couple of times uh this this format in these games are often deci decided not by which player gets off to the fastest start but by which player has the sort of the big important turn where you are either dealing with an important threat or you've maybe combined a couple of cards in order to do something it kind of seemed that game like the Ricano player. I mean, just that one turn, the hit with the Yearling, but that Magnaventurous off the top, locking down that Yearling for a couple of turns um, was just a, too much 
um, for uh, before the boxer to come back. Well, also a critical spot for Iron Man where they had five power and four different threes in their hand and drew undepleted power number six. Now, if that's another expensive card, uh, that game probably looks a lot different, or even if it's just a depleted power. But being able to play two cards in one turn there, and not only was it two cards, but it was a card plus a Helena with a contract, like this huge burst to turn, that would have been off the table without that six power. So it, a lot of the stuff is just like right on the razor's edge. Yeah, and Jada is such an interesting card um, that uh, it, it's so funny how that card's value swings in these games. Like, it comes down, it's a three cost four or five, and if left unchecked, it just smashes hard. But then once you get into the later portions of the game, and especially if a deck does, doesn't have available to it large power sinks, it, all you need is for the boxer there to survive that last turn was just one more unit that just literally could stand in front of Jada, shrink its strength down to zero for the attack. Yeah, they get a Justice Sigil, but it might not matter. That's part of what I like about Iron Man's deck construction here quite a bit is, so you have Jada, you're just sort of broadly in the market for attacking, great, it's huge, but sometimes the game bogs down. And if your aggro deck now suddenly has this z a f functionally zero strength unit, that's not very helpful. There's just enough sort of small ways of sinking power at a low opportunity cost, the Twisted Farmer, with the Blueprints, uh, with the sketches that you can actually do something if you happen to just be getting a lot of power off of Jada. All right, a, uh, a tricky hand here. Both players redrew, but looks to have kept their, their second look at seven cards. Iron Man has no Justice Sigils in hand, but with a couple of Scale Swarm Patrols, they can inscribe those and keep things in their favor. Meanwhile, for the Boxer, got that one-two punch. Styre's Eyes and Iron Priestess. We'll see if they want to go for that combo here on turn number two. All right, Styre's Eyes, ditching the Iron Priestess. Picking up for us a custom rail driver. And we see a Phoenix on top. We're going to leave that one right where it is. And now for Iron Man, they don't have the influence to be able to play that Argent Court Noble on turn number two. So the question is, are they going to inscribe another Scale Swarm Patrol? They are. Argent Court Blueprint. So Iron Man had a little bit of a rough go of it with our power in the first couple of turns, but things actually now with three Shadow Sigils on hand should be smooth for the rest of the game. But uh, the Boxer here is pre-rolled up. Already got some pressure here, and uh, their top end is accounted for too. So the Iron Man can start playing their cards, but is it going to be too little too late? All right, so Arjun Port Noble is going to come down. It is not going to contract, not valuing getting the Styre's Eyes out of the air wanting to make sure they have power available for them next turn to play Slay, and then the turn of following to be able to play a Renaya Wings of the Cabal. Gem Blazer Cannon going on to that Oni Insider. Warhelm onto the Styre's Eyes. We could have torched the Argent Port Noble, but not happening this game as we are moving in. And I really, this setup here from the Boxer is really great. Like, what do you do about Slay? It's like, have multiple huge things that, you know, at this stage of the game, they all require essentially a full turn to answer, and you slay whatever you want. A lot of damage coming through. We got some War Cry triggers stacking up. The gem plays cannons getting huge. And um, this is this is how the boxer needs to play this sort of matchup. You, you cannot allow yourself to get out-tempoed by slay. You need to establish enough early where slay is cumbersome instead of back-breaking. And there it was merely, it was really cumbersome for Iron. All right, Argent Port Noble's uh, picking up some health, and now we've got a Renaya ready to ambush. Question is, how is the Boxer going to go here? They picked up a Helena for the turn. And these units uh, kind of are already flying, so now we're going to see a Verbrook. It's going to be a big attack. Renaya's coming down. 5-3. Can't kill any of these units with the contract. But we'll trade with the Phoenix. Now for the Boxer. Interestingly, they did not torch the Argent Port Noble. Um, valuing its ability to potentially knock, uh, kill a more important unit in the future. Like, you know, maybe a Styre's Eyes. Yeah, I mean, I, if, if your read of the room here is that uh, they're sort of priced into um, a block, then who cares, right? But you know, with the other way that time, with uh, 
Styre's eyes to allow a big hit, gain a bunch of health. Now, you know, you got D'Angelo's might for next turn. If it is next turn, it's going to take a lot to get through all this, but. So a very interesting sequencing decision here from the boxer. Lots and lots of options here between Styre's eyes, Helena, the rail driver, the torch. We can pump these units all sorts of ways. We can kill the Styre's eyes. We can give lifesteal to our units with the Styre's eyes. Now we will see custom rail driver, the weapon placed onto the roof. Helena's Sky Guide is going to buff up Styre's eyes, going to give it endurance as well. Neither of these units can be profitably blocked, but the Iron Man has to do some amount of blocking here. Otherwise, they are going to die. And we're going to see a double block on Styre's eyes, likely trading with that impending doom. Dropping Iron Man critically down to three. A Furious Magnaventress can... Well, it can't stun... I guess it can st uh, No, that can stun the group. So now we're up to six, but if we don't, we gotta have to jump here. Wow, this is so close. Well, you can attack first, and if they don't jump, then your torch is lethal. True. So just start here. We are gonna see the jump. So now the boxer can play Styre's Eyes. It has double damage. Thanks to the Inferno Phoenix from earlier. Is it going to be used here? It's not. So now Iron Man can draw six, or sorry, excuse me, draw three. I guess you could attack first with the Magna Ventress and see if you can trade with either of these units. You'd still get to draw three after attacks, but you get to draw six if you attack first. Oh, interestingly, we're going to see an attack with the Argent Port Noble wanting to buff it there. For their health total. Well, this is the route to draw six, right? Is forcing some sort of issue there. Right. Otherwise, if you run into a double block, much worse. I don't think uh, I would. I don't even know what the sequence of cards here uh, that could be useful is because so much damage is coming on the way back. The right way to do it. A second torch has been picked up by the boxer. They're going to go to the face twice here and then play out the Carnivorous Yearling, which picked up charge earlier from the Inferno Phoenix that died. It's going to pick up another Carnivorous Yearling, but all we have to do is go through the air. So the Boxer just kind of showing off a little bit how much damage they could do that turn, and it was a ton. Uh, spinning the ball on the finger a little bit, but, you know, top four of the world championships, I, I, I like to see it. You know what I mean? All right, so... Uh, we got we got a, we got a very competitive semifinal here now with both of these players picking up their first win and uh, anytime you get that first win in a best of five set it's it's a great feeling just because you know now it's like you can beat this person you just got to repeat it yeah and um and, you know Arjun Port there uh, nothing on the second turn nothing on the first turn third turn starting to play a little bit of catch up and uh, the boxer there which is a much faster draw on the play was never really a competitive game because that. Early advantage that they that uh, the boxer was able to accumulate. It wasn't like they ever fell behind at a certain point. They were sort of just playing at each other's pace for the rest of the game, and that early tempo advantage just was was never really turned back. Yeah. All right, for Iron Man and the boxer, they'll be kicking off game number three here in just a minute. We'll head down as soon as both players have joined that match. For Iron Man, they will be on the play this game, and yeah, as you mentioned, um, getting to the board first in this matchup, very important, um, in particular having those two drops. I mean, whether it's Iron Priestess or Styre's Eyes or Argent Port Noble, all of those things uh, can offer a lot. I mean, the Argent Port Noble that uh, Iron Man got down on turn number three was even very important for them. I mean, that game, it was really the thing that made that game close. Right, yeah, and, um, you know, you just got to get off to that jump where, their second, third, fourth best options, whatever those happen to be in the matchup, are, are really cumbersome. What we saw in the first game there was there was a lot of the, the secondary, tertiary kind of strength cards in the matchup from the Archer Port side that, given enough time, are still effective. They're still going to be bigger and, and be able to outsize. And in that game, we're just, like, not part of the equation whatsoever. No, they weren't. All right. Um, so, you know, we, we started off with the best of five, and now we're down to a best of three because whoever wins two of these next three We'll be moving on to the finals where they will face the Overmaster. The Overmaster was victorious with their take on Zine and Midrange and Expedition. And uh, 
Xenon mess, mess up aggro is the is really the way I would describe that deck. So uh, for these players, they're gonna have to get past this opponent first, but they've got their greatest challenge yet to come in the finals. Well, I think for that that Zenon deck playing against Torch versus Aegis units is very different. I mm -hmm. mean that 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 Combray Splash Slay matchup is uh, is almost like a fantasy. Like all their defensive measures do not work at all against your defensive measures, and they have no chance of hanging you uh, 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 with you in a long game. I think whichever one of these decks emerges is going to give us a more competitive matchup in the finals than we saw in the semis. All right. So that'll be something to look forward to once uh, we find out who will be the winner here between the Boxer and Iron Man. And, uh, yeah, I mean, for this, this next game, I think Iron Man will be looking to try to take the aggressive stance once again. Uh, the most important decision on, on their side seems to be when do you choose to risk getting a Scale Sword Patrol down on turn three? Doesn't seem like they have a ton of turn three plays that are great to make, and so sometimes to use your power best with Scale Swarm Patrol, you need to play it on turn three exposed. And then when you have your copies of Slay, when do you use them? When do you save them? When do you try to sit back and hold them up? Because one of the things that the Rakano deck does is it's both great at both developing the board and on punishing you when you go shields down. It's not exactly the kind of deck where you could just sit back on a Slay and assume you'll win because they could just keep churning out units after unit especially with now that they have Carnivorous Yearling in the mix. And I, I think uh, something that we saw in both of these games was these decks have so many ways to punish you. If you play, you, you spend all your power, you play a blocker. You go to my turn and I attack. How safe is it for you to block? It's not. For either side of this matchup, it, it's, it's clearly there's a lot of things that can go wrong. So do you set things up ahead of time where you have a cushion to say no blocks on that critical turn. And that can merge a lot of different ways. That could be your presence on the table. That could be picking up some points from a, from a lifesteal unit. But the, the second that you're priced into blocking because your health total is the primary consideration, uh, th that's where the game gets off the rails. And, and, and it's for both players here. All right, here we are in game number three of this best of five. Iron Man has kept their hand. The box are on the draw with a very ugly looking seven card hand. I really like their decision to go down to six cards here. They have an Iron Priestess. They have a Furious Magnaventurus on four. And I love what those cards do in terms of uh, allowing them to potentially come back on the draw. Sure, you're down a card, but I really like uh, the way they set things up. Meanwhile, for Iron Man, uh, yeah, they're going to pitch the Triple Shadow Pips card as they're still hunting for Shadow Influence number one with an Argentport Noble on top. I think that one's got to go away. I don't know. I kind of like leaving that one on the top. You're so far Whoa. away from Impending Doom anyway, and the rest of your hand is Mono Justice, that just All right. take the L on Impending Doom. Don't worry about trying to draw into Double Shadow and just like, it's just not my hand for now. That's it. I'm, 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 I'm just going to play with my Justice cards. Okay. Well, you will. All right. For the Boxer, now on turn number two, they got a choice between playing that Iron Priestess or the Oni Insider. Not too many attachments to worry about um, in this matchup for the Boxer, so that's a, certainly a consideration when it comes to sequencing. Now for Iron Man, play Styre's Eyes, and you could play out that Argent Port Noble. They will. Will they silence? No. They want to have the power set up, looks like, for next turn for a Furious Magnaventurus as they inscribe their Scale Sworn Patrol. Looks like Boxer's going to be happy to take this hit on the way back. Pony Insider will show up. Gonna pick up a War Helm. And now things seem well set up for Iron Man to stun if they want with the Magnaventurus, that uh that Oni Insider, and get in a nice five-point attack, including three life deal with the Noble. Inferno Phoenix for the boxer. That'll be big in a in a turn or two. But for now, it's gonna be a Magnaventurus probably coming down on the way back. Stunning either the Styre's Eyes or the Archer Port Noble. Eyes are down. And that's a nice play because now if Iron Man has a Helena, which they do, if they want to be able to put it on the Archer Port Noble, they're not also getting attacked by the Styre's Eyes. And also, the, the, the Noble is just locked down. Like, all three units that the Boxer has are incredible at blocking it for different reasons. And you kind of want to clear out the, the, the skies here a little bit. Both just because that's an evasive attacker, it's harder to manage, and also with Inferno Phoenix rolled up, um, you know, having a clear shot with that thing or not having to block multiple things, 
uh, th there's a lot of ways that, that that advantage can kind of materialize. So putting the plus three, plus four on the Magna Ventress, what that does is it lets them take advantage of all of the armor they had to make the attack, as well as they don't have to worry about the Iron Priest chumping it. Now with an Inferno Phoenix coming back, Iron Man snaps off the block now, so the top of the deck is loaded here for the Boxer. Iron Man finds Shadow Influence number two. It is depleted, though, so we're not going to see Impending Doom this turn. Will we see an attack with the Magna Ventress? The biggest concern here is just what, how upset are you going to be if there is a block involving Iron Priest and what the Boxer might be able to do with that weapon? Yeah, now you're kind of you're you're sort of off tempo here with uh, the sigil. Yes, now you have double shadow, but also um, it doesn't look that appealing to play the Angelus Might next turn. And Pending Doom comes with its own set of issues. So, all right, Seed of Vengeance for Iron Man. Now the Boxer has pit drawn a Helena Sky Guy. That Helena Sky Guy already had flying, which means it either got charge or double damage. We'll find out in just a moment here when the Boxer plays it. Assuming that is their play for the turn. And it's interesting because if they want to contract it, it will not allow them to... Say it has double damage. They might want to just put a Warhelm on it. We'll see. I, I think I would put a premium here on trying to knock out the armor this turn, though. Either, you know, giving the Magna Ventress fly and getting that hit in, it, at least induce a chump block with the Styre's Eyes. Just something here because... Um, you know, you don't want that Knight of Ventress to have the opportunity to be attacking or maybe even pumping up the, uh, the Angelus Might next turn. Okay, so it turns out that it did get double damage from the Inferno Phoenix. The Warhelm gives a charge, so no contract here. If Iron Man wants to, they can block down the Magna Ventress by throwing all of their units in front of it. The Boxer would then have the choice of killing the Archiport Noble and the Styre's Eyes. Oh, okay, so we're going to go for just two chumps here. Yeah, I really like that play a lot because it preserves the armor, and now you can go attack with Magna Ventress. Um, although I guess attacking with the Magna Ventress is pretty risky. If if the Boxer sniffs out that the card here to worry about is uh, D'Angelo's Might, we might just see block with everything. Um, you know, your, your Magna Ventress is not large enough to uh, swallow mine anyway, so the, the double block is fairly low risk. <laughs> and would take D'Angelo's Might off the uh, table as well. All right, so just an impending doom now for Iron Man. Yeah, if they attacked with Magna Ventress, that block was going to be pretty ugly because they could go Oni Insider and their, the 5-7 Magna Ventress right. on it, and it wouldn't be able to kill the other one. It would just trade with an Oni Insider. You could Insider. even put the Helena in there too and just say, like, all right, whatever. You know, as long as you can't kill the Magna Ventress straight up, how does this block possibly be bad? Yeah, I think if Iron Man knew it was going to trade with the Helena and that was destined to happen they would have made the attack but they couldn't bank on that right all right so now both helena and magna Ventress are coming across and for iron man blocking with a pending doom gets this huge flying threat out of the way it does weaken the d'angelo might in hand but maybe six cost draw three will be enough or maybe we'll be able to find a way to make it even bigger carnivorous yearling comes down as a three two overwhelm drawn extra copies of itself so the boxer is really getting a nice wide board going here the twisted farmer is going to come down and now iron man's going to draw three with this d'angelo might and we found a renaya all right renaya will be able to kill that magna ventress Ooh, a gem blazer cannon on a yearling could be big Or does the boxer want to go from here? Yeah, a lot of this is just about sort of hedging off a little bit. You know, can you... Uh, it's really valuable to have multiple impactful units as much as you possibly can um, because that really dampens the efficacy of slay. And so get a wide board. There's no rush to do anything with the cannon and try to have that as the sort of the last piece of the puzzle rather than something you're trying to leverage now, especially with an opponent at 18. Like, you aren't that close to winning the game. So just keep developing, keep applying pressure, and uh, don't get, as much as you can avoid it, try not to get blown out by one removal spell. All right, the Boxer just picks up a Fire Sigil for this turn, so now is the time to throw down the Gem Blazer Cannon. I mean, in reality, the Boxer hasn't seen a single card get played 
um, since that uh, since that D'Angelo might. So from their point of view, definitely have to be concerned that a Slay has been picked up because we haven't been playing units. Well, the problem, I mean, there's Slay and Rihanna and Twisted Farmer, all as possible responses here, all of which sort of necessitate different lines of play. Yeah, I mean, if you put Gem Blazer Cannon on the Carnivorous Yearling, it's the one that's flying. That could be a great attacker. Okay. So now we see Ventress and the Yearling come through. Is it time for Renaya? It's not a bad spot for Twisted Farmer. I mean, it's unlikely you're going to get uh, a better shot to line up against uh, the Magna Ventress. And the Boxer is okay with this exchange, too. Because a, a, a problem with the uh, the Twisted Farmer is it really freezes up the 2-1 yearlings. So this is kind of a nice exchange for both players. From uh, Iron Man's perspective, it's a very efficient tournament in terms of power. It also allows them to answer uh, a threat that was pretty hard to answer. And from the Boxer's side, especially with the Gem Blazer Cannon, there's something to be said to clearing out the Twisted Farmers. That's both copies. Those are the only two in Iron Man's list. And now that's the that's the most catastrophic card to play against when you're trying to do something with your yearlings. Now that's off the table. All right, so we are going to see a chump by one Mandrake on the Magaventurist. The Twisted Farmer and all the other Mandrakes will go on to that Carnivorous Yearling. That one did have Life Steal, so a nice, a nice big attack here. But now for Iron Man, they can once again pass with maybe all of their power up. And the Boxer is still just not going to have any confidence that there isn't a Slay floating around in Iron Man's hand. Because that play last turn, you definitely would have still made just the same play, even if one of the cards in hand was replaced with a Slay. Right. Iron Man's catch-up spot from here is, can I set up two cards in one turn? And using all of your power on a Twisted Farmer and having a decent turn, you come back, now you can play Slay plus something else. You're right. It's got to still be on the radar. All right, so all the Magna Ventresses are gone, including the one in play. But that's not enough to deal with the Carnivorous Yearling. For Iron Man, they found an Argentport Blueprints that will be enormous over the next couple of turns. But they are going to have to really work for their money here if they want to deal with that Carnivorous Yearling with a Gem Blazer Cannon. Next turn, the cannon will have heated up. It will then attack as a 10-6. So uh, it's going to take... Both the Renais to take it down and some overwhelm damage will still spill through. This one's right, uh, right on the the razor's edge too. Although maybe not anymore. <laughs> oh, I mean the Styr's eyes can buff that yearling up to, um, I guess from ten six up to thirteen nine, but it means a little more overwhelm damage comes through, but it doesn't fundamentally change. Um, that both units will trade here. Well, it could unlock a yearling attack that was not available before. Oh, on the ground, on the ones on the ground. Yeah, I mean, going up to a going up to a six five here is like, all right, now all these blocks five, are. Five four. Oh, sorry, five four rather. Now all these blocks are a little choppy. Like, and and yeah. and, and what's going on with this uh, with these yearlings otherwise? Now it's going to go onto the one in the air. Oh, the Styr's eyes had charge. It looks like. It must have been from the Inferno Phoenix, so that complicates things because that means that 7 plus 2 is going to come across. So that's 9. That's going to drop Iron Man down 2 with the Styr's Eyes in play. Now, can the Argent Port Blueprints move there? Slay lets you play on. It, you can't do that in the Blueprints in the same turn, unfortunately. But the ground is locked up. So if you get out of this turn with your Slay... You, uh, uh, in theory, can blueprints the next turn. Yeah, one line that's available to you if Iron Man has a Styr's Eyes in the Void. You go, you pick up a Styr's Eyes, you ditch either the Slay or the other unit you draw to um, to the Styr's Eyes and Crown Watch Tactic, the Magna Ventress. It gains you six life steal uh, right back, and then you've got a Styr's Eyes available for the Boxers. So that is going to be the play. We're going to pick up the Renaya. Um, I guess the only question is, are we going to see when the Styr's eyes come down um, a Crown Watch tactic? We Looks like we are ditching the Slay, and we are tacticking up the Magna Ventress. It's attacking as a 6-8 lifesteal. All the units on the other side, even in a gang block, can't take it down. Iron Man's back up at 8. Okay, Scale Sword Patrol grows the Styr's eyes out of range of the other one. This is going to get... Iron Man back down to five. 
I would just a sketch. <laughs> I mean, a just a sketch can make the station, and you could buff the Styre's eyes up to four this turn. Uh, you, you, if you buff this turn, I mean, you are, <laughs> you're dead to a lot of stuff. Oh, there's a Helena. This is getting very, very tight now. Remember that the boxer is aware of the Rihanna here, so gotta be really careful about how you're pumping here. Don't want to suddenly let that swallow up something it couldn't before. Right, right. Yeah, plus three, plus four. It, it for the most part, it it doesn't. Yeah, you do this onto a yearling. It's now five, five. But this is going to put Iron Man in a tough spot. You can play Renaya. You can contract and get, kill that Helena and all the other Helenas. I guess you go if you go Styre's Eyes block on the Yearling, you go down to two. And then the Renaya trades with the Styre's Eyes. You're going to go down to two, so you're going to be in Torch range. But now there's no Flyers. Oh, Magna Ventress gaining us back some armor. Huge draw Because you there. were just still dead to just an all-out attack. Right, you had yeah. the top deck. Had to oh, top deck something, and uh, what a thing to top deck. And now with all the Helenas gone from the deck, there's fewer flying outs here. Magda Ventress is coming in as a 6-8 once again. It's not going to take much long for Iron Man to finish off this game. Uh, playing this Scale Sworn Patrol is probably better. It does. You do have two available now, though. That might go down to just one unsilenced in a moment, thanks to this Argentport Noble. Yeah, Noble's a, a huge draw here, too. Here we go. 6-8 Magna Ventress is coming in. Dropping Boxer all the way down to 7. Argent Port Noble will likely silence one of these Scales Horn patrols. And then will be buffed by Research Station, I'm imagining. All right, we got a 6-4 Noble. Styre's Eyes! This is... Oh, I mean, I guess if you could... You don't have a card in hand. To yeah. Use with the eyes, but they're gonna throw it down. Oh, and what can we do with another Argentport blueprints? I mean, probably nothing better than just doubling up the uh, the noble again. But it's another, you know, if we get to turn a million, and these low opportunity cost ways of grinding late games have really come up here. The blueprints was massive in this game, massive. It really was. Arjun Poor Noble now threatening to push Iron Man into a very healthy range. 12 points of life steal. And if you don't get the Noble off the board this turn, this is pretty much it for the boxer in terms of ever making that a reality. Yeah, I mean, there's no, you know, you, you have to block that and you have to block, yeah, w at least one of the uh, Night of Ventresses. It's just, there's no way to, to manage all this now. I mean, we're now at a virtual 17. The Boxer is down to just a Styre's Eyes. Origin Port Blueprints. Any miracles off the top for the Boxer? Battlefront Dasher. Not going to do it. So Iron Man is going to take game number two here in our best of five set. Or sorry, excuse me, game number three there. And now up two to one. In the semifinals, they are just one game away from advancing where they would face uh, the Overmaster for the title of world champion. But the boxer is down, but they are not out. No, not by any means. You know, you got to feel pretty good about game number four, um, you being on the play and just how close the match has been. And then, you know, assuming that you get through that one, one game for it all, you know. Um, obviously disappointing. Very, very close there, the, the, the boxer, to being able to, to win that one. That game was on the razor's edge for like four or five turns. Yeah. Um, so a little bit disappointing, but, you know, you just settle in. You, you, you're on the play. you got to feel good about it. And then uh, one game for it all. Yeah, and, uh, you know, even some of the – we've seen just a lot of decisions be made right that aren't immediately obvious, like on that turn with the Renaya where it's uh, – the you do a chump block with the Styre's eyes. So the Renaya can trade with the permanently flying Styre's Eyes and the Carnivorous Yearling overwhelms for some damage. It didn't prevent the most damage that turn, but it left Iron Man in a spot where they no longer had to deal with any flying threats in the air. 
and it set them up for a victory over the next couple turns. Yeah, and also the insurance policy of the, uh, you know, the Renaya text there, you know, it, it doesn't come up all the time, uh, and it doesn't always feel impactful, but when you're playing these games where so much of it comes down to, okay, they have X, Y, and Z, I'm playing around all of it, and now, um, you know, how do I manage against all these at the same time? And then the minute you, you can knock out X and it's just Y and Z, the possibility space contracts, and you can be a lot more certain and precise about what you're playing around. And as you mentioned, getting rid of those Helenas, now you don't worry about, you know, these sudden boosts of the ground's locked up and now there's this flyer coming over for a ton of damage right away, and also there's a flying unit left over. That information is so valuable there. Yeah. All right, so the Iron Man now just one game away from advancing to our finals. As a reminder, uh, all of our top four players are going home with at least $6,000. If you make it to the finals, it's now up to a guaranteed $10,000. The winner taking home $15,000. So, uh, yeah, um, not just a, a shot at the World Championships at stakes, but cash prizes. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it would be a nice way to, uh, to cap off a, a great year of competitive play for either of these players is to be world champion and take home that 15000 Yep, the, the, this match still looms, and uh, there's a match left. So they are a long ways away, but uh, getting very close here. Yeah, um, for for each of for the boxer, they got to win now. Uh, they got to win five games, including two in a row. Iron Man. This game is sort of the. This is the one where it's great if you can win it, but if you don't, you know, you're up against a Rakano deck that's on the play. It's certainly understandable. They've given themselves some breathing space. That last game felt like it might be end up being the tipping point of the match. We'll still have to see how it plays out, of course. But, I mean, both of those players could really taste it because once you get that 2-1 advantage, you know ultimately at some point you're at least going to get the chance to win the match and move on in a game where you get to go first. Yeah, yeah, the burden's on your opponent to break serve. And uh, as we've seen in this matchup with how fast these decks can come out, how overwhelming the position on the table can get, how explosive the two cards in one turn sequences can be, um, breaking serve is asking a lot. It's not possible. Almost happened there. But it's asking a lot, and having that in your back pocket has got to be a nice little security blanket here. Yeah, a lot of great work that game from Renaya, uh, being able to kill both all of the Magna Ventresses out of the deck and then all of the Helena Sky Guides. And so that was one of those things where, you know, we were, it's, you never know. Maybe a Magna Ventress would have come off the top on, one, on an earlier turn before the end of the game would have stunned, gained some health back, and started turning things back in the boxer's favor. Um, but they were all gone thanks to Renaya. She can her contract allows her to kill an enemy unit that has less strength than health, so both Magna Ventress and Helena both qualify. Yeah, and stringing down the possibility space like it, it is just, it is literally impossible to play around every permutation of everything all the time, because something you have to play around is what happens if the Phoenix hits X, Y, and Z. At a certain point, you can't process all of it, and so being able to shrink it down some is is a huge deal. All right, here we are for game number four in this best of five semifinal between the Boxer and Iron Man. Boxer is up first at the top of your screen, and they're thinking hard. Is this the hand that will tie up the match? They've got an Oni Insider. It could pick up a Warhelm. Not too much in the way of enemy attachments to kill, though Argentport Blueprints in longer games does matter. Um, they are going to keep... For Iron Man, this is exactly the kind of hand that can break serve in the matchup. You've got plays on two, three, and four, and they are some of your best blocking units in the matchup. Helena, Twisted Farmer, Impending Doom. The Boxer with that timely turn two draw of Battlefront Dasher. It's going to be the play here. In attack, 4-3 on turn number two. They'll, they will carry one dead over to the following turn. For Iron Man, the question will be, do they want to meet this challenge with a Styre's Eyes or a Twisted Farmer? And it looks like we're going to be seeing the eyes start. Right. The problem with Twisted Farmer there is Twisted, Twisted Farmer takes you off of turn three, Lena. So this allows you kind of the widest array of options. Justice sketch is going to go away, so that decision there from Iron Man um, sort of reflecting on how much they want to have the Argentport Blueprints still in the range for a following turn. Now up for turn number three for the Boxer. They can torch this uh, Styre's Eyes away, attack for three, and so uh, the Boxer is doing a very nice job here of getting in some early damage, and it's something that you love to do when you're playing with cards like Finest Hour, Torch, and Inferno Phoenix. 
Now for the boxer, turn number four. The Helena Sky Guide can be well met with a finest hour, but once you make that attack here, you're basically hard showing to your opponent that that's the card you have. Yeah, well, you know, we can. Uh, it's at least power efficient this turn to Warhelm up this and hold back. So this is a really nice play from the boxer. One, because you get your Warcry, you're doing something profitable with an Oni Insider. It's not a lot to do in the matchup. But also, you get to be aggressive here while still holding the finest hour back. There's no signal that that's there. And um, keeping that, that, that back for a turn, keeping the signal all away, might induce Iron Man into making a risky block the following turn or the turn after. All right, so Magnaventure stuns down the Oni Insider. And now for the Boxer, this is a double block here. So if we were to Finest Hour and Torch, we can wipe out both of these units. The Boxer is ready for that. They are going for it. And th that was very interesting how fast the Boxer made that attack. They were very confident that they were okay with this being the direction of the game. And we see, you know, they've now got both of those great attacking Endurance units off the board. And I think, you know, from Iron Man's perspective, the, the things that can go wrong there are two Finest Hours, two Torches, or a mix of both. I think if it's two copies of Finest Hour, that stings. Like, that's the worst case scenario. I think the other two scenarios are all are both plainly acceptable. And so uh, I, I like the, the block there, even though there is a little bit of risk against two copies of Finest Hour. If, if you knew it was there, you, you'd want to walk it back. But uh, there's, a, there's a lot to be said for um, uh, the boxer being priced into attack kind of no matter what. Woo! We are getting aggressive here for Iron Man, playing the Impending Doom, not playing this or attacking with the Impending Doom, not playing the Scale Swarm Patrol, but ready and queued up with a Twisted Farmer that is going to do a nasty piece of work here on this attack from the Boxer. Four Mandrakes come along with this Twisted Farmer. We're going to see a lot of blocks on the Carnivorous Yearling, soaking up all the Overwhelm damage, and one will trade with that Oni Insider. The Boxer will be able to play an Iron Priestess on their turn, um, but you can see that uh, that Iron Man was well anticipating how this exchange was going to go down and just loved that they could use one unit to just totally trade off with that board. And you can say, oh, well, that attack, looks, <laughs> that attack doesn't look good because, you know, you know Twisted Farmer's there, also Slay's there, also Rihanna's there, also this Blueprint is looming to accrue a huge advantage, so you don't have the luxury of playing around everything. No, you do not. All right, Iron Man's going to Scale Sworn Patrol up the Impending Doom. It's going to attack. But now Inferno Phoenix plus the Iron Priestess could get in there, and I think they will. Valor from the Iron Priestess means the Scale Sworn Patrol does not have a good block, though a call to hit could wipe out the Priestess. It will not. Drops Iron Man all the way down to seven, and they might not get time here, Patrick, to take advantage of the awesome power of the Argent Board Blueprints to draw two units from their Void as it costs seven. Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, I, I think it's worth considering on this turn, sending in everything. Oh, Whoa. here we go. So they're going to have, they're kind of taking a turn off here, but they're going to get back an Aegis stuff. Um, here is Magnaventurous, and then the Styr's Eyes is really big because that threatening to play a Crown Watch Tactics in a future turn would be very important. All right, Impending Doom deals some damage. Now, Battlefront Dasher can buff up the, the Phoenix into a size large enough to compel a trade with the Impending Doom. Yeah, trying to see if there's some way to have four attackers this turn. Because there, I don't believe there is, and I mean there is a, there is a case I think. If you can't, you know, force the issue here of trying to sandbag the dasher. It is going to go on the phoenix. We will see those units trade off, so there is going to be flying charge and double damage going to the top three units of the boxer's deck. And now a sleigh has been picked up. And to sort of go back to what we were talking about earlier, uh, you know, I, Iron Man has, it seems like, has gotten the better of it generally over the course of the game. The defensive impending doom is not a good spot to be in. And, uh, you know, the, the, there's a burden on them now to get things over with pretty quickly because now with the, the Phoenix triggers floating around, there's a lot of ways to just get 
kind of punked out from this spot. Having a slay back covers you against a lot of it, but uh, it's it's still a little bit dangerous. Wow, so look at this. Crown Watch tactic up the scale sworn to patrol. Magda Ventress, the Iron Priestess, to stop any blocking with that unit. Now an Iron Priestess was drawn. Not sure which skill it got. It looks like charge. Probably not the one we were looking for there. And now with Helena Sky Guide, I do believe that will do it for Iron Man if they just throw that Scale Sworn Patrol up into the air. Or the Magna Ventress, of course. And 11th coming across. Iron Man advances to the finals here at the World Championships with their Argent Court mid range deck. And, uh,. Besting the boxer and setting themselves up for a title match against the Overmaster. Great match. You know, the, the Argent Port deck looked, uh, you know, a little bit slower, a little bit bigger where, where you like to be there. Um, you know, and, and game number four there, the boxer just coming out with not the start that they needed. It was a, a little off bait there, you know, the turn two insider and then drawing the dasher on turn two. Just some of the pieces didn't line up the right way early on in the game. And when you aren't able to sort of leverage that early advantage, the Argent Port deck with Blueprints, as we saw, with with Slay, uh, just able to grind out those games. It's on the margins, was really close, but um, uh, not being able to sort of leverage that early advantage uh, eventually doomed the boxer. And your boy Twisted Parmer had that big turn. Never, It never does it. All right, so a great run from the boxer. Congratulations on to them on their top four world championship appearance. For Iron Man and the Overmaster, They've got a date with Destiny coming up here as we set the stage for the finals of the World Championships. We will take one more break here as we set up the finals, and we will be breaking down the deck list, talking about some stuff coming up in the future, and we'll be watch finding out who the next World Champion of Eternal will be. Stay tuned. This is it. Welcome. This morning, I am joined by Sean, a.k.a. The Overmaster. Sean, you recently won the draft open and will be competing at this year's Eternal World Championships. Thanks so much for joining us today. And today we're going to get a chance to get a little bit to learn a little bit more about you and about how you managed to become one of our world championship competitors. So first of all, why don't you tell people at home sort of who you are, where you're coming from and what you'd like people to know about you? I'm Sean. Most of the community knows me as Theo. Uh, it's the first four letters of my uh, my tag, uh, the Overmaster. Um, I'm from Newfoundland originally, uh, which is crazy because, of course, Carnage from uh, the previous Open is also from Newfoundland. But I'm I'm uh, I live in Halifax, Nova Scotia now, just outside of Halifax, Nova Scotia. Um, I I'm an unemployed electrical engineer let's say <laughs> i have the degree but i haven't yet uh, got a job for it well yeah like you mentioned yeah carnage a canadian so canada gonna have a strong preference uh strong presence at the upcoming world championships uh and so let's talk about a little bit about you and your journey starting to play eternal so do you remember when you first started playing and what was the first card that you encountered that really jumped out to you um I believe it was August of uh, 2016. I got the beta and then didn't really do anything with it for a few months. It was like May um, that I got in the beta. And then I got the second invite uh, uh, for a friend. And that's when I uh, got into it. Um, the first card that stuck out to me was probably um, either Crown of Possibilities or Clock Roaches. Uh, I, got, I guess they go hand in hand, right? Um, uh, I remember Sunny Vale had made a list uh, called Dark Roaches where uh, you splash for a uh, dark return in, in a normal Clock Roaches deck and add, add, add more recursion. And that really kind of got me hooked on the game. Um, yeah. All right. So let's let's take a step back now. So now you've, you're qualified for Worlds. Let's talk a little bit about how you got there. Do you sort of what, what would you say was sort of your biggest level up moment, a moment when you realized you sort of had taken your game to another level because, you know, not every, nobody's born being a great player in anything. And so what sort of got you to this point? What was like a key moment for you along that journey? Sort of the, the, the story I like to say is that uh, 
um man us who doesn't uh, doesn't stream the game anymore but he used to but if you recall he was a he was a world competitor at some point right um mm-hmm. I, I was, you know, memeing around and I was, you know, pl- playing, playing decks that weren't, weren't necessarily great and w- whatnot. Right. I, I kind of knew that, but uh, Manuas is the first one who's like, you're good. Please play good decks. You know, please play good decks. You, you will, you will definitely, uh, uh, you'll definitely get better at it. And uh, that's what, that's kind of what happened. Right. You know, you, you start, you start putting four focus on competitive play in that way. I mean, yeah. Yeah, and you if you if all you're trying to do is uh is just have a good time, play play whatever you want. But it, I had a similar wake up call in the past uh, with a friend telling me, you know, like, aren't you trying to win this thing? Don't you want to win? And I was like, well, yeah. Then why don't you try playing the deck you think is actually the best? It's like, oh, it seems kind of obvious and fu- fun, but it you know if you, when you're just trying to enjoy yourself, it can be easy to talk yourself into playing the meme deck. Yeah, if if the deck isn't like. If the best deck, if you if you determine what the best deck is, and it's like, you know, let's say thirty percent of the field, that maybe you can take a counter to it as of that point. But if it's you know fifteen percent of the field, probably just play the best deck. You know, right? Because even if your cards really line up well against them, well, you don't play against the fifteen percent of the field that often. You play against it, I think, about fifteen percent of the time. No. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So that, that, that would be, be my advice. Of course, everybody's, everybody's going to determine what, a, in, a, in a wide meta, everybody's going to have a, have a different idea what the best deck is. But as long as you think you know what the best deck is, like, take that deck. Like, don't, 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 don't mess around with, a, you know, <laughs> going, going crazy with, a, with other decks. Although, now that I'm qualified for worlds, we might we might see some uh, spicy action. For people at home who are interested in sort of getting better at the game, um, obviously it sounds like you've had success by going on Discord and getting connected with other players. But as far as sort of playing the game, do you have any advice for people in terms of how they use the removal, how they choose opening hands, anything that you've picked up over the years that you think could help take somebody from their game where they're enjoying their time on ladder, but they're trying to become a more successful tournament player? I mean, there's there's so many different things, you know. What, um, it's a, it's a minor thing, but it does get you focused. Uh, like um, uh, hiding hiding pauses. Um, uh, like what um, what, what I was doing in the in the tournament. Um, <laughs> uh, you go watch the vod. You can see, you know, I I I, pl- I, I would play only fire search because I knew that the only <laughs> uh, the, the only trick I really had that would be worth hiding is a uh, is a is a finest hour in my deck right so that, that that's what I would always always do um things like that are fairly mi- fairly fairly minor I think but they do get you more focused in terms of uh, mulligan decisions like this mulligan system is very very forgiving the fact that it's two three four and 33 percent 33 percent 33 percent um uh, in terms of power, means that your second hand is most likely going to be, on average, better than your first hand. If if you if you're looking for uh, for cards, mulligan your first hand, and then probably keep the seven if you, if it's reasonable. If if you if you ever need to get, I, I'm, you know, ninety percent of my day right now because I'm unemployed. Nah, whatever, uh, is is hung. Uh, I hang out in the WSG Discord, <laughs> and uh, if you if you need to, you know, if you need to talk to me, you know, one on one. Uh, or or any of the uh, really good uh, top players uh, you know we're you know hanging out hanging out in there we don't necessarily just play eternal too like you know we we hang out uh you know to do do other things as well well definitely it sounds like they should look out for you on on discord and um and i i found that people people really get like getting asked to to give advice uh, especially if it's within the context of like hey you're really good at something how do i be good at it too people really enjoy that and i think people will th- uh, worry too often that, oh, you're going to like take up this person's time. But honestly, people like, people like telling you like why they think they're good at things. And so it sounds like, uh, you would be open to it if people wanted to reach out to you. And that's, uh, that's great. Taking a step back from sort of the competitive side, let's, let's have some fun and talk about some of your favorite things in Eternal. So first off, just what's your favorite format? What's the one that you enjoy most when you just want to kind of unwind? um probably just uh 
the throne or expedition in constructed format. I'm usually a constructed player. If, if I really, really, really want to unwind, usually I build a new deck and then, uh, and then play that in the, uh, you know, something, uh, something uh, crazy or something. What That's gives something. you inspiration when you're building a new deck? What, what kinds of things are you, are you looking for? Um, I mean, uh, going, I'm going to, to return to Warcry. And just like, you know, so some people have some great ideas there. Uh, and then like, you, you know, you, you, you change some things around. So, you know, deck building is hard, right? Some, some people, you know, have different, uh, different ideas about deck building. And also that they may not be, you know, they may not have quite as much experience in deck building, but their, 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 their ideas are, are really good. And then you can just like conglomerate. And, uh, Do you have a favorite all-time deck that you've played in the game? Um, probably Haunted Highway. <laughs> I mean, uh, w way back in the day, the three faction uh, FPS deck that um, uh, Ski J originally designed. Uh, the Ski J and uh, I, I took and uh, modified the power base and added uh, basically the form that that looks very much close to, to the form that was played in high level play um, at, uh, at it, when it was when it was the best deck, in my opinion. Nod also to five faction Kilo, Kilo Vox, the five faction Kilo Vox that I I designed with the Autobite in um, in um, the Expedition format that time with uh, with Jack and uh, Gentle <laughs> Grazer uh, in a five faction deck. That 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 was fun and uh, that was a fun experience. Do you have a favorite card in the game that you enjoy just for its art? Um, well, really, st I, I think most of the Grenadines have pretty sweet card arts. But one that I uh, really uh, like quite a bit is Oblivia Body. So so, uh, so chill, leaning back in his chair. Uh, yeah, the, j just that one. <laughs> well, my next question was going to be, what's your favorite tribe in Eternal? What's your favorite unit type? Is it Grenadine or something else going to edge them out? Uh, I think Grenadin. I really like Sacrifice Synergies. I have played Yetis to a large amount of success or, or even Elves, but I think Grenadin's kind of uh, uh, edges out on all of them right now. All right. It is finals time here at the World Championship. We got one match to go. Andrew Baxter and Patrick Sullivan here. We've been with you all weekend. Thanks so much, everyone, for joining us. And we are down to our final two players. We've got in one corner Iron Man and the other the Overmaster. And let's waste no time. Let's get into what these decks look like in this pivotal best of five expedition match these players will be doing battle in. For the Overmaster, they've got this Zine and deck. Filled up with lots of nasty surprises for aggro decks. Blister Sting Wasp, Scorpion Wasp, Sive, all capable of making deadly units. And then Huntmaster Vikram, once you've sort of mucked your way through those, comes down, steals your best unit, and sometimes smacks you right in the face with it. Yeah, and we saw this deck just make very, very quick work of uh, a unit-based strategy before. Uh, I'm curious to see if there's some overlap here. A lot of the structural problems that... Uh, Fell, our comp right player, also are going to be on the Argent Port side. And um, if the Overmaster has a match, anything like what they had in the top four, we're very quickly going to have our world champion. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, we saw them just sweep through with a clean 3-0 in their semifinal match. On the other side of them will be Iron Man, and they've brought Argent Port to the table this weekend. A super solid deck filled with great justice and shadow units like Renaya Wings of the Cabal, Argent Port Noble, which does a fantastic job at silencing some of the tricky units in the Xenon deck, the Dinosaur Nests, and so they'll be trying to use that card to keep themselves afloat, and then they come hitting with cards like Furious Magna Ventress and Impending Doom. Uh, this deck has been awesome. It has uh, done a really brilliant job of being able to be good early and then good late. And when we saw this deck, and what really stood out to me compared to the Rakano decks is the Rakano decks are trying to keep up by just playing with a lot of fours and fives. And they get a, a bunch of kind of uneven hands as a result of that. Here, what's how are you playing in these late games? Well, you have runes, sketches, blueprints. These are like very close to free. Um, the opportunity cost is extremely low. And if the game goes on long enough, 
those cards can be as impactful as any six or seven or eight cost card in the entire format. And that has actually come to bear on the matches that we've watched on camera. So I think that that dilemma that these aggressive decks have, have been sort of approaching here of, well, there isn't a critical mass of one and two cost cards. I can't play it that way. How do I go about playing a more expensive game? And to answer it by like, oh yeah, there's just this free stuff floating around that just randomly wins one game out of nine, one game out of 10. Uh, that That's a really brilliant way of trying to solve that problem. All right. So that's going to be the matchup here in the finals. They will be playing a best of five match and the winner of that will be your world champion. So with that said, before we get to this world championship, let's talk a little bit about the future. And so we are excited to announce and confirm that organized play will be coming back again this year. We've got another organized play season in the coming up for you all. The Eternal World Championships 2022 will be held later this year. We And it will once again feature a $100,000 prize pool. We've been working hard on you know, in figuring out all the great things that we can do for players with competitive play. We've got some great things in store. And the first th thing to establish for all of you is, yeah, there's going to be lots of great high stakes eternal coming up this year. Yeah, there's going to be more information coming down the pipeline, including uh, announcement about when uh, we're going to have our, our first set of opens. All that is coming. Um, well, in fact, we actually have our first open announcement. Yeah, let's Those talk about the first event. That. Yeah. March 25th to the 27th will be an expedition open. We will have the full details on that soon, as well as the rest of the organized play structure for this year. But as you all know, it matters a lot to us, the experience that our players have, that we're giving players great prizes between our alt arts, the rewards that you get for achieving a mastery, a master's medallion, and then entering the events. And we want to make sure we continue to bring to you the best possible events we can with our organized play, as well as rewarding players who demonstrate a high degree of skill and success in the game. And we'll be along with more great broadcasts, more great events. If you want to start preparing right now, March 25th to 27th, it is the expedition event, and we will have the full announcement very soon for you all with lots of exciting details that uh, will be great for both players who are currently playing, coming back to the game, or might be new to the game. So there are some elements of this that are still kind of being ironed out, some stuff on the edges, maybe changing slightly the, the, the method of qualification and some of the edge cases, that sort of thing. So we're going to have more information about the particulars of the changes of 2021 versus 2022 very, very soon. But we did not want to leave things hanging here at, during the World Championships. We are going to have a $100,000 prize pool. We are going to have a World Championship. And in fact, the winner of this match will be the first person qualified for our 2022 World Championships. And we are going to have an open that's expedition at the end of March. So you have that information. Well, stay tuned if you're you know interested in our organized play, either uh, for the first time or coming back. Um, and we'll have more information coming down the pipeline shortly. All right. So it is finals time here at the World Championship. As soon as Iron Man and the Overmaster are ready, we're going to be heading down to the action and getting this best of five set kicked off for you all. And a uh, lot, very excited to see who can come out on top. Any predictions for us, Patrick? I mean, I know the decks are different um, between the Arch Import and Rakano decks, a lot of different cards. But the, the absolute mauling that we, we witnessed in the top four, it's really hard for me to pick against Zenon. All right, I'm going to go with the Argent Port deck. I love how Renaya matches up, um, in particular, the fact that it can kill cards like Huntmaster Vikram, Blister Sting Wasp. So I think that card's going to do real nice work. In addition, I also like how Argent Port Noble gets to, to mix things up and uh, can silence a lot of these units. Because in particular, I think the Zen deck is high on units that are not that exciting to kill, but just getting a little bit of silence action on them is really nice. And something that's nice, All for, right. the, and something so, that's really nice for the Argent Port side, too, Impending Doom in this matchup. Not the easiest card for Zenon to handle. All right, here we are in the finals of the World Championships. Iron Man versus the Overmaster. The Overmaster is going to be kicking things off at the bottom of your screen with their Zenon deck. Looks like Iron Man redrew down to six cards and has no undepleted sources of power. This is going to be a tricky start for them, but they've got some big tools in the waiting like Furious Magnaventurus and Angelo Might. So when I said free, what I meant was mostly free, <laughs> as it pertains to the sketches. <laughs> they are very not free in this case. It's going to prevent potentially a turn three slay. It will prevent that. That means Javon is going to get going, and really the Overmaster is just running away with this game right now. I could easily imagine seeing the Overmaster playing out this Scythe, 
If you do that, you get two more bodies for Javon to pump up. Lot to like about this spot for the Overmaster, but they're going to think through all the options. I mean, this is already, we've talked about this over the course of the weekend, that, like, you know, how do you, uh, how do you clean up when you're 99% to win? How do you extract when you're 1% to win? The Overmaster is slowing down here because we're already kind of in 99% territory. There's no harsh rules in Iron Man's deck. There's no ways to play a big catch-up game. The amount of value and presence on the table is going to be so hard to come back from. So the Overmaster is now in that. What is the 1% of games I lose look like? Let's insulate against that as much as possible. All right, so we are going to go for side. Play a Deadly Scorpion. Javon gets to buff three units this turn. Iron Man is down to 21. Finally, we can slay Javon, but guess what time? It's time for the Dinosaur Nest to become Sheltered Valley. That's going to buff up all of these dinosaurs. We are now attacking for what? Just 13 this turn? And we could see a Waystone Igniter on the Heat's Faithful. So much good action coming from the Overmaster right now. And for Iron Man, zero copies of Nothing Remains, zero copies of Harsh Rule. They got to win this game fair on the battlefield, and right now it is just going to be a lot. We're going to see Heat's Faithful, no sacrifice here? No. Nah. Okay, we'll wait another. Wait yeah. Two. We're going to pay off the contract first. So we've seen Furious Magnaventurus do a lot of work this weekend. If they were to stun a four strength one, gain three armor, that's still taking lethal. So if Iron Man just plays a Furious Magnaventurus, that's going to be lights out. Um, so, all right, that's interesting. So you silence the Sheltered Valley. If you gain three, can you keep yourself alive another turn? Yeah, it's one. Yep, yeah, they go to one. You block one of the four strength units, you're at well, one. Well, we can kill our attack with with uh, that the two strength dinosaur. Well, yeah, if you do that, then it then it doesn't work. Oh, okay. Same. Yeah, I think the Overmaster had a lethal line. I think you are right, but this is they're going to be on the precipice either way. Yeah, so still at one, but you know a follow up for the Overmaster of Zito and a Nagit's Faithful. <laughs> D'Angelo bites. Not very close to being useful this week. Bye, Cat. Go back into the deck. Play out our last power. And for Iron Man, that was, uh, that was a beating. Um, the Overmaster just continuing their impressive string of dominance here in our top four. Uh, but to be honest, it wasn't a whole lot that Iron Man... It really didn't matter what cards Iron Man was playing with once they got off to that kind of a start where just on the draw, Redrew down to six. All deplete the power. I've uh, a phrase I've used in the past to describe when you're going second and all your power is depleted is you're on the double draw. <laughs> uh, well, it's it's interesting if you have a lot of familiarity with Throne as sort of the the format in question, the default way that you play. There's some differences here in Expedition that are were really on display there. Uh, one is the fixing, though solid, is not free, and uh, Iron Man is taking more liberties here than most. When you're talking about Twisted Farmer alongside Nine Adventurous and Helena, y yes, of course, you can pace those cards out. They're not necessary to play on time, but the hands are a little disjunct, uh, disjointed. And then additionally, because there's no marked cards, you're making hay with just a lot of five and six cost cards. Normally we see Throne decks, they sort of leverage being able to swap around. To the extent that we've seen weaknesses with Iron Man's deck, it's been some of these opening hands are really rough, and that has not been happening on the Overmaster side. Everything's really smooth. Uh, we've seen some stumbles with Civ on occasion, but by and large, they've been able to play their cards on time, and Iron Man has been getting tripped up here and there. Too much depleted power, not having factions on time, all that. All right, for Iron Man, they have once again gotten no sigils in their draw so this power is just depleted after depleted iron man did have to redraw down to six but with a turn to shadow sigil they can play out one of these blister sting wasps establishing some early defense a call the hit for iron man um can threaten to remove that and uh set themselves up for for future success um they if they do inscribe it it does mean that they will have played a sigil this game for the purposes of their sketches but nothing of that sort yet Blister Sting Wasp can attack this turn if it wants. 
No charge coming back the other way. Javon's coming down. Such a rare moment. The wasp is so excited looking around. Finally, I don't. I didn't. I don't need to block. I get. I get my point in. All Getting right. Those attacks in. So now for Iron Man, an important decision here: Are they going to play the Slay on the Javon? They're not, and it's going to work out for them well. As um, there's nothing that can immediately kill the Jada. But keep in mind, uh, Jada doesn't exactly hold back Javon; it more like keeps it at bay. Yeah, I like just spinning up Javon here. That you're kind of at this neutral spot. It's not a whole lot to be gained by attacking here. Jada's not doing anything on the way back. Just draw a card. And, it, you know, the Overmaster at this point is not really building towards anything significant in hand. So you might as well just take your time here, draw some extra cards, and you can come back to these leftovers when you're ready. So a critical decision here for the Overmaster. If they attack with Javon, Iron Man would get a Justice Sigil, and they get to put a plus one, plus one on both the Waystone Igniter and the Spiteling. I think that uh, I, I like the no attack from Javon here. My concern with the justice, just giving a free justice sigil, the Overmaster's hand's a little slow. It's not very powerful. And I think ramping them up to uh, D'Angelo's might ahead of schedule is a real way to get blown out of this game. Whereas this way, you know, it's not that flashy, whatever, but you can take your time. You put the burden on Iron Man to get the six power to be able to play it. And, um, you know, you're not just giving them free resources to work with. We've seen Iron Man in deep games. Like I said, the, you, you look at the list, it may not look that way, but they have a lot of really powerful ways to convert extra power. So it's uh, the, tr getting a little bit of extra size there, I don't think it's worth it. All right, it looks like we might be queuing up for a huge turn here. Slay takes out the Blister Sping Wasp. Kalina Sky Guide is going to jump Jada up, plus three, plus four. We're hitting for 12 with these two, dropping the Overmaster down to 13. And uh, yeah, it's um, the Overmaster's got the work cut out for them this match, Patrick. Uh, with just a Scorpion Wasp in hand, they are limited in how many cards they have that can interact with these big flyers. I'll say this too. Iron Man's deck very well positioned against Sinister Rumors. So is it all bigger or endurance? We'll now devour the Spiteling. Draw two cards, Sinister Rumors. And I don't think you can afford to play the Zito here because now you're just conceding so much damage in the air. I mean, I don't know. I mean, it, it's probably better to do this for a variety of reasons, but, you know, you, it's possible to kind of shut out this Archibor deck past a certain point. I guess the Ghost Form power makes that a little bit more complicated, but I don't think it was a no-brainer. All right, Scale Swarm Patrol is going to come down with uh, no more power for it, so... The Overmaster is going to be pretty confident this Zito, if played and contracted, would take something out. be interesting to see how they want to go with this. Um, a lot of options available to them now with this Nahid's Faithful. Sinister Rumors could dig one of those Wasps back out of the deck. Well, there was also an option of just spinning up with Javon and then playing Zito afterwards. Just, you know, a lot to do. A lot of options. A lot to do, huh? All right, Blister Sting Wasp is back thanks to Sinister Rumor is going to come down, and then I think we will see the cat. The cat's going to get rid of the Impending Doom. But now for Iron Man, there's a lot of good top decks here that could help uh, reestablish things. And Argent Board Blueprints will be very interesting. That is not one that can be killed by Waystone Igniter. Inter okay, the Helena wants to trade with the Wasp. I really like this attack a lot because if you play the blueprints first, it's possible it's just too much value to let that be the recursion. But if you just make that attack straight up, it's too juicy for the Overmaster to turn it down, and that's what you saw. All right, so Jada and Scales were in patrol get bumped up thanks to the Empower. And the Overmaster picks up a Zito, but no cards in hand just yet for to get rid of. So we're going to Sinister Rumors again. Yeah, the Overmaster has just been, there's just been enough debt accrued over these turns that they have not had the breathing space to use Javon as much as you would like in a game that's this attrition oriented. They've just been a power short all over the place. All right, Blister Sting Wasp is coming back down again. But this Argent Board Blueprints for Iron Man threatens to be very nice here. A7, sacrifice the blueprints, and you get back two units from your void. They both get Aegis and Endurance. And look at that, Iron Man holding on to the Justice Sigil, showing 
very nice respect to the possibility of future cat action. Javon is going to be used. It is going to draw a scythe very big because now that can contract to give something killer here. Um, and we might be able to see that take out the Scale Sworn Patrol before any more buffs can be handed out. It does come at the expense of playing a cat this turn, but with one card uh, cushioned and with all of Iron Man's power accounted for the following turn, it's not that, like there's that much value to this cat right now. All right, so Sive's going to Revenge away. It's going to have Killer when it comes back again. And are there any attacks? I mean... If the Overmaster wants, they could attack with this Nahid's Faithful. They're going to hold off for now. And there's Renaya. This is going to be fantastic for Iron Man as it's going to be able to remove this Blister Sting Wasp. The only question is how do they want to sequence this? Um, because they can't exactly do everything they might want to this turn. So they're just going to hold back. We will see probably an end of turn Renaya. And that is going to be devastating to the Overmaster's chances as I think they might... They, do, they risk losing the game on this turn. On this next turn, yeah. Sive just hits a Shadow Sigil. Dinosaur Nest comes down. Zito is going to make Iron Man discard a card, potentially. But I believe this is now a clear coast for the kill that you mentioned. If Rihanna dig out the, uh, dig out the Wasp, and then Helena on the, on the Jada Peacekeeper. Okay, so the Nahid's Faithful is going to come in, which um, I believe will be the difference here. But, man, Renai is going to get to eat that Javon. Yeah, I mean, this attack is fine in terms of staying alive, but it is not a long-term solution to the problems that are coming. No. The Overmaster queuing up an attack with 3-3 three, three Javon and 4-4 four, four Nahid's Faithful. As a reminder, whenever Jada is blocked or blocks, it gets minus 4 strength this turn, and you play a Justice Sigil from your deck. Part of being a peacekeeper means you don't always kill units in combat. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. Got it. I got the, I got the flavor. <laughs> <laughs> all right, here we go. Renaya taking out old Blister Sting Wasp. They're all gone from the deck now. Jada blocks the Heat's Faithful, gets a Justice Sigil. Renaya eats Javon. And, uh, you know, it, so... The Jada's been buffed up a little bit. You don't have to jump it this turn if you don't want to. Yeah, you could just play Impending Doom and set up for next. Yeah, I guess the one interesting question is, do you play the Iron Priestess? I would I would not. Yeah, it's very risky against another cat to let the Helena get hit by that. So, all right. Well, uh, the Dinosaur Nest did spit out a 1-1 Dinosaur, so that threatens to do some chump blocking. Now, Nahid's Faithful no longer really has a free reign as far as attacks goes. And it does feel like the Overmaster is going uphill this game now. Well, well also, the uh, Iron Man's also set up for, even with a flying blocker, they have lethal across th three attackers versus two blocks. So that mm. the, the dinosaur there, though a nice hit, is not enough uh, on its own to save the Overmaster. All right, Nahid's Faithful is just going to chump attack. And this is a, a rough chump attack because they get a power. And you get to gain four health here if you're the Overmaster, but not much else. Waystone Igniter is going to come down. We will see it contract and make a 1-1 one -one Spiteling. But now it is, oh, well, maybe we, uh, maybe we draw six first. Look at that. <laughs> what a time. Yeah. Another D'Angelo's might. Oh, lots of goods here. But uh, Helena on the Jada is not, I guess not lethal because we can chump block here with the Zavasaur. <laughs> Yeah, one thing I'm not a big fan of doing is giving my opponents more Justice Sigils when they've uh, just drawn six. Well, they might be out. Uh, okay. yeah. The Overmaster falls down to three, and Pending Doom pits themselves one more time, and that is going to do it for this game. Imagine we're going to see a concession here now. The Overmaster packs it up. 
We are all tied up in our finals here, so um, not as big of a buck kicking um, as game number one, but uh, Iron Man really showed that they're very much in this match. Uh, I mean, you saw just a tool available to Argentport that is not available to Combray, not available to Rucano, uh, and that's Argentport Blueprints. I mean, that was a card. Again, it's just a seek power here, right? It's so innocuous. But also on turn seven was a bomb. Uh, and and uh, the Overmaster was on the precipice of, like, not necessarily winning the game, but having a really solid advantage. They had attrition down. They were ahead on some cards. You know, Javon was ready to start getting the ball rolling. All, uh, all of it was looking good. But just uh, being able to bring back that much size with Aegis, with flying, um, they're, they're, the defenses wouldn't hold up at, at that point. And, um, again, you, you don't see cards like that in the Rakano or the uh, Combray lists. And to the extent that they're there, they're cards that cost five and six. They jam up your hand. They don't always line up the right way. There's, it's hard for it to go wrong with that card. And if it goes right like that, one game out of ten, um, wow, what, what a way to swing a matchup. All right, here we are in game number th three of this match. The Overmaster is on the play. Iron Man has picked up a Styre's Eyes. That looks like that'll go quite nicely with those Iron Priestesses in hand. And the Overmaster's got that turn two Dinosaur Nest. See how they can leverage that one. Styre's Eyes coming down. A little bit of lingering influence now. The Iron Priestess is discarded. We draw a Justice Sigil. We get to pick up a weapon and we get to scout. So much value there. It looked like Renaya went down to the bottom of the deck. Now the first dinosaur is a 1-1 flyer. The Overmaster got a couple of choices here. And is it going to be a Rat King? It will. Come on, dirty rats. Let's go. Helena picked up now from Iron Man. Sire's Eyes getting in with that first attack of the game. And oh. we are going to see a pass here. Heartbroken. With the Twisted Farmer up. What were you looking for there, Patrick? Making a shadow sketch. I would... Are you... Do you have money on the Overmaster? Well, the problem is that the cat's out of the bag a little bit. I get if you turn it down there, it kind of signals Twisted Farmer. I guess it could also signal Slay, but there's a there's a possibility here of a no attack from the Overmaster because the signal is so loud that uh, Twisted Farmer is the thing here. I mean, I think anytime we're getting a no attack on this early of the game, um, I think that's a, not a terrible spot to be in. All right, we're going to see... Um, Twisted Farmer blocked down the Rat King and a Mandrake in front of the Rat. We could see maybe a Devour by the Rat, but no guarantee you're going to be able to do anything good with the last two power of the turn. I mean, I guess you have a Waystone Igniter. All right, there's a Blister Sting Wasp and another Dinosaur Nest. Multiple Dinosaur Nests is very, very dangerous. We'll see if Iron Man can come up with an Argent Fort Noble something soon. Now for Iron Man and make attacks with these units. Pending Doom time. I'm gonna take one. Now it's time for Sheltered Valley from the first dinosaur nest. The second one is going to bring along two, oh, two charging dinosaurs on Master Vikram. Uh, let's uh, let's get that Impending Doom out of the way. How does one really get sound? <laughs> a <laughs> big old hit. And with no way to answer in hand either. Okay, we got an Argentport Noble. So that can answer one of the dinosaur nests, but it's just not enough. And so Iron Man goes down in game number two. And so, I mean, Overmaster, they have just won both of their games that they've won in very quick manner. And uh, they are now just one game away from becoming the world champion. Yep, and now the burden is on Iron Man to break serve at least once. Um, was able to, to blemish the Overmaster at least the first loss that we've seen them take in the elimination rounds, but... Um, the Zen deck has been brutal against these unit-based strategies, and uh, taking down two is going to be hard. Yeah, um, I mean, it, for that hand for Iron Man, I think they were certainly hoping that it was going to be a Zito-heavy draw from uh, the Overmaster side. Iron Priestess does a very nice job of uh, you can discard it, and then it gets you a weapon when you pick it up. Uh, things certainly didn't shake that way, and I think in uh, we'll see in Game 4 and in Game 5 how much Iron Man um, wants to try to redraw the hands that have Argent Port Noble, because that is... Their best card in the matchup against Dinosaur Nest. But they will be on the play in game number four here, and they've got their back against the wall, no doubt about it. But they've been winning matches all weekend, and so we'll see if they can come up with two more when they need them. Yeah, Arch and Port Noble, they're definitely the critical card. 
As someone with a lot of experience with Twisted Farmer, does Twisted Farmer answer Dinosaur Nest? It it doesn't not answer it, but it also doesn't answer it. It's somewhere in the middle. <laughs> the Noble, on the other hand, that's clean. That just that gets it done. All right, here we go. The Overmaster. Iron Man's kept their second seven uh, for Overmaster. I believe this is their first look, and they are going to keep it. Is this the hand that will win them at the World Championship? On turn one, we're going to get an Archport Blueprints, picking up our second Shadow Influence. Dinosaur Nest is picked up, but if you want to play Dinosaur Nest on turn two, you have to play Shadow Sigil, Zito, and not contract it. How does Iron Man feel about that? Eh, I don't mind it. There's no rush to Nest. And also, if you Zito here... I think here, there is a rush to Nest. No, I'm saying, if you Zito here... All right, we're going to contract. Can you hold a Noble? Is that is that is the Noble not going to be the worst card in your hand? It is going to be the worst card in your hand some amount of the time. Oh, I Especially see. Especially if you have to pay the contract anyway, you're off a turn anyway. There's a good chance you snipe it. All right, so Sire's eyes comes down. Will we see one of these cards discarded to play that lingering influence? You could also get a gavel down to try to interact with the Zito, but not exactly the most important thing to have happen. You can't spend your cards that way. You already got tagged once. All right, so we're going to see Lingering Influence picking up that Justice Sigil. Argent Plur Blueprints on top of the deck, but it looks like that's going down to the bottom. Now we're going to be paying off the contract this turn. Now Iron Man's going to get working because they've got Styre's Eyes. Um, we might be dropping down a Helena this turn, and then in subsequent turns, we're going to be buffing everything up. Uh, Overmaster has missed on power number three. They've got a Blister Sting Wasp, and Iron Man has, not, has just been drawing power, so... All right, we got some, we'll see what we can do here. We're going to buff up the Styre's Eyes and the Alina. Both are going to come in. One will trade with the Wasp. And with a victimless crime in hand for the Overmaster, we can just get the Scale Sworn Patrol out of the way. Very interesting decision. Yep, it's going to be victimless crime on the patrol. So now we're just down to a Styre's Eyes. Um... With a Scythe, if we can hit an undepleted Justice Influence, we'll be able to handle it. Justice Sketch. So a huge draw here for the Overmaster. A mm. Time Sketch off the top. That is going to allow them to play Scythe. Killer the Scythe. And then remove this Styre's Eyes right before it would have gotten Justice Sketched into enormous proportions. Still not out of the woods yet. The Overmaster's left over, but not good against a flying unit. So still a lot of top decks. All right, so there's a Scale Sworn Patrol. We could start growing that one into our next threat, and we are in debt right now for the Overmaster. So they're going to be limited on their next turn. Didn't hit power again, so it's going to be just a Dinosaur Nest. All right, there's Iron Priestess. So we'll play that and then play the Justice. Uh, buff both of these units. So this, yeah, by no means is this over. but And we still got the Justice sketch to double something here. Iron Man's got a lot of great action coming up. These threats are going to be enormous. We're going to need some deadly action in the future from Overmaster. I mean, the Rat King can start shrinking things, but it's way way slower than Scale Sworn Patrol and Justice Sketch buff them. Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, th th this is pretty rough because... Um, if you play the Rat King, the rats can't block, and you're going to be pricing blocking soon. I really like this play a lot from the Overmaster. You kind of need to start spiking multiple things to be able to keep your head above water here. The Rat King just does not get you very far because what you need right now is blockers, and Javon's a better path to that than the Rat King. All right, well, Furious Magnaventris is going to stun the Javon. I think we could see a chump here from the Sarasaur. We will. Iron Man has drawn a couple of nice units in a row. <laughs> Here's Zito back. That is, all right, that's some more chumping action. We got to get back to that side, though, with Destiny. Oh, Vikram. All right, well, that's uh, really bad news for Iron Man because um, Vikram not only swings the game around, but the Overmaster can also ensure they get their money by just chump blocking with the Magna Ventress if there isn't a uh, removal spell off the top. That is true. Now, where will we see, what will we see Iron Man do here with this Justice Sketch? Will we double the Scale Sworn Patrol? We will. 
And there's just not great blocks here. Because that Valor on the Iron Priestess means you will not be able to combo block that down. Everything's going to get chumped. Yeah, it very much still feels like Iron Man is ahead here. Um, yeah, we will block with the Magna Ventress just in case there was a top deck slay in the future. And a really uh, wonderful thing that Iron Man has set up here, we now have uh, Rune of Illusion as a backdoor kill because we have gone one of our units up to 12 strength, and if you happen to draw that power off the top, it's lethal. So we're now in a spot where it's kind of like a lot of the power is a good draw, and certainly spells are going to be useful. So for the Overmaster, if you use Scythe, you might hit, um, or sorry, if you use Javon, you might draw into that Scythe and get to play it immediately. But you could also just be playing out both of uh, two more of the three drops in your hand, and it looks like we are going to see that. This is going to be a lot of buffs here when this Javon attacks. There's definite risk of Iron Man dying to some sort of counterattack in the future at this stage. I mean, the, the, the die is cast. The Overmaster cannot maintain this game by blocking in the long term. You've got to try to shorten it a little bit. It's not without risk, but um, again, you, you cannot possibly just be double chump blocking for the rest of the game, which is where we're getting to. All right, here we go. Three units are going to be attacking. Lots of units are going to get buffed by Javon. Iron Man is down to 14. They drew a Justice Sketch. None of these units have Endurance, Patrick, and I'm not quite sure we can make an attack here. I guess both Rat Kings would block. But then I'm counting up a lethal attack on the way back. We are going to have to pump the brakes here. But even if we pump the brakes, I, I think this still might just be the Overmaster's game to win. The attacks and the blocks are identical here. Uh, if you attack, it forces two chump blocks. If you sit back and block, then you can block the two biggest things, which are the Rat Kings anyway. Wow. So both units are coming in now. And the, the thing for the Overmaster is that if there was a slay, it wins the game on the spot. You can rule it out as a possibility, though that is the card that Iron Man will likely try to bluff here in a moment if they play out this Justice sketch. And Iron Man has conceded. They've seen the writing on the wall. The Overmaster is the world champion. Congratulations to them. A well-fought victory, a great tournament run for them, and they are now the eternal world champion. That was looking pretty dire. Too. I mean, that we were talking about someone with basically no traction on the table, not close to being able to attack for anything meaningful against someone who was establishing basically double chump blocker and uh, just was able to sort of tactically pivot there that one turn, would just deploy all the rats, the Javon attack, shrink the game to two turns, put the burden on them to draw. You know, there were some outs there. There was Rune of Illusion, Slay. Uh, Helena would have gotten the job done, so drawn pretty heavy there on the last turn, but missed, was able to chump block out, and congratulations to our new world champion, the Overmaster, and our first person to qualify for Worlds 2022. Yeah, and a really fantastic job of deck building. All of their cards looked fantastic all weekend long, especially in Expedition, Huntmaster Vikram, the Rat King, Javon, and we saw them all working nicely together, whether it was Javon pumping up the rats, Pumping up Huntmaster Vikram out of Torch range. A really great, a lot of great stuff. And condolences to the Iron Man. Obviously, phenomenal job reaching our finals. Winner of $10,000, but $15,000. And the title of Eternal World Champion goes to the Overmaster. Congratulations once again to them. So, uh, what a world championships. Uh, and uh, I think a very well deserved champion indeed. Tough field. Matches were really hard. And, um, you know, it's across all three formats. So, uh, you really couldn't you know, come to the table without expertise in all three. The field was super clustered. We had no one to end the Swiss rounds so with a record better than six and three. Uh, nearly all the competitors had a record of at least four and five. So, mm. I mean, just um, really, really tough field. At the end of it, we had a clean cut. The six and three has made it. And the Overmaster really dominated the elimination rounds, losing only one game in two different three of five sets. Uh, the deck was extremely impressive. They, they played really, really well. And, um, you know, this sets the stage for the Expedition Open that's going to be coming in March and your first opportunity to try to qualify for next year's World Championship. Yep, we'll have more information if we want to take a look at that um, soon about our upcoming organized play season, but it's going to be another great year of eternal action. Um, we've been doing lots of great fun stuff with the game. Uh, we're working at hard on the next set of cards here and, uh, you know, really excited to see what's going to be coming to Eternal in, 20, in 22. And uh, 
want to thank Patrick for joining me this weekend. It was uh, great getting him back in the booth this year. I, I know everyone at home is really excited to have you here. They've been stuck with me for a couple of years, but now we got the big guns back. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and so as we wrap up this organized play season, want to thank first and foremost all of you at home for watching and making this possible and supporting Eternal. Um, it's been a lot of fun having you along for this journey. We look forward to having you participate in the next organized play season and joining us for our next broadcast. Thanks to all the competitors this weekend. Congratulations to the Overmaster on becoming world champion and everyone who reached the top four. Thanks to Tuesday Night Eternal for putting on a great community tournament series and lending us that great deck list graphic tool that we use this, utilize this weekend on our broadcast. Thanks to Tim Eller and the entire QA and production team on putting together this event. Tom for producing, my co-caster, and, uh, and everyone at Direwolf Digital for supporting Eternal and helping us out every step along the way. Any uh, parting thoughts before we sign off for the weekend here, Patrick? I'll see you in a month. Yes. The expedition open. Before then in the queues. Because, uh, you know, Mono Shadow mid, number one master and throne, it's happening. So get your gloves up. Be waiting for you. And uh, just don't have dinosaur nests on turn two. How about that for once in your life? For once in your miserable life, don't have dinosaur nests on turn two. All right. The Overmaster or is go second, <laughs> maybe once. The Overmaster is your world champion. We'll see how long he may reign. Thanks for everyone at Direwolf Digital for joining us this weekend. Signing off from the world championships. Uh, we'll be seeing you again real soon.